lecture eight part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture eight the divine master of humility part three the portrait of his meek and gentle character was drawn by the prophet isaiah six hundred years before his appearance thus saith the lord behold my servant i will uphold him my elect my soul delighteth in him i have given my spirit upon him he shall bring forth judgment to the gentiles he shall not cry out nor have respect to person neither shall his voice be heard abroad the bruised reed he shall not break and the smoking flax he shall not quench he shall bring forth judgment unto truth he shall not be sad nor troublesome till he set judgment in the earth isaiah chapter forty two verses one through four charmed by his words and awed by his works the multitudes followed him into the lonely deserts by four and five thousand at a time until they forgot to eat and he fed them miraculously he opened his teaching with the commendation of humility giving his first blessing to the poor in spirit he never lost an opportunity of exalting and drawing attention to the humble who came near him as though he preferred setting forth its example in others rather than in himself when magdalen bathes his feet with tears he declares her sins forgiven and to the murmuring guests at the table he enlarges upon her penitential and most loving sacrifice when the heathen centurion exclaimed lord i am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof but only speak the word and my servant shall be healed st matthew chapter eight verse eight he held up the humble faith of that stranger as an example to the jews when he repelled the canaanite woman's petition to try her faith and she replied in the simplicity of her heart yea lord even the little dogs receive the crumbs which fall from their master's table he said to her o woman great is thy faith be it done as thou wilt st matthew chapter fifteen verses twenty seven and twenty eight he taught humility when he called the poor and the ignorant to follow him when he healed the abject in body and soul when he conversed with open sinners and with lepers when he enjoined silence respecting his miracles and especially respecting his glorious transfiguration he was himself the great model of that poverty and self-abnegation that he advised to others the wonderful contrast between the divine teacher and their ordinary instructors could not fail to produce an extraordinary impression upon the minds of the people it was this and the claims he put forth that awakened so keen an envy in the teachers and ministers of the law his great humility and gentleness the wonderful power he put forth and the divine title upon which he rested that power spread his fame through all circles whilst his tender beneficence won the souls of the people and captivated their hearts the great mass of the population was with him and this was made one of the principal grounds for putting him to death he showed a singular love for innocent children and st mark tells us that he took them up in his arms and laid his hand upon their heads and was much displeased when his disciples endeavoured to keep them from him and he said suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not for the kingdom of heaven is for such when his disciples asked him who thinkest thou is the greater in the kingdom of heaven jesus called to him a little child set him in the midst of them and said amen i say to you unless you be converted and become as little children you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven 
whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven st matthew chapter eighteen verses one through four mark this act attentively we know that ambition had shown itself in some of his disciples and this very question intimates as much the child is called and set among them they little thinking that he is to become their model an innocent child is simple humble free from guile conscious of ignorance more conscious of dependence open as the day possessing nothing hoping for all things and still relying on parental love protection and support he is submissive and obedient to his parents as the christian should be to god he is full of faith hope and love to his parents as the christian should be to god whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven on another occasion he teaches them that he who is the least that is in his own esteem shall be the first and that he who holds the first place shall be the servant of all christ must be publicly acknowledged as the son of david and the king of israel before he is put to death he therefore makes his public entrance into jerusalem when the multitudes are assembling from all parts to celebrate the passover the news of his raising lazarus from the dead four days before has filled the whole population with excitement and many of the friends of lazarus have seen and conversed with him since his resurrection see the solemn state in which the son of god advances on the humblest beast covered with the cloaks of his disciples the saviour of the world is mounted tell ye the daughter of sion said the prophet isaiah behold thy king cometh to thee meek and sitting upon an ass isaiah chapter seventy two verse eleven and zechariah chapter nine verse nine and a very great multitude spread their garments on the way and others cut boughs from the trees and strewn them in the way and the multitude that went before and followed after cried out saying hosanna to the son of david blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest st matthew chapter twenty one verses eight and nine st john tells us the immediate cause of this triumphal reception the multitude therefore gave testimony that was with him when he called lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead for which reason also the people came to meet him because they heard that he had done this miracle st john chapter twelve verses seventeen and eighteen and what was the demeanour of the son of god amidst this universal acclamation when he drew near seeing the city he wept over it saying if thou hadst known and that in this thy day the things that are to thy peace but now they are hidden from thy eyes st luke chapter nineteen verses forty one and forty two he is still the master of humility and his acts still to say to us learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart he leaves us his testament of humility before he gives his testament of blood and this testament is very solemnly recorded by st john knowing that the father had given him all things into his hands and that he came from god and goeth to god he ariseth from supper and layeth aside his garments and having taken a towel girded himself after that he putteth water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded then after he had washed their feet and taken his garments being sat down again he said to them know you what i have done for you you call me master and lord and you do well for so i am 
if then i being your lord and master have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet for i have given you an example that as i have done to you so you do also amen amen i say to you the servant is not greater than his lord neither is the apostle greater than he that sent him if you know these things you shall be blessed if you do them st john chapter thirteen verses three through seventeen all the perfect works and virtues that our divine redeemer has taught in the gospel are completed in their utmost perfection in his passion his cross is the end of the law and the scriptures his passion is the sum of all that man can offer up to god his death is the consummation of every word that is written concerning him the consummation of all humility that gives everything from man to god the consummation of all charity that gives everything from god to man justly then did st paul sum up all in christ crucified and proclaim this to be the power of god and the wisdom of god one corinthians chapter one verse twenty four to know christ crucified is to know the open way from earth to heaven the four evangelists have therefore given us more than the history they have left us the living picture of the divine passion of the son of god filled with all its spirit and feeling in every point and circumstance that the passion of christ may everlastingly live in our souls and we in the passion and death of christ the devout man contemplates the passion of his lord and saviour that he may imitate and compassionate and wonder and exalt and resolve and rest on him first we contemplate christ in his passion to imitate the divine rule of virtue and perfection and the more we conform ourselves to him the more we are strengthened and consoled secondly we contemplate to compassionate and in spirit to suffer with him opening our soul to his sufferings to his words to his patience to his humility to his sorrows turning and ruminating them in our heart that they may make us contrite for our sins and that we may learn their bitterness through his bitter expiation of them and may be humbled and confounded at our ingratitude thirdly we contemplate that awful and stupendous passion to wonder for when we realize to our minds who it is that suffers what he suffers from whom he suffers and for whom he suffers amazement takes possession of the soul for the sufferer is the son of god the divine lover of mankind who endures all that can be inflicted on body and soul of pain shame and ignominy that man can invent or god the father impose on his obedience for the expiation of our sins and for our deliverance from evil fourthly we contemplate that wonderful passion to exalt for through all the sorrows of the son of god we must rejoice in the deliverance of mankind we must exalt that through this blessed passion our lord has delivered us from eternal damnation from the ignominy of our guilt and from the power of the devil we must exalt in seeing that god has loved us so much even when we loved him not and though we take no joy in his ignominy or sufferings but only sorrow yet must we rejoice in their happy fruits and in the wonderful manifestation of his eternal love again must we exalt to see the reparation of our ruin and in our union brought about by the blood and sorrows of our lord in one fold of salvation under one shepherd for this the church above and the church below unite in joy oh how lovely and how venerable is that sacred passion which unites things so remote as heaven and earth in one love 
and one eternal joy above all must we exult in the clemency of our lord and saviour for this is the highest glory of angels and just men to enter most profoundly into the clemency benignity and immensity of the divine goodness which shines so luminously through the tremendous passion of our lord jesus christ who raises up his enemies from everlasting death to everlasting life let then your heart rejoice in your reparation by the magnificent benignity and unspeakable clemency of our crucified redeemer what a revelation his passion gives us of the unfathomable evil of sin of the unsearchable depths of his humility and of the inexhaustible treasures of his love fifthly we must contemplate the passion of our lord to reform and resolve our soul this is effected when we not only imitate compassionate admire and exalt but when the whole man is drawn to christ jesus beholding him as our redeemer always and everywhere crucified then the soul is resolved and so to speak is liquidized and flows from herself and self-love to rise above herself quitting what is beneath her and moving wholly towards her crucified lord then she sees nothing feels nothing in herself but christ crucified dishonoured and suffering for her sake this was the sense of st paul with christ i am nailed to the cross galatians chapter two verse nineteen sixthly we ought to contemplate the passion of christ to find therein our rest and peace this is effected after the soul has been thus transformed when we thirst for the passion of christ as an inexhaustible treasure of goodness and an ever-flowing fountain of grace and love wherein we find sweetness rest and peace there the more we give up our love and devotion to ourselves all the more we cleave to him who died to give us life and find our life and peace in him when thus we enter into the passion of our lord we receive from him these six affections of imitation to purity and enkindle our souls of compassion to unite us with him in love and gratitude of wonder to enlarge and elevate our mind of exaltation to expand our heart of resolution to confirm our soul in his perfection and of peace to preserve our devotion the passion of our lord presents all the great virtues in their perfection for our imitation whether self-denial poverty of spirit obedience silence humility purity patience prayer resignation contempt of the world or charity but among all these virtues he preeminently appears as the master of humility his passion is the book of humility his cross is the throne of humility the terrible way from the mount of olives to mount calvary is the substantive exposition of the words learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart who shall sound the depths of that lonely agony beneath the olive trees it is the oblation of the divine victim before the immolation and the crucifixion of the spirit before the crucifixion of the body the lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all isaiah chapter fifty three verse six as the salt and flour fell on the sacrifice of the law and the hand of the priest laid the sins of the people on its head the father laid the sins of the world upon his son and his innocent soul is charged with all the guilt of mankind and with its terrible expiation the cup of human iniquity all its pride uncleanness and infidelity are mingled in the horrible draught from the first to the last drop of malice that the earth has seen or shall see that heaven has reprobated 
or shall reprobate and especially that original sin which all the rest have followed with this foul and fearful burden laid upon his pure nature he exclaims my soul is sorrowful even unto death st matthew chapter twenty six verse thirty eight and he began to fear and to be weary and to be heavy and to be sad and falling flat with his face to the ground he prayed that if possible this hour might pass from him a struggle had arisen between his human nature and the divine will and he prayed father all things are possible to thee remove this cup from me yet not as i will but as thou willest st mark chapter fourteen verse thirty six he comes to his three disciples finds them asleep and returns to make the same prayer his struggle has become a dreadful agony what is that agony the agony of a dying man is to retain the soul escaping from the body the agony of christ is to subject his innocent soul to responsibility for the foul load of human sin and to undergo its expiation because though his nature shrinks with horror from it it is his father's will and his sweat became as drops of blood trickling on the ground st luke chapter twenty two verse forty four then he prayed the third time in the self-same words and gave up his will to the will of his father then he arose with resignation to accomplish that will what hear we throughout this terrible agony but the words of the divine master learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart mark the traitorous kiss of judas and hear the gentle reproach of jesus before the chief priests and their council he holds a mysterious silence but when the high priest adjures him in the name of the living god to say whether he is the christ the son of the blessed god jesus said i am and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power of god and coming in the clouds of heaven st matthew chapter twenty six verses sixty three and sixty four he defends not himself such is his father's will to whom he is in all things subject but when he is adjured in his father's name by him who sits in the chair of moses he spoke the truth and on that truth was condemned to death all that night the divine victim was salted with sufferings and saluted with spittings with mufflings of the face and buffetings learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart in the morning the chief priests called the high council of the nation to consultation and binding jesus they led him away and delivered him to pilate his meek silence under every accusation awakens the wonder of the roman governor knowing the envy of the accusing priests pilate seeks to deliver him yet only exposes him to deeper ignominy and to greater sufferings for all that was written of him must be fulfilled he must be reputed with the wicked that the sins of the world may be expiated superabundantly he was wounded for our iniquities he was bruised for our sins the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his bruises we are healed isaiah chapter fifty three verses five and twelve pilate declares his innocence and appeals to the people but urged on by the priests the fickle multitude cry out give us barabbas and crucify jesus if thou dismiss him thou art no friend of caesar's his blood be upon us and on our children after this lawful imprecation pilate commands jesus to be scourged after suffering all night from the jews he must now suffer from the gentiles the evangelists have omitted all the incidents of the scourging as though too fearful to relate but they have been precise upon the ignominious mockery of his royalty 
the soldiers of the governor took jesus into the hall and calling the whole band they put on him a robe of purple and plaiting a crown of thorns they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and bowing the knee before him they mocked him saying hail king of the jews and spitting upon him they took the reed and struck his head o divine patience o eternal love o unspeakable profundity of the humility of the son of god despised and most abject of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with infirmity his look as it were hidden and despised whereupon we esteemed him not surely he hath borne our iniquities and carried our sorrows and we have thought him as it were a leper and as one struck by god and afflicted isaiah chapter fifty three verses three four and seven now doth he expiate the pride of man that shuts out the truth of god and refuses entrance to his love his heart is a furnace of humility and prayer every mock each stripe and every sigh of supplication that ascends from his lowly heart is a call upon us to give up and punish our despicable pride he is the humble beaten downtrodden way to god learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart and they took him away to crucify him in the sight of the whole nation assembled at the passover contemplate the dolorous way of the lord of life under the load of his cross from pilate's house by the temple through jerusalem to calvary all along that path of blood he is perfecting the power of salvation in infirmity upon that desolate hill where according to ancient tradition lay the body of the first sinful man the lord of life was stripped to nudity stretched out on the prostrate cross nailed with cruel nails to its cruel wood and lifted up as the sin offering the god on earth to the god in heaven he was offered because he willed it adam stretched his hands to the forbidden tree and his feet hurried on to contemplate his condemnation christ gives his hands and feet to the tree of obedience fastens the decree of condemnation to his cross and blots it out with his blood abel is slain by his brother isaac is offered by abraham the brazen serpent is lifted up by moses the paschal lamb is immolated by the law god is crucified by man sin sacrifices innocence pride immolates humility god overrules these evil instruments to his sovereign will that humble innocence may destroy both pride and sin o soul redeemed by that fast flowing blood look well to thy redemption in that bowed head so venerable in that sweet face so livid in that august brow so wounded in those lightsome eyes so worn with weeping in those authoritative lips so pale with thirst and suffering contemplate the cost of thy salvation in that virginal body bruised with buffets rent with scourges wet with the slaver of the wicked worn and wan with pain and labour behold the expiation of thy sensual sins in those gaping wounds on which thy saviour hangs see the open doors through which the ruddy price of thy salvation streams upon thee the life exuding with that blood is thy life pass through those wounds to the heart from which the stream of life is flowing see how that heart is abandoned by an interior crucifixion not of man but of god to darkness and desolation of spirit for the expiation of all sins of the spirit how far more terrible is this interior expiation listen to the cry of that afflicted heart i thirst however great the corporal thirst 
far greater is the spiritual thirst for the souls of men listen again to the cry of charity father forgive them they know not what they do listen once more and listen with awe to the cry of desolation from the heart of the sacred victim my god my god why hast thou abandoned me the dreadful expiation is hastening on the sacrifice is burning out burning in the furnace of humiliation consuming in the fire of charity with a strong cry full of the power of his will the victim will son cries to the father into thy hands i commend my spirit and all being consummated he expires david heard that last cry of his son a thousand years before and proclaimed its solemn import to mankind into thy hands i commend my spirit thou hast redeemed me lord god of truth psalm thirty verse six the cross is the instrument of contrition upon which the earthly man is broken to be reformed upon the heavenly man the cross is the divine school of patience the school of self-abnegation the school of penance the school of charity the foot of the cross where mary stood with john and where the prostrate magdalene wept her loving grief is the great school of humility where the soul is purified and brought to god therefore ever sounds the great command of the divine master learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart the resurrection of our divine redeemer from the grave his ascension from earth to heaven his seat in our human nature at the right hand of the father with all his wounds glorified and his power over the souls of the humble who draw their humility from him are the crowning of his sacrifice the sublime demonstration of his divinity and the encouragement of all who love and suffer for his sake he humbled himself becoming obedient unto death even the death of the cross for which cause god also hath exalted him and hath given him a name which is above all names that in the name of jesus every knee shall bow of those that are in heaven on earth and under the earth and that every tongue should confess that the lord jesus christ is in the glory of god the father philippians chapter two verses eight through eleven end of lecture eight part three lecture nine part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture nine on humility as the receptive foundation of the divine gifts and virtues part one god resisteth the proud but to the humble he giveth grace one peter chapter five verse five it is impossible to imagine holiness in any of god's creatures without humility and purity for as chastity is the body's purity humility is the soul's purity and purity is the first condition of sanctity humility prepares the way for holiness and holiness deepens the grace of humility so that the higher the holiness the deeper must be the degree of humility but humility like purity is an extremely delicate virtue it is the soul's purity the spirit's modesty the will's continency as it refrains the soul from self-elation from pride and from vanity which defile the spirit with inflation falsehood and injustice as acids dissolve the lustre of the pearl as the rude hand brushes the bloom from the flower the breath of its revelation melts away the graces of humility like the virtue of modesty and because it is the spirit's modesty 
humility is a silent virtue that only reveals its presence unconsciously with a delicate perception of this truth st francis of sales thus writes of it to his friend the bishop of Belley. there are two virtues that whilst we never cease to exercise them should be kept under perpetual silence if we speak of them it should be on some very rare occasion so that it may pass for unbroken silence these two virtues are humility and chastity the reason of this is that it is difficult to touch them without leaving some tarnish on them no tongue can express their value and to speak less of them than their value is to lower their excellence even if we praise humility in itself we awaken the desire of it in self-love and thus draw the man to seek it by the wrong door for the more a man finds the reputation of humility the more he will be tempted to think himself humble and the more he thinks himself humble the less humble he will be as the miser shrinks with a sense of danger from the least allusion to his wealth as the modest virgin blushes with conscious apprehension at the slightest reference to her purity the humble soul is pained at the smallest commendation of her humility equally fine is the instinct of both these virtues to breathe on them is to offend them to speak of them is to hint a peril a word in their praise sounds as a reproof and is felt like a wound when they are strong this arises from no queasy scrupulosity or false delicacy but is owing to the fact that they are not the becoming subjects for self-reflection or of direct self-consciousness on the part of their possessors and any direct allusion to them is an appeal to that self-consciousness which invades their integrity the more humble and pure a soul is the more she looks away from herself into the perfect type of holiness in whose light she sees nothing in herself but the gifts of god and her own defects she knows frail creature that she is that her treasure is from god and is only safe when hidden from mortal eyes for however true however beautiful however sublime may be the praises of this virtue self-love is all the more inclined to take that to herself which belongs only to the virtue st bernard felt this when one day sounding the commendations of humility he felt certain movements begin to rise in him that caused him to fly from the pulpit in dismay although our blessed lord was the perfect form of humility and the fountain of its grace yet as we have seen he only referred to his own humility once and that for the instruction of all ages are we then to abstain from the praises of humility in due season and to souls well disposed to the virtue most certainly not we must rather draw the distinction between the virtue in itself and in those who are safe with god and the same virtue as it may exist in souls still exercised in this world of trial and temptation for no virtue has received greater or more frequent commendations in the holy scriptures and from the fathers and saints of the church unless it be the virtue of charity as it is the rarest of virtues in its perfection as nevertheless its perfection is essential to the perfection of the other virtues as it is also the most hidden as all the roots of life and growth are hidden as it is also a virtue that costs much labor and sacrifice to our nature and therefore requires encouragement both the interest of god's cause and the interest of the cause of souls requires that it be enlarged upon there is the more necessity for this because of the many spurious imitations by which deluded pride caricatures this virtue 
and because it is so little exercised by the world at large that of all virtues it is the least known and the least understood but as it dwells in living souls silence belongs to its essential modesty to the living man therefore these words of st maximus are especially applicable the scripture says praise not a man during his life praise him after death magnify him after all is finished for two reasons ought he to be rather exalted in remembrance than in life that his sanctity may be honoured when flattery can no longer move the speaker and when elation can no more tempt the man who receives the praise st francis therefore concludes yet must we not be scrupulous about praising these virtues when occasion demands it of us never can they be sufficiently praised esteemed or cultivated yet what does this signify all the leaves of praise you can heap together are not worth a handful of the fruit that grows of practice why does god love to see his rational creatures humble why does he endow the humble and only the humble with his gifts and graces why does he save the humble alone the answer to this is hard to flesh and blood and still harder to pride for humility is not the highest or most dignified of virtues its place is very low st paul sums up the highest virtues in faith hope and charity which have god for their direct and immediate object and the greatest of these is charity but humility more directly concerns ourselves its first office is to disbelieve mistrust and renounce self-love justice again and especially justice to god is a very high and noble virtue with its perfect type in god and it dwells in all the virtues to conform them to the perfect law of justice but humility is the virtue that measures our failures from justice and our distance from the eternal justice and that labours to make and to keep us truthful and honest within ourselves and before god religion also is an elevated and an elevating virtue whereby we worship god and give him honour and adoration whilst humility is much expended in keeping us from the insane folly of honouring and worshipping ourselves religion therefore is far more glorifying to god we need scarcely bring in st thomas to show that humility is inferior to many of the virtues as it respects their elevation and dignity yet the sacred scriptures overflow with the doctrine that what god seeks in man what he loves in man what he rewards in man is humility and the fathers and saints proclaim with the united chorus of their minds and hearts that humility is the root and foundation of all the virtues that are born of grace it is the condition on which they are received and the attraction that brings to the soul those nobler gifts of god the measure of their reception and the nurse of their prosperity no soul that follows interior ways is ignorant of the fact that humility is the indispensable foundation of christian virtue but only a limited number trouble themselves to understand how and why it is the indispensable foundation which no other virtue can supply yet to understand this well gives great light to the interior man and to many things the comparing of our spiritual operations to the construction of a building is so frequent in the scriptures and so familiar to our minds that it has become natural to our spiritual language we speak of edifying of laying the spiritual foundation and of building up the soul scarcely noticing the fact that we are using material images from the builder's art to express spiritual operations 
but though there is a resemblance between material and spiritual building there is a great difference between them for example we speak with st paul of building on christ as our foundation and in so far as we rest on him are sustained by him and draw our strength and support from him this image is correct but in so far as a foundation is beneath and exterior to the building it is incorrect for christ is above us and we rest on him by subjection and dependence as the fly on the ceiling yet though this image relieves us from the literalness of the former one it cannot itself be taken literally because the action of christ is first external awakening us and then internal abiding within us christ jesus is our true foundation when the centre of the soul rests on him this may serve to explain how by spiritual insight we rectify the figurative language that we use to give more vivid expression to our spiritual acts the spiritual founding of the soul like the material founding of a building requires three acts we have to remove the unsound foundation to come at the true foundation and to lay upon that the positive foundation or the foundation stones the first preparation for building the spiritual temple in which god may dwell is to remove what is unsound and insecure this is the self-love and pride on which the soul has hitherto rested the removal of this weak and unsafe foundation brings us to the rock or solid ground which is christ and the positive foundation upon which the structure must rise is the faith of christ humility therefore is neither the solid rock for that is christ nor the foundation built upon it which is faith but it is the clearing and preparing of the ground in ourselves we shall recollect this the better if we remember that the word humility from the latin humilitas comes from humus the soft moist earth and unitas which implies connection with the earth humility is the vacancy made in the soul by the removal of our unsound and unsupporting self-love and of the unsubstantial inflation of pride by thus evacuating ourselves as a most untrue foundation we come to the rock which is christ upon whom the whole spiritual building rests with firmness and security for other foundations as st paul no man can lay but that which is laid which is christ jesus one corinthians chapter three verse eleven thus we see that humility is not the positive but the negative foundation the emptying ourselves that christ may dwell in us and the resting on him through subjection to him but christ dwells in us by faith hope and charity these therefore are the true foundation stones whereby the whole building rests on christ the first is faith of which st paul says without faith it is impossible to please god for he that cometh to god must believe that he is and is a rewarder to them that seek him hebrews chapter eleven verse six next to faith st paul places hope which rests on faith continue he says in the faith grounded and settled immovable from the hope of the gospel which you have heard colossians chapter one verse twenty three but of the most precious of the three foundation stones the apostle says being rooted and founded in charity you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know also the charity of christ which surpasseth all knowledge that you may be filled unto all the fullness of god ephesians chapter three verses seventeen through nineteen 
not to adhere too closely to the architectural images of divine things humility prepares the way for receiving the christian virtues as st john the baptist prepared the way for christ his office was to cast down pride and to purify with water his cry was let the hills be brought down the valleys be filled up and the crooked ways made straight everything about him breathes humility and the mortification and self-renunciation that produce humility he is nothing of himself he is but the voice of another whose shoes he declares that he is unworthy to untie having done his work he disappears in the sacrifice of martyrdom and christ comes into his place st paul calls the true christian god's building and god's husbandry he lays in us the foundation of faith that we may know him of hope that we may desire him and of charity that we may love him serve him and rejoice in him but this can only be done in a soul that is duly disposed for god cannot build a divine edifice on an earthly foundation not upon self-love not upon self-elation not upon self-seeking not upon hollow delusive revolting pride not upon animal concupiscence a building upon such quicksands would soon be swallowed up all this creation of our own if anything so vain ought to be called a creation must be swept away and why that god may find his own creation and not a mere falsified creature made into a lie by vanity and pride but his own creature as he made it pure and simple and duly subject to him that he may work what is good and holy on his own foundation we are not created with virtue but with nature we are not created with grace that must be given to our nature but as we are born in pride and sin and have suffered and even encouraged these evils to grow in us they must be removed by the labors of humility what we have by nature is a large capacity for light and grace and for the good they bring to us but this capacity has been grievously contracted and defiled by the pride of sin and humility must open it and contrition must cleanse it but if we draw our affections in upon ourselves we narrow them down to things less than ourselves we still more contract our capacity for divine things and close up ourselves against them the soul thus closed in and preoccupied cannot receive them thus pre-engaged cannot work with them sin is no foundation for the divine virtues to rest upon the pride that repels god is no receptacle for the charity of god when the force of affliction came and allayed the inflammation of evil david returned from his sin to god and humbled to the dust at the sight of his contrition he thus mournfully speaks of what he discovered in himself as the dream of them that awake o lord so in the city thou shalt bring their image to nothing for my heart hath been inflamed and my reins have been changed and i am brought to nothing and i knew it not i am become as a beast of burden before thee and i am always with thee the psalmist saw his nothingness when his sin had parted him from god but when he had entered into himself and humbled himself in the truth he was able to say thou hast held me by my right hand and by thy will thou hast conducted me and with thy glory thou hast received me for what have i in heaven and besides thee what have i on earth for thee my flesh and my heart have fainted away thou art the god of my heart and the god that is my portion for ever for behold they that go far from thee shall perish thou hast destroyed all them that are disloyal to thee but it is good for me to adhere to my god 
to put my hope in the lord god psalm seventy two verses twenty through twenty eight the humility of the prophet abandons his self-reliance as an empty and worthless thing and subjects his soul to god as the one and only source of his good how is this accomplished the almighty tells us through the same prophet empty yourself and see that i am god psalm forty five verse eleven in proportion as the soul vacates herself by humility god fills that soul with light and charity for god is all around us with his light and charity and only requires a humble and an open soul subject to him that he may enter with his gifts when the inhabitants of jerusalem were full of pride and luxury so that god could do nothing for their souls he sent them in captivity to babylon but in their humiliation and sorrow by the waters of babylon their souls were humbled and their hearts were opened then they recalled the prayer of edom over their beloved city empty her empty her even to the foundations thereof psalm 136 verse 7 jerusalem was emptied and with what result the souls of her exiled people were emptied of their vanities and they returned in humility to god when our lord said blessed are the poor in spirit he spoke of those who are conscious of the native poverty of their souls and of their utter indigence without the help of god this is that vacuity of self which the fathers call the place of god in the soul and the place of the virtues and the treasure-house of the virtues they also called this open receptive virtue of humility the hive in which the heavenly sweetness is deposited the vase that receives the divine unction the mouth enlarged with spiritual hunger the garment that enfolds the grace of christ and the secret operations of his spirit and saint paul calls the humble spirit the habitation of god in which his spirit dwells or we may call it the thirsty ground craving for the gifts of heaven st bridget has another figure and compares the humble soul to the rapid wheel that moves beneath the almighty seated in his chariot upon the cherubim and moving over the world whilst the hollow centre of the wheel rests on the axle of divine power as the principle of its progress in short humility is the animated capacity of the soul vacated of self-seeking and looking to god with desire to be filled with his light grace and goodness but this vacating of self leaves no void it receives a fullness for to use the words of william of paris grace will never allow the soul that vacates her own nature to be left void of its own presence the divine gift flows into what nature vacates with a powerful inundation and fills the void of the soul as fast as it is made end of lecture nine part one Lecture 9, Part 2 of The Groundwork of the Christian Virtues by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 9 On Humility as the Receptive Foundation of the Divine Gifts and Virtues. Part 2 The first work of humility is to open the soul that pride has closed that the light of divine truth may enter and reveal you to yourself when we feel that all is not well with us then there is not peace but trouble and remorse which is the sign of god's displeasure and of our own spiritual indisposition we begin to look for a remedy humiliated in the sense of our misery we turn to god and pray for mercy this prayer is mingled with the sense of our misery and want 
the seven penitential psalms of david are the expression of this state of soul the more contrite the cry of the heart the more intense the desire of return to god the more the soul opens and the light enters but it enters to discover to us our wretched condition and awakens us to shame and sorrow all this while pride is receding and humility is coming into its place and as pride relaxes its hold of us and begins to move away we see its folly injustice and deformity and the hatred of it begins to rise within us this hatred is the work of humility beholding that deformity in the light of justice as christ draws nearer to the penitent soul the soul becomes more humble and takes the side of god against herself suppose yourself shut up alone in a dark room you imagine a great deal though you see but little and what you imagine is anything but the truth of which you see but little and nothing clearly this is not a state of peace some one enters who bears a light before him that light affects two things it is a light cast upon you it is a much greater light on him who brings it to you such is your condition when left within the dark shadows of your pride you see nothing clearly and nothing rightly because you are under delusions of the imagination which affect your vision in all that affects you personally christ approaches you with his light which breaks through your delusions and opens your soul to see two things yourself and the divine bearer of the light in him you see the perfect humility purity and beauty of all justice through the light which proceeds from him you see in sad contrast the deformity of your own pride defilement and iniquity you see this in the light that shines into you and awakens your conscience you see it much more in the light that brings your divine redeemer before you the more you meditate on him the more you gaze on him the more you are humbled and the more you look into yourself with eyes filled with his light the more empty and vile you find yourself and the more ashamed what can you do but cast yourself at his feet and implore his mercy recall what he has done for you and hasten to the tribunal appointed for the purification of your soul the very setting of your sins before you the bringing of the hidden things of pride into the light the consciousness that you are putting them before god before the pure hosts of heaven and before his ministers on earth brings a deepening of your humiliation and contrition and helps the opening of the soul then descends the healing grace of purification and forgiveness on the soul in her abjection at the foot of the cross receiving into her heart the cleansing blood with the spirit of mercy you are once more the child of christ who has endowed you with his charity and raised you to a quicker faith and a sure trust in him your heart is enlarged you have recovered peace and a certain sweetness has entered your soul but what opened your soul to these divine gifts was the exercise of humility and what will preserve them is the same virtue of humility solomon says in the proverbs take away the rust from the silver and there shall come forth a most pure vessel proverbs chapter twenty five verse four but if the vessel is not clean enough to be made cleaner if it be too foul to receive what is pure if again it be not ample to receive what is both pure and great god will not throw away his noble gifts upon those who cannot be made worthy of them even by the gifts themselves again if the soul is not subject to god as well as open she cannot receive the grace of the christian virtues you may carry your vessel where else you like but it can only receive water 
when placed under the fountain you may place it under the fountain as long as you choose but unless the lid be opened no water will enter into it humility opens the soul which pride had closed and subjects that soul to god which pride had taken away from him when the divine author of health and life gave sight to the blind soundness to the leper and feet to the lame he always required a humble faith and trust in him as the condition the humility of faith subjected their souls to him and the humility of confidence opened them to his health-giving action two things must always concur the humility of the patient and the ability of the physician if either fails there is no cure st mark tells us that when jesus came to nazareth his own country he could not do any miracles there only he healed a few sick laying his hands on their heads and he gives the reason he wondered at their unbelief st mark chapter six verses five and six humility then is the forming of capacity for receiving the gifts of god and profound humility is an immense capacity capable of receiving the greatest gifts the saints were always laboring to enlarge this capacity by deepening their humility this was the real secret of their obtaining so great a sanctity no cost of self-abnegation or humiliation was spared that might contribute to the emptying of themselves or to the spirit of ascribing to god whatever they were and whatever they received and every gift they received and cultivated enlarged their capacity by enlarging their humility for although humility is the receptive virtue every christian virtue increases humility in proportion to its right and due cultivation the inexhaustible gifts that dwelt bodily in christ dwelt in the unspeakable humility that subjected his human to his divine nature of this david says thou hast made him a little lower than the angels thou hast crowned him with glory and honour and hast set him over the work of thy hands psalm eight verses six and seven and that this taking the lower place and abasing himself to the cross was the receptive foundation of his honour and glory st paul explains we see jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honour that through the grace of god he might taste death for all hebrews chapter two verse nine and he says elsewhere he humbled himself wherefore god hath exalted him philippians chapter two verse nine the gifts and prerogatives conferred on the blessed virgin were all given to her humility this she expressly declares in her canticle of gratitude whosoever shall often meditate on that sublime yet most simple outpouring of the gratitude of humility will find a light in it to illuminate the deeper mysteries of this hidden virtue what do we mean when we say that of ourselves we are nothing or rather what do they mean who through great humility make this discovery and see and feel its truth habitually what did job mean what did abraham mean what did david mean what did saint paul mean what did saint francis mean what did saint catherine mean what did so many of the saints mean when they declared with the clearest and most solemn conviction that they found themselves to be nothing before god they meant far more than that vague and obscure notion of the truth which is more or less in all religiously disposed minds they saw and they felt and they realized that their existence rested on god that they were made for god and not for themselves that their whole life depended on the providence of god and their interior life upon his divine grace they saw clearly that god was their object their light 
their life their good and their happiness that they were incapable of any good without the help of god and that of themselves because of their origin from nothing they were inclined to evil and to nothingness without god we must return to nothingness without the help of god we must remain contracted in soul feeble in will darkened in mind closed against the light of heaven defiled with pride and concupiscence and chilled to death in all our spiritual powers with such a view of ourselves as apart from god truth justice and humility require us to admit and to confess that without god we are nothing father thanner the carthusian has ingeniously illustrated the relation of humility with the other virtues from the figures of arithmetic place a cipher zero this represents nothing but capacity add one cipher to another and every cipher added to the first expresses the deepening of capacity and nothing more thus a million zeros the first cipher represents a certain degree of capacity that is of receptive power or humility every cipher added to this expresses a multiplied growth of capacity that is of humility but to the first cipher of capacity add the first positive virtue by the figure one this will make ten faith resting on the first degree of humility add the virtue of hope and it becomes twenty add charity the first vital virtue and it becomes thirty but these virtues deepen humility and the more humility is deepened the more these virtues increase in us and grow in proportion the first great deepening of humility will raise the thirty to three hundred the second to three thousand and so onwards because the more the soul is opened and enlarged by humility the more amply she is filled with faith hope and charity the same may be said of all the christian virtues and it will serve to illustrate the well-known maxim of st augustine that the higher you would raise the structure of charity the deeper you must sink the foundation of humility this mode of illustration is capable of a sublime application father gratry the oratorian has employed the same method to represent the degree of union of god with our nothingness but we must remember that greater numbers often represent smaller things and less numbers greater things for example fifty thousand grains of earth can never equal one soul the figure one includes the essence of all numbers and represents the perfection of being it may stand as the symbol of god who is the perfect unity we took the figure three to represent the theological virtues we take the figure one to represent god we take the cipher again to represent the capacity of the soul for god which is formed by humility the soul is the subject of god god is her supreme object and good the more you increase capacity through the labors of humility the more you are able to receive of the power of god represent the growth of this capacity of soul by ciphers thus zero double zero triple zero quadruple zero let this capacity be united with the perfect one with the divine object of your soul and you will see how the communicated power of god increases to ten one hundred one thousand ten thousand according to the degree of humility which vacates us of ourself and subjects us to god this will help you to understand how humility is the receptive foundation of the divine gifts and to see the force of the divine word empty yourself and see that i am god and this was the perfect humility of christ as described by st paul 
he emptied himself and took the form of a servant in whom the fullness of the godhead dwelt bodily colossians chapter two verse nine his human nature was totally given up to the divine nature the rind comes before the fruit embraces it protects it and expands with its growth in like manner is humility the receptive and protective counterpart of every christian virtue and as the soundness of the rind secures the soundness of the fruit the grace of humility is inseparable from the grace of the other virtues as pride is the virulent element in every vice from which it derives its malice humility is the element in every virtue that subjects it to god and makes it acceptable to him with his acute discernment of internal things st gregory the great has marked those singular functions that belong exclusively to this virtue and has so classed the virtues as to group all the other virtues on one part and on the other humility as their counterforce and indispensable complement as well as foundation the signs he says of the great grace of christ are the virtues and humility if both completely meet in the soul there is clear proof of the presence of the holy spirit in another place he gives the reason of this when we use the virtue we have with a view to our own transitory praise that virtue becomes the servant of vice and ceases to be a virtue the reason of this is that humility is the origin of virtue and virtue can only germinate and expand when it remains in its proper root of humility if you cut your virtue away from that root it must wither up because it loses the vital sap of charity in further illustration of this great truth it may be here observed that as we are instructed by that learned pontiff benedict the fourteenth in his great work on the canonization of saints the first step taken in investigating the virtues of the person proposed for canonization is this whether humility has been practised in the heroic degree for if that fails the rest must fail as a matter of course we have chiefly considered humility as it is the receptive virtue under three similitudes as a vacant vessel made void of self to receive the gifts of god as a tree on which the virtues are engrafted and as a foundation in which they are securely placed the virtue may also be well compared with the all-receiving all-fertilizing mother earth from which its name is derived which is subject to the heavens is opened by the labor and toil of lowly men is softened by the rain of heaven refreshed with the dews warmed by the sun and becomes through these descending influences the nourishing mother of every plant that our heavenly father has planted so far from having anything in its nature to exalt us it is the death of self-glorification should it fail to be that self-glorification becomes its death yet what can this virtue yield to self-glorification since it only removes what is unsolid ignoble and disgraceful from us and brings us down to our nothingness before him who is all things to us the most unreasonable then of all unreasonable things is to take pride in humility which both destroys this virtue and withers up the rest yet even this folly will often arise in demonstration of the utter weakness and perversity of human nature let us turn for light to the holy scripture through the prophet isaiah thus saith the lord heaven is my throne and earth my footstool what is this house that you will build for me and what is this place of my rest my hand made all these things and all these things were made saith the lord but to whom shall i have respect 
but to him that is poor and little and of a contrite spirit and that trembleth at my words isaiah chapter sixty six verses one and two you give me what is my own says the almighty vacate me a temple in the lowly places of your spirit and there i will rest in you as the flowers planted in the ground are stirred by the gentle south winds to yield their perfumes so is there a tenderness in humble souls that is sensitive to every breath of grace and is tremulously alive to every ray of light and every inspiration this delicate sensibility to the breathings of grace raises up the affections to meet the low-voiced call of god that comes to the soul like the murmuring wind upon the flowers whilst her spiritual veins receive his whisperings but if the soul is but half opened and half closed upon herself she will not find full peace unless the eternal truth cut sharp like a keen and searching wind into the hidden tumours that close up the secret ways to the inmost sanctuary of the spirit but when humility has entered so far its unction gives a yielding temper to the very centre of the spirit that frees her to go forth from her poor self to meet the attraction of divine charity and to her very centre she finds herself in peace what is this place of my rest it is the soul subject to his will from her very centre st bernard does not hesitate to say that humility is the consummation of all justice and as it subjects the whole man to god to his truth to his will and to his commandments it cannot be less who he asks is just except the humble man when the lord bent himself down beneath the hand of john the baptist and john feared to act because of the divine majesty the lord said to him suffer it now for so it becometh us to fulfil all justice this was assuredly to place all justice in humility hear what the apostle says we brought nothing into this world and certainly we can carry nothing out of it one timothy chapter six verse seven this plain truth is justice but the justice of humility we take nothing to god but what we have received from him into our soul and what will he accept of us a contrite and humble heart o god thou wilt not despise psalm fifty verse nineteen hear what the humble prophet says my soul hath cleaved to the pavement quicken thou me according to thy word i have declared my ways and thou hast heard me teach me thy justifications make me understand the way of thy justifications and i shall be exercised in thy wondrous works psalm 118 verses 25 through 27 the humility of the psalmist is just to evil and just to good which is the consummation of justice he is just to evil which he confesses and condemns in himself he is just to good confessing that his justification is from god and in no wise from himself if the basis of humility fail all the virtues born of grace come to ruin faith loses its vitality hope sinks into despondency charity is destroyed prudence loses her sight and her balance justice is turned into injustice fortitude is loosened from her strength and temperance melts into dissipation take humility from the learned man and losing his true position and just point of view he will put imagination in the place of truth take it from the prudent man and his wisdom will evaporate in conceit and vanity take it from the man in authority and ambition will succeed to moderation and he will overstep the lines of his just power take it from the devout man 
and either to escape his interior desolation he will break into open evil or will give way to a wasting melancholy or whilst keeping the resemblance of his lost piety as a mask his hypocrisy will make ravaging additions to his inward corruption what page of holy scripture resounds not with the proof that god resists the proud but gives his grace to the humble one page proclaims the precept another shows the effects in men of its observance or neglect another rebukes the proud and encourages the humble a history of humility drawn from the sacred scriptures would be the most instructive of books and to continue it through the history of the church would complete a most wonderful record of the way in which god at all times blesses the humble and repels the proud then would it be seen as in two great processions of the human race the one advancing towards god the other departing from him supplying an overwhelming evidence that from the beginning of the world to our time god has always resisted the proud and always given his grace to the humble has always turned the work of the proud to barrenness and the work of the humble into a marvellous fertility of good line upon line precept upon precept example upon example one great universal law has been incessantly proclaimed by command and by example as the condition of human salvation as in the book of job he that hath been humbled shall be in glory and he that shall bow down his eyes shall be saved job chapter twenty two verse twenty nine and in the psalm thou wilt save the humble people and wilt humble the eyes of the proud psalm seventeen verse twenty eight and he hath looked on the prayer of the humble one psalm one hundred one verse eighteen and again the lord is nigh unto them who are of a contrite heart and he will save the humble spirit psalm thirty three verse nineteen solomon also says in the proverb humility goeth before glory proverbs chapter fifteen verse thirty three and again glory shall receive the humble of spirit proverbs chapter twenty nine verse twenty three our blessed lord sums up the teaching of the prophets in these words he that exalteth himself shall be humbled and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted st matthew chapter twenty three verse twelve st peter continues the same teaching with all the apostles be ye humbled beneath the mighty hand of god that he may exalt you in the time of visitation one peter chapter five verse six it is the constant similarity in the form of the precept and of the reward attached to its observance running through the old and new testaments that gives it such a fixed unchangeable and eternal character resting on the immutable order of things and in every repetition of the fundamental law of humility there is attached to it and to it alone the promise of exaltation of salvation of the kingdom of god or of glory and why but because humility is that which god rewards with his grace and justification as the psalmist says god will justify the humble and the poor psalm eighty one verse three there may be many virtues but the reward is promised to the humility of those virtues for god never changes the rule of resisting the proud and giving his grace to the humble end of lecture nine part two lecture nine part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 9 
on humility as the receptive foundation of the divine gifts and virtues. Part 3 The voice of the apostles has no sooner ceased, except that of St. John, when St. Clement, whose praise is in the churches, gives this emphatic advice to the Corinthians. Let your children be bred up in the instruction of Christ, and let them especially learn how great a power humility has with God. And through three chapters of his beautiful epistle to the Corinthians, the disciple of the two great apostles illustrates the power of humility. The epistle of St. Barnabas is entirely based upon the history of humility in the Old Testament. It would take many volumes to repeat what the fathers and saints have written in exposition and enforcement of this their favorite virtue. The chief points on which they dwell are these. Number one, that humility is the distinctive virtue of Christ and of the true Christian. Number two, that it is the very groundwork of sanctity and salvation. Number three, that it is the essential condition upon which the divine gifts are received. Number four, that it is the mother and the nurse of the virtues. Number five, that the depth of humility measures the greatness of the gifts received by the soul. Number six, that the more they strove with great labor to cultivate this virtue, the nearer they found themselves to God, and were the more amazed to see how little it was understood or prized among Christians, except among those who aspire to perfection. Number seven, in short, that the want of steady and persevering labor in this virtue was the cause of all failures in the supernatural life. St. Cyprian has expressed the whole force of the virtue in one short sentence. We Christians, he says, have no occasion to strive for exaltation. We grow to the highest things from humility. When Celsus, representing the pagan mind, threw his sneers at the very possibility of such a virtue as humility, Origen showed its depth and grandeur from the fact that no mere man could on human authority have obtained a hearing for such a virtue. It required to have God for its teacher, and not only God, but God made man. When St. Passion had to reprove the heretical pride of Novation, he sharpened his reproach by contrasting the deformity of his obtrusive spirit with that beautiful innocence which he had lost in losing humility. All humility, he says, even that of the sinner, even that which gently tempers the sinner with its spirit, is innocence. This accords with St. Augustine's doctrine that humility exercised among evil works is more pleasing to God than pride among good works. This truth was taught by our Lord himself in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. We may take Cassian as representing the great spiritual schools of Egypt and Palestine in the early ages of the church. In his institutes, he says, it is of the plainest evidence that no one can obtain the end of perfection and purity except through the means of humility. The disciple learns the virtue in the first instance by exhibiting it towards his brethren, until he learns to exhibit it from his inmost heart to God. In his celebrated conferences, the same spiritual writer says, Humility is the mistress of all the virtues, the most solid foundation of the celestial building, the peculiar and magnificent virtue of our Saviour. All the wonderful things that Christ did, humility does, when we follow our meek Lord, not in sublime miracles, but in patience and humility. And he quotes the beautiful saying of Abbot Pemon, that humility is the land in which God commands us to offer sacrifice. This is beautifully true, 
because humility is the immolation of self-love to justice saint isaac the syrian says you will show how deeply you have entered into the scriptures exactly in proportion as you demean yourself humbly to the brethren the holy bishop of nineveh takes this as his test because humility to the brethren is proof positive of humility to god for the fathers of syria let saint dorothea speak he says if pride be the root of all evil humility is most certainly the restorative medicine of all good it is the recipient of all gladness rest and glory for the recluses of mount sinai let st john climacus be the witness he designates humility as the virtue that conquers all passion as the destroyer of all intellectual poisons and as a grace of the soul that no tongue can describe and that experience alone can understand an unspeakable gift from the treasury of god from the holy land comes the voice of saint jerome do thou hold nothing more excellent than humility nothing more lovely it is the preserver and chief guardian of all the virtues nothing else whatsoever can be so pleasing to god or even to man than to be great in merit of life and little through one's humbleness we now come to the great saint basil whose rule has guided all eastern religious life from his own day to ours a great service he says is the service of god embracing all his precepts in a net and winning the kingdom of heaven but of these precepts the first is humility the parent of every virtue giving birth to all good things in abundance the progress of humility is the progress of the soul whilst the ignoble failure of the soul comes from elation to know piety is to know humility and meekness it is our emulating of christ as elation is the emulating of the devil elsewhere he says as the hive receives its swarm of bees with all their sweets humility is the recipient of all good graces and gifts and the other saint basil of seleucia tells us that we may know the extent of the grace that is given us by the strength of our humility saint ambrose considers it as a searching light can there be anything so precious as this humility it searches thy nature through in body and soul and whilst it subjects thy body to thy soul it teaches thee in thy soul to know thyself if there be a saint who uniting great sanctity with amazing genius has thrown the light of science and experience upon this wonderful virtue it is saint augustine who may be called the doctor of humility by eminence through the ten folios into which his numerous writings are gathered he never loses sight of this virtue he never relaxes from inculcating this fundamental justice whether he is writing to catholics heretics or heathens it is the medicine of the mind and heart the restorative of spiritual strength the head sum and force of christian discipline the indispensable condition of all union with god to his profound mind humility is as the bass in a chorus of music the sustaining force of all intellectual and moral harmony in the soul he calls it the first and greatest gift of the spirit he sees in it the path whereby we return to life in christ and to the joy of god's countenance he finds that all strength lies in humility he calls it the key of knowledge he notes that humble obedience goes before wisdom and true wisdom can only follow humility he says that our very perfection is humility by which he undoubtedly means that this virtue perfects our subjective condition that god may perfect our charity for it is one of his maxims that where is humility there is charity 
and he extracts the doctrine from the scriptures that glory is the reward of humility and is won by the labors of humility we may now understand what he writes to the inquiring Dioscorus. however much you question me about the precepts of the christian religion although there are so many things on which i might be expected to speak yet the best reply to all your questions would be to speak always and only on the one subject of humility like the facets of a diamond each passage we have quoted presents the virtue from a special point of view deserving a special attention and we will venture to say that whoever will ponder sentences like these and pass them from the mind into the heart will be led into the profundities of the virtue from which they spring and will find their truth blended in the deep-seated root of the virtue where it has taken possession of the soul one or two more extracts shall be given to represent the treasures of the middle ages st hildegard says faith is the eye of humility and obedience its help and contempt of evil the measure of its magnitude beautiful in their truth also are the words of the holy hermit warwick we may certainly affirm without any injury to our baptism that humility is not unlike to baptism in its influences for though it repeats not the death of christ it renews the death and burial of sin it opens the heavens to us and gives us back the spirit of adoption the man is renewed by humility in the innocent spirit of a child and the father again acknowledges that child seven times in a humble spirit did naaman wash in jordan's waters and his flesh became as the flesh of a little child there are many books written on the interior exercise of prayer and not a few persons perplex themselves with a multiplicity of rules that injure their simplicity because they do not attend to the one essential foundation of prayer the sacred scriptures require but the one condition that prayer be humble he hath had regard to the prayer of the humble says the psalm and he hath not despised their petition psalm 101 verse 18 and again in ecclesiasticus the prayer of him that humbleth himself shall pierce the clouds and until it come nigh he will not be comforted he will not depart until the most high behold ecclesiasticus chapter thirty five verse twenty one in short the prayer of the humble and the meek hath always pleased god judith chapter nine verse sixteen need we recall the prayer of abraham of moses of david of elias or of the publican given expressly for our example need we recall the prayer of our lord himself in his agony and crucifixion a little reflection on the subject ought to show us that humility is the spirit life and very nature of prayer for prayer is all subjection all adoration all exposition of our wants or it is gratitude and humble praise to the supreme lord of our souls nor is the higher way of contemplation other than the subjection of our mind and heart to the light and divine operations of the holy spirit of god let us consult some of the great authorities on this subject saint teresa says in her life the whole edifice of prayer is founded on humility the nearer we find ourselves to god the more must this virtue be increased otherwise all is lost and falls to the ground again this great contemplative says let others go by some other shortcut if they please what i have been able to understand is that the whole of this structure of prayer is grounded on humility and that the more the soul is abased in this holy exercise the more doth god exalt her nor do i remember that he ever showed me any of those singular mercies but when i found myself as it were annihilated at seeing myself 
so very wicked st john of the cross inculcates this truth in a chapter of great clearness as well as profundity he is speaking of the higher degrees of sanctity but even the lower must proceed on the same fundamental principle he warns us however that he is writing only for the true friends of christ and significantly adds that the greater number who claim this title are too well contented with their spiritual consolations to enter into the crucified interior of our lord but says this profoundly illuminated saint i would have spiritual persons understand that the way of the lord consists not in multiplying reflections devout exercises and fervid affections however requisite they are to beginners it consists in one sole and indispensable thing and that is to know how to deny oneself in reality both as to our interior and exterior self surrendering one's self up to suffer and to aim at annihilating one's own spirit in all things for the love of christ for this one exercise comprises in itself all and more than all that can be found or accomplished in all other exercises whatsoever but if we fail in this which is the root and sum of all virtue in other methods we are but following paths that turn aside instead of going straight to the mark david said i am brought to nothing and i knew it not and so does the truly spiritual soul understand the mysterious way and the door through christ that leads to direct union with god but when resting in nothing that she can call her own she gains the state of sovereign humility then is her union with god perfected and that not through the medium of her spiritual delights but of the living crucifixion and death of her own self whether sensual or spiritual in her interior or exterior to bring the instruction of this lecture to a point two things work together in the perfecting of the soul the abdicating of oneself and the influx of light and charity into the soul always in that degree in which she abdicates her own spirit the first of these is gained by great labor and effort the second is divinely given to those labors by no labor of ours can we give ourselves one single ray of light or one spark of charity these are purely the gifts of god but we dispose our souls to ensure these divine gifts by self-abdication and humility which though founded on grace can only be perfected by great effort and the persevering toil of the will this has been admirably expressed by saint mary magdalene de posi the soul she says becomes possessed of the divine love with the greatest ease if she be perfectly exercised in humility nor is any other exercise required than that of humility to gain this love for what wins the divine love for us is the much abasing and lowering oneself before god upon which his love enters into our humbled souls what invitation can be so influential to the love of god as to offer him a soul that is really humble there never was and there never will be a human heart filled with humility that was not or will not be as full of love and through this love the soul is united perfectly with thee o my god and becomes in a measure one with thee by partaking of thy love frail as man is humility will make a foundation in him strong enough for god to raise an edifice upon it that shall last for eternity an edifice to receive a celestial life whose magnificence exceeds our present power of comprehension strong is this foundation to hold the divinest treasures in security strong to carry our frail vessel with all its precious freight over the troubled waters of this life into the haven of peace upon a foundation so strong as this humility resting on god and not on us 
we bend safely under every storm pass securely through the darkest hours of trial and endure what we may have to suffer with peaceful magnanimity in his pride of science archimedes asked but for a point outside the world on which to rest his engines and he would undertake to move the world from off its course what the great mathematician asked for in vain the humble christian has found his point of rest is in god his moving power is prayer and its force is in the humility of his heart for however little known to the world at large it is well known to the humble that the god of heaven and earth in response to their prayers changes the issues of the world's affairs despite of all human policy the supplications and good works of his servants are a motive with him to increase his merciful and beneficent action in the world pride puts everything wrong in the world humility moves god to put many things right though not all by a long way because pride is still predominant in the greater number of souls we have already quoted the profound saying of an ancient father that humble souls are the hinges on which god moves the world at their supplication god changes the hearts of rulers the action of the elements the issue of counsels and the direction of events such is the power of humble souls whose prayers obtain their efficacy through the divine mastery of humility in the crucified son of god it is prodigious to think what evils are stayed and what good is begun or advanced through the prayers of the humble servants of god for proof we have only to pronounce the names and recall the history of abraham moses david and elias of saint paul saint antony saint benedict saint francis saint bernard saint catherine of siena saint teresa saint charles borromeo saint francis saviour or saint vincent of paul hidden as the powers of such as these may be from the great world around them the heavenly spectators behold the secret springs of that power and we who are familiar with their lives know the immense blessings that came of their presence wherever they might move when this world will come to an end our lord has declared to be a secret reserved to the father but what will bring the world to an end is a less difficult question when it no more produces humble souls there will be no longer a divine reason for its existence when all flesh had corrupted its way the deluge came to purify the world that the human race might begin anew from the just man noah when a like corruption of pride and sensuality so pervades the world that god is no longer able to find humble souls on whom to bestow his grace and admit to his kingdom what remains of human nature will be useless for its end useless for the eternal purpose of its creation and will be cast away as refuse and the world will be purged by fire for all things are for the elect and the elect are the humble humble souls may be compared to the wheels beneath the glowing cherubim that form the chariot of god but of god in the form of man in the vision of ezekiel they have eyes for contemplation and there is life in them and whithersoever the spirit goeth thither they go responsive to his will they return not back when they go because they seek not themselves and in their going they depart not from their subjection to the throne of god in their repose as in their activity they are equally actuated by the spirit of god and equally on fire with his charity in all their actions whether interior or exterior they recede not from the guidance of the divine presence under which they move and meditate and glow on whom reposing amidst the sounds of their prayer and praise the power of the almighty goes forth into the world to do his work of mercy and good will to man 
End of Lecture 9, Part 3lecture ten part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture ten on the magnanimous character of humility part one it is he that giveth strength to the weary and increaseth force and might to them that are not isaiah chapter forty verse twenty nine however excellent it may be what we do not know we cannot love this is the special difficulty that stands in the way of recommending the virtue of humility that its power and its excellence are hidden from the proud and from the sensual man to the natural man it is unknown to the proud man it is repulsive yet what so many persons look upon as the mere result of weakness and timidity is in fact a great self-conquering force which places the four cardinal virtues on their true basis and employs them in vigorous action no man can be so prudent just firm in endurance or temperate in life and conduct as he who is blessed with sincere humility but to unlock this truth to minds that are unprepared is no easy task for it chimes not with the inclinations of the sensuous and the proud the subject is in its nature severe and requires to be unveiled in its simple truth rather than to be clothed with attractive colouring of what use is a golden key if it will not open what we want and why should we refuse an iron key if that will suit our purpose all that we seek is to open what is locked from sight among the cardinal virtues and the virtues included in them we have chosen magnanimity as the one in which all the rest are exercised in their highest degree it was the noblest virtue of the heathens and is still looked upon as the noblest virtue of men of the world and our object will be to show that this virtue of magnanimity which is the noble outcome of the cardinal virtues has its true basis not as the world imagines in self-sufficiency and pride but in the humility that rests all virtue on the grace and power of god and further to demonstrate that it is exercised in an incomparably higher degree by the servants of god in whom it springs from humility than by the servants of the world in whom it springs from pride magnanimity or greatness of soul is opposed to pusillanimity or littleness of soul it is the virtue that inclines the will to arduous and generous acts in every kind of virtue and is classed with the cardinal virtue of fortitude but christian magnanimity contemplates more elevated motives and aims at higher objects and is consequently of a much nobler character than either the magnanimity of the heathen or that of the admired man of the world the magnanimity of the heathens as explained by their philosophers and especially by aristotle in his ethics and cicero in his offices contemplated human honour the shunning of dishonour and the conquering of those difficulties that stand in the way of honour they rested their greatness of soul on self-sufficiency and self-esteem and as their chief object in life they look to the elevation of the man before his fellow-men of the honourable class for they professed to despise the multitude as dishonourable although they were always ready to humiliate themselves to the multitude in outward show when they sought their suffrages for public employments the magnanimity of the heathen had no connection with his religion and but little with his moral conscience it sprang from a public unwritten law with the opinion of the honourable class for its sanction it began and ended in the man and had its sphere in his reputation 
honor was to these men what god is to the christian the chief object and end of their life when honor failed them their pride could not endure dishonor and most of them were ready to commit suicide in order to escape from dishonor a clear proof that they considered honor to be the final end of their existence as the code of honor is not the code of conscience it allows of many exceptions from the dictates of conscience and in this respect the modern man of honor is not unlike his pagan predecessors for he is but too apt to put honor before conscience and to sacrifice his conscience to his honor yet there is a spirit of honor which the good christian ought to cultivate a self-respect from high christian motives that as a habit will often restrain him from ill manners imprudence folly and even worse at times and under circumstances when conscience moves but languidly or not at all but the love of honor as cultivated by the heathen and by the modern man of the world holds the same position with them as the love of god holds with the true christian it is their first of virtues to which all the rest are subordinate yet when measured by the christian law it is a vice rather than a virtue because its motive is the contenting of pride in obtaining human glory and tertullian does not exceed the limits of justice in calling these men of honour the animals of glory i take up the first modern book that comes to hand in which the virtue of magnanimity is treated in the old pagan spirit and i read its description as follows perseverance firmness fortitude constancy courage and calmness manfulness dignity of mind self-esteem and consistency are each the same principle and only different terms applied to a different degree of intensity or different relations and circumstances or they stand to each other in the relation of principle and application or lastly they are very nearly akin to one another and one can hardly be imagined to exist without the other here the political or public virtues are all identified with self-esteem which is obviously their basis remove this and substitute humility and you will have the description of christian magnanimity for the essential difference between pagan and christian greatness of soul is this that the one rests on the self-sufficiency of man and the other on the insufficiency of man without god christian magnanimity is a most generous virtue because it is essentially opposed to selfish considerations it moves the will to great efforts in seeking the greatest good and in valiantly overcoming the obstacles that stand in the way of that good whether those obstacles be interior or exterior it is intimately concerned with hope because without hope we cannot aspire to great things it is also closely allied with confidence because without great confidence in the help of god we cannot ascend to a good that is so far beyond our nature this confidence is a certain promptitude of will acting on the trust that god is with us and will enable us to master all difficulties in doing what we know he wills that we should do in order to obtain the arduous good that we seek this hope and this confidence are themselves a generous and magnanimous exercise of the soul for there is a greatness of soul in giving up the fears and misgivings of nature and in resting more trust on god than at the moment we see reason for by acting in generous faith it is considered a mark of greatness of soul in alexander that despite of warnings he trusted his life to his friend and physician great also must be the soul that transfers her whole trust from self to god this made the martyrs the confessors of the faith and all the generous heroes of god 
magnanimity is also concerned with security or tranquillity which rests with a sincere conscience on god this removes all unnecessary cares and clears away superfluous anxieties which only encumber and impede the soul fret her powers and absorb her energies in a useless way so that the will cannot give itself whole and undivided to the great objects to be aimed at and much power goes to waste and worry within the man this is quite as improvident as any other kind of waste or dissipation for it is a waste of our moral power and the cause of inward trouble and confusion the security of the soul comes of concentrating herself upon her true supporting centre upon the god who sustains all things and belongs to the soul that trusts herself to him have you never found that when you rest your troubled soul on god there comes a calm and serenity follows there is no spiritual strength but what is from god the lord is my firmament my refuge and my deliverer psalm seventeen verse three and the strength of the upright is the way of the lord proverbs chapter ten verse twenty nine a soul loses her sense of security and consequently her tranquillity when she gets restless and impatient because of the obscurity that surrounds some present difficulty or some difficulty in prospect through which at the moment she sees not her way this often arises from not habitually living in the higher and serener light of the mind but in the lower sphere of the inferior nature so that imagination gets the start of intelligence and soft sensuous fear puts in its influence then patience should wait with calmness until light comes to clear the subject or until prayer obtains a serener light but the weakest way of losing tranquillity is to let the difficulty get inside of you and take possession of your feelings which will not only trouble you but will obscure the light that should fall upon it and darken your perception whereas if you keep the trouble outside in its objective position your calmer mind will see through it after a while and how it is to be dealt with a great soul that is calm in her security is simple in action but pride and vanity make a weak soul that acts under excitement which is always the sign of weakness and acts more from imagination than from the light of intelligence he who acts from humility is calm and strong because he rests his powers on the eternal tranquillity the sculptor understands how calmness is strength when he represents his heroes in the tranquil balance of their powers the ocean is the symbol of strength when calm but when agitated by the winds it shows weakness and like a passionate man it becomes destructive the first motive for security is the concurrence of god who helps all natures to do their offices and withholds not his general cooperation even from sinners that the appointed order of things may not fail or come to a stand but how much more powerfully does he keep his servants who labour in justice to do his will nor will he suffer them to be vanquished by the difficulties that beset their path to him trusting therefore in god and not in ourselves we ought to seek the things that are above with the calm valour of a tranquil spirit for those who trust in the lord shall renew their strength isaiah chapter forty verse thirty one the second motive for security is a good conscience this wonderfully strengthens the confidence of the just man and confirms the hope and belief of a successful ending to all his labours listen to the wisdom of holy job if thou wilt put away from thee the iniquity that is in thy hand and let not injustice remain in thy tabernacle then mayest thou lift up thy face without spot and thou shalt be steadfast 
and shalt not fear job chapter eleven verses fourteen and fifteen there is nothing says st bernard more secure in this life than a good conscience nothing that we can possess more joyful the body may oppress the soul the world may betray us the devil may frighten us but a good conscience is always secure the third motive for security exists when with a calm solicitude we do all in our power to accomplish every good we undertake to do in a magnanimous spirit not rashly or imprudently but knowing that god will help us to do what he wills us to do if we trust in his mercy st cyprian has admirably expressed for us this source of security from god it is from god it comes whatever we can do from him we live from him we have power and while still upon earth we receive vigour from him to know the signs of the future things only let fear be the keeper of innocence so that the flow of heavenly influence which god sends may be received by the delighted soul with hospitality and just cooperation and the security thus obtained may neither give occasion to negligence nor suffer the old enemy to creep in christian magnanimity is opposed to pusillanimity or littleness of soul and to softness as defects from this noble virtue and to presumption ambition and vain glory as excesses beyond the true objects right motives and just temper of the magnanimous soul pusillanimity or littleness of soul is a vicious diffidence and mistrust of the powers that god has given us making this mistrust a reason for escaping the good work set before us and shying and shunning the duty we ought to accept and to do and so weakly giving up the spirit of devotedness under the plea that it is beyond our strength this weakening vice comes of excessive and superfluous timidity disordering dejecting and saddening the soul and greatly hindering her from serving god and from employing those means whereby the virtues are obtained and preserved it is a vice that greatly displeases god is very ignominious to the soul and utterly opposed to the divine goodness and sweet providence which god ever shows to those who are willing to serve him it is therefore condemned in the holy scriptures and commanded to be cast out of the soul be not pusillanimous in thy soul says ecclesiasticus ecclesiasticus chapter seven verse nine say to the faint-hearted says isaiah take courage and fear not behold god will bring the revenge of recompense god himself will come and will save you isaiah chapter thirty five verse four when christ walked on the troubled sea and his disciples tossed in the boat were troubled and afraid he said to them be of good heart it is i fear ye not st matthew chapter fourteen verse twenty seven this feebleness of soul may sink from one degree of pusillanimity to another until it reaches a settled despondency st bernard has shown the degrees of this descent as in the holy and elect of god he says tribulation worketh patience and patience trial and trial hope and hope confoundeth not in the reprobate on the contrary tribulation worketh pusillanimity and pusillanimity perturbation and perturbation desperation and that worketh ruin the severest punishment that god inflicted on the israelites in the desert was for their pusillanimity when the spies reported to them the strength of the inhabitants of the promised land and of their walled cities they lost all heart and courage and of the six hundred thousand men that had left egypt god decreed that except joshua and caleb all should perish in the wilderness the remedy for this faint-heartedness 
is to put no trust whatsoever in one's own strength and not to listen to flesh and blood but to cleave with faith and trust to the divine help and strength alone because god never fails those who trust in him so he has promised and his promises are firm and faithful it is he that giveth strength to the weary and increaseth force and strength to them that are not youth shall faint and labor and young men shall fall by infirmity but they that hope in the lord shall renew their strength they shall take wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint isaiah chapter forty verses twenty nine through thirty one there is a kind of pusillanimity that insidiously relaxes the soul and is often very enfeebling especially in those who have not yet reached the experience of solid piety it may be described as a habit of fostering inward discomforts on unreasonable grounds and of nursing them into discouraging fears the subjects of this habit may be compared with those sensitive people who are unreasonably anxious about their health and keep themselves shut up in a close and unhealthy atmosphere rather than face the fresh open air they weaken their health by too much care of it in a wrong way such people have all manner of discomforts and timidities and are too much occupied with themselves to do anything that is large and generous if asked the radical cause of this spiritual infirmity the answer is clear and certain but the difficulty is to get the answer understood by those whom it most concerns it comes of a self-love that is always wanting to feel oneself and with the subtle feelers of this self-love the will is entangled and held down from rising to what is greater and better than oneself and that would free the soul and strengthen her powers by lifting her out of these unreasonable troubles and fears after a soul has done penance for her more serious sins and is happily free from them she finds herself subject to venial sins and various defects undoubtedly we ought to do our best to correct and amend them but neither to be surprised at them nor lose our peace and above all not to suffer our hearts to faint or our courage to sink on account of them or suffer them to relax our efforts to advance towards our divine good we ought thoroughly to realize that we are weak and infirm creatures with a natural proclivity to evil to be exceedingly grateful to god that he keeps us from the greater evils that destroy his friendship and to take the generous way of correcting those infirmities this is the vigorous way to work at the abnegation of self-will and at obtaining a solid humility which go to the roots of our weakness on the one side and that generously loving and serving god on the other which will bring the strength required to conquer our infirmities in short the effectual way of self-correction is the magnanimous and not the pusillanimous way we must have some infirmity to keep us in mind of our weakness and preserve us from elation and self-conceit the worst of all spiritual evils next to separation from god but to sink down into one's weakness to make much of them to indulge the imagination with exaggerations of them and give one's self more or less to sadness on account of them is to waste no small amount of spiritual strength in a vain and foolish way upon oneself this is not the strong and cheerful way to god but the weak and melancholy way back to self-love end of lecture ten part one lecture ten part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain
lecture ten on the magnanimous character of humility part two the first faults of those whose chief aim in life is to love and serve god are commonly surprises and results of weakness and infirmity without anything in them of deliberate malice they are consequently venial or pardonable and every generous act is effacing them the council of trent teaches that there is not even an obligation of confessing them although that is commendable because they are constantly being effaced by every pious act and good work the worst evil in those of whom we speak is not their first but the second committed upon the first in making a trouble about it taking it to the bosom of self-love there nursing it and making much of it and murmuring over it with the murmurs of mortified pride this kind of nursing is very weakening to the spiritual constitution it is accompanied with a constant imbibing of mistrust and draws hope away from the soul as well as courage it comes of fixing our eyes upon ourselves rather than on god and of sinking our hearts into our infirmities rather than lifting them up to the divine source of help and strength not so did the magnanimous psalmist manage the weakness of his soul he says i have lifted up my eyes to the mountains from whence help shall come to me my help is from the lord who made heaven and earth psalm one hundred twenty verses one and two and repeatedly in other psalms he says to thee o lord have i lifted up my soul in thee o god i put my trust let me not be ashamed psalm twenty four verse one when we lift up our hearts out of ourselves to god and keep them lifted up these self-made miseries drop off for want of nutriment there are two children in one family of whom the one is weak and impulsive and often committing faults but this child is open cheerful self-forgetting and always trusting to his father's love and forgiveness even though punished for his faults the other commits fewer faults but is morose and fretful over his failures mopes in the fancy that they are still remembered and unforgiven however assured to the contrary and still goes on curling himself up round his wounded self-love which of these children will the father love most assuredly the one who trusts in his father's love and forgiveness so will your heavenly father do to you there is another kind of pusillanimity to which women are more liable than men i can only describe it as a want of courage to stand on their own spiritual feet they remind one of dolls they have neither nerve nor strength of joint to keep themselves up without external support and this nerveless habit grows with indulgence in grave difficulties and trials advice and direction must of course be sought of these i am not speaking but there is a class of persons that have a real desire of the better things yet are always in a relaxed and helpless state of soul because they give up the habit of acting from themselves and of using their own judgment this is the vice of softness the result of the habit is a weakness and flaccidity of soul that will not take the least step or encounter the least difficulty without external help and guidance this defect of spiritual vigour stays all solid progress and causes an habitual timidity and uneasiness that is very injurious to the soul's health leaving the languor of an invalid yet these same persons who through this self-indulgence but too often fostered by injudicious treatment become utterly incapable of acting with decision in their internal affairs will often act with vigour judgment and decision in all the external duties of life some few souls are by nature and constitution scrupulous and perplexed and require frequent though judicious help 
but in the majority of cases this pusillanimous indulgence is a serious enfeeblement that can only be corrected by requiring the soft soul to rise to her responsibilities and stand on her own feet softness is a vice that in a foolish and disheartened spirit holds back from being generous through languor and weariness of soul arising from fear of the difficulties and long labours of generous virtue self-love cowardice and sloth have each their share in this ignominious vice imagination has also much to do with it bringing together into one point of time and so frightening the soul with what in fact is distributed over a long period each hour of which has its own help and grace as well as its own burden and thus overwhelming the mind with a delusion as if the whole burden of the future came on the present hour and the present help presumption is an excess arising from overestimating our own powers and from attempting in a conceited spirit things that are above and beyond us because god has not called us to them nor given us light and strength for them ambition is an inordinate appetite for exercising power over others and for being honoured by others vainglory is an inordinate appetite for praise fame and glory these are the puffings of an inflated soul preferring the show of things to solid good after this rapid review of the vices opposed to magnanimity or greatness of soul if we compare them with the solid goods of the soul we shall see at a glance that they are weak and ignoble deficiencies or else unworthy passions of the soul requiring only to be noted to be shunned as unworthy of the generous soul wherefore in the words of dante we will not stay to reason upon them but look and pass them by as a universal virtue magnanimity is the brave and generous element in all the virtues in so far as the soul aspires to great things st thomas has drawn the features of magnanimity and humility as they are special virtues and so distinguished from each other but he by no means excludes the one from the other for every christian virtue as he teaches has its foundation in humility and there cannot be great humility without magnanimity there is something he says that is great in man which he possesses from god and there is a defect in him that comes from the infirmity of his nature but magnanimity is that whereby a man makes himself worthy in great things in consideration of the gifts that he possesses from god thus if he have great vigour of soul magnanimity will direct that vigour to the perfect works of virtue and in like manner to the use of every good to the use of knowledge for example or of the external goods of fortune but humility will dispose a man to hold himself of little account because of his defects in like manner will the magnanimous man despise every great failing from the gifts of god in others because he cannot so much value those who do what is unworthy of them but the humble man honours others and accounts them superior in so far as he sees the gifts of god in them here christian magnanimity is shown to coincide with humility in despising that within us which is unworthy of the gifts of god great generosity gives to every virtue the quality of magnanimity because generosity proceeds from greatness of soul great in aiming to please god and to do him honour but generosity is not exercised in the imagination alone that is idle fancy nor in shortcoming resolutions and promises but in vigorous acts of the will and in doing what we undertake with a great spirit the other part of magnanimity is to trust ourselves freely to god's help in overcoming difficulties 
it is on this part that magnanimity belongs to fortitude which is a firmness of soul derived from resting on the strength of god that makes the soul of invincible firmness the fable of the giant who could not be conquered on his native earth but only when lifted above it may be taken as the figure of the soul which born of god cannot be overcome until separated from god this part of magnanimity is fortified by habits of endurance as we see in the saints and martyrs but when the adversary to be overcome is the domestic enemy the greatest strength is shown by flight because this pulls contrary to the attractions of nature the special virtue of magnanimity looks to honour for its object and to the doing of great acts that are accounted worthy of honour as also to the shunning of dishonour but as the christian religion is the conversion of man from the love of self and of the world to the love of god and from acting on worldly and selfish motives to acting on divine motives the magnanimity of the true christian seeks not the honour or the approval of man but the honour of god and his approval st thomas has therefore defined the special virtue of christian magnanimity to be a virtue that does great and generous works worthy of honour for the ends contemplated by christian virtue whilst unambitious of receiving human honours on their account and despising such honours when offered the reason assigned by st thomas for this contempt of human honours is the one obvious to a christian soul that there can be no proportion between the value of virtues exercised for god's sake and the human honours with which men would reward them when these virtues are honoured and rewarded by god himself to seek or to value human honours for what god himself is pleased to honour would not only be to divide the heart between god and the creature but to detract from that divine and eternal honour by accounting human honours of the least value in its presence as if a rushlight were of any value in the sunlight moreover the principle of the christian virtues is the grace of god with which we are only the cooperators and therefore their chief honour is due to god and not to us the mere natural man without faith or knowledge of himself will attach much greater value to human honours and will seek them with greater avidity than christian truth permits or than such honour deserves but what the true christian looks to above all is the glory of god and the eternal honours and dignities that god alone can give the magnificent objects presented to us in the light of faith are so infinitely superior to the things of this world that before the things of heaven these human honours and rewards shrink to nothing the lofty motives also that are given to the contemplation of the christian soul reduce all earthly motives to vanity the sense of god again always present with us and ever within us attracting and moving us to aspire to his glory ought to give us a great spirit in some degree however humble it may be yet in some degree worthy of the great things to which we are called but it is on the contempt of these lesser things which the world values so much that we rise in a spirit greater than the spirit of the world to those greater things above the world god alone is great and it is a great thing to be his servants and still more to be his children great is his love for us and greatly has he shown that love giving us his only beloved son for our redemption and his holy spirit for the sanctification of our hearts great is his power and great are his gifts who redeemeth thy life from destruction who crowneth thee with mercy and compassion 
it hath also pleased him to give us a kingdom that is far greater than the kingdom of this world who then can doubt but that the servants and friends the sons and daughters of the eternal king ought to have great souls who can hesitate to think or to say that they ought to be ready to do great things for his honour and glory god has taught us great things observes st gregory and has commanded us great things that after doing them he may give us great things even in this life he presents magnificent gifts to those who serve him in a generous spirit such as purity of heart divine consolation firmness under difficulties security in dying and the quick transit to heaven he is magnanimous who rudely mortifies his senses giving no more to the body than it needs that the spirit may hold command and be free and the soul filled with good things he is magnanimous who will not let his soul be ruffled by offensive words or violent deeds he is great-minded who has his chief conversation with the eternal truth and justice why should that truth be always near us and we commonly far away unless from our little-mindedness he is great-minded who keeps himself in the divine presence and is never long away from the sense of the eternal god god is always with us why should we not always be with god the great souls of all ages have walked with god not only the great ones of history but many of the poor and unknown who were wise in god though counted for ignorant in this world who were honoured by god though despised by the world soft and pusillanimous souls are too weak to walk steadfastly before god through the pilgrimage of life but the great-souled are subject from their inmost heart to god accounting that nothing can be greater for them than to be in the hands of god to be great-souled is to be full of faith of a faith that so lights up the eternal world to them that the mortal things of this world fade before their eyes like dying flowers the great souled are magnanimous in sacrificing the love of self to the love of god until all their strength flows into charity happy are they who are released from bondage to themselves that they may be large and free in the generous atmosphere of light and grace all that we require is that the soul be open and generous humility opens the soul charity makes her generous put yourself in plato's position to whom even the shadow of christianity was a blank take the position of that heathen philosopher at the moment when he declared to alcibiades that no one knows what to ask of god until a divine one come to teach him in such a state of mind one might naturally reason in this manner man is evidently in an unsatisfactory state though he dares not look closely into his soul yet he feels that he is not what he ought to be something has gone wrong with him one cannot say what it is but something very serious he longs to be what he should be at least the right-minded man does so but he does not know what he ought to be he therefore knows not what to ask of god for in his ignorance he may ask for what will make him worse instead of better it is evident we are on a wrong line and are going further away from the right line one has only to look into oneself to see that people are dying every day dying with the full consciousness of immortality yet not knowing what is to become of them if the god who made us would only come and tell us what we ought to be it is an audacious thought but who knows the power or the goodness or the condescension of god god is not proud as we are his thoughts are not like ours nor his ways like ours we are certainly his children despite our errors yet were he to come 
could we see or understand him he is the eternal spirit and we are wrapped up in mortal clay it is a stupendous thought but what if god were actually to come as he has so often been imagined in a mortal form and to live with us and to teach us what we are and what we ought to be it is an astounding supposition for mortal men to raise who know so little of god but we should then have with us a perfect man whom we could see to whom we could listen and who being god as well as man would tell us what we are and show us what we ought to be and what he would have us to be oh what an infinite relief would this be to us distracted mortals with our consciousness of immortality well this astounding fact has come to pass for nigh two thousand years the world has known the son of god in human nature the great event was prepared from the beginning of the world the rumour of its approach grew into expectation and he came yet when he came the world knew him not the world had its own great men sages and heroes of renown whose chief virtue was their magnanimity and the world expected that a perfect man would be a hero and a sage of its own type completing its own ideal of a perfectly magnanimous man as drawn by plato aristotle and cicero christ jesus was the perfect man in perfect union with god the model of manhood to all men most perfect in magnanimity as in all the virtues yet the world could not understand him so very different is the divine from the human view of magnanimity for the perfect man was wholly turned to god whilst the great man of the world was wholly turned to the affairs of this mortal life the perfect man was wholly subject to god whilst the great man of the world was chiefly ambitious of dominion over his fellow-men the perfect man denied himself the honours of the world and the gratification of himself whilst the great man of the world made its honours the chief end of his life and the gratification of his pride his main pursuit the perfect man was humble and his life hidden with god the great man of the world rises in the spirit of self-elation and self-reliance to subject to his rule the children of pride the perfect man did nothing of himself but looked in all that he said and did to the will and wisdom of god his father but the great man of the world stepped forth with unbounded confidence in himself and in his own wit and wisdom the perfect man looked above all to the perfect end of man and sought to draw all men to their perfect end but the great man of the world only sought a deathless fame among perishing mortals like himself the perfect man built upon eternity and his works are glorified eternally but the great man of the world built on himself and his work could not endure such is the contrast between the magnanimous man of the world and the magnanimous man of god that the first principles of the man of the world are completely reversed in the first principles of the man of god the one rests everything on himself uses everything for himself and draws everything to himself the other rests everything on god obtains everything from god and draws everything to god the difference between the interior states of these two men is so absolute as to establish a fundamental opposition in their thoughts their desires and their actions and to such an extent that st paul calls the one darkness and the other light to the converted heathens he says ye were darkness but now light in the lord ephesians chapter five verse eight in nothing is this fundamental difference more strikingly shown than in the different way in which the virtue of magnanimity is understood and exercised 
which entirely depends on the view taken of what constitutes true greatness of soul but as the true greatness of the soul is not in herself except in capacity but arises from the truth and the good which god communicates to her nature it is obvious that the heathen's notion of the soul's greatness as derived from herself and from her own native resources is utterly false and that it gives a false foundation to the virtue of magnanimity christ gives it its true foundation in resting it upon the humility of the man dependent in all things on the divine communications of god this foundation rests in the truth and justice of things and gives the soundness of justice to all that is built upon it it is impossible therefore to express these two kinds of magnanimity under one name without adding some specific terms of distinction to things so opposite in their nature and we must call the one heathen magnanimity and the other christian magnanimity for although some few catholic writers have gone so far as to maintain that the magnanimity of the heathen is the humility of the christian the question will not stand a moment's examination for the exposition of magnanimity by aristotle shows clearly that it rested on pride and self-sufficiency when the learned though eccentric ray notice urged the point in a dry dissertation by inserting the contrary arguments of lesius he unconsciously refuted himself the pagan celsus maintained that the christians had stolen their humility from plato but by his admiration of plato and his loathing of christian humility he contradicted his own statement cajetan the great commentator on st thomas declares that the notion of any identity between heathen magnanimity and christian humility is a new fantasy a novelty undiscovered by all past doctors to be exterminated from the precincts of the church and of moral philosophy although both heathen and christian magnanimity aim at making the soul great and that by seeking great things and despising little things there is an immeasurable distance between them which is still visible in the man of the world as compared with the servant of christ that distance will be discovered in the answer to the two questions what are the great things that make a man great souled and what are the little things that make a man little souled the things of this world are certainly little in comparison with god to be honoured by this world is little in comparison with being honoured by god time is little in comparison with eternity man himself is little in comparison with god the man therefore who prefers himself to god or the things of this world to the things of god or the interests of time to the interests of eternity or the being honoured by men to the being honoured by god is not great souled but little souled such a man is poor in his reason small in his aim and low in his aspirations for even reason teaches that we ought to be subject to god to do his will and not to estimate ourselves above what we are or anything beyond its true value when the heathen thought that he was all sufficient for himself he first deified himself for his pride led him to pantheism it is evident that the soul is not great in herself but only capable of greatness if the soul were great in herself she would have no occasion to seek for greatness and to seek it with much labour and contention but when men sought for greatness through human opinion and it failed them they could no longer endure themselves an evident proof that the greatness of the man was not in himself it is also evident that the soul is a middle good placed between superior and inferior good and capable of either the one or the other so that the soul becomes great by attaching herself to what is greater than she is and little 
by attaching herself to what is less than she is in the first case she rises to the virtues in the second she sinks to the vices the soul therefore becomes great good and elevated in proportion to the greatness goodness and elevation of the objects at which she aims and to which she attaches herself if she receives a great truth from god she is greater by all that truth if she receives a great gift of grace and virtue from god and works faithfully with the gift she is greater by all that gift if she has a great sense of god and that sense inspires her with a great love of god she is the greater by all that love which unites her with god by that love the soul aspires to the greatest of all things that can give her excellence she aspires to an eternal union with god and in thus seeking god with her whole mind and heart at whatever cost to herself the soul ascends to the sublimest act of christian magnanimity end of lecture ten part two lecture ten part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture ten on the magnanimous character of humility part three the soul is one and simple and the will that moves the soul is one and simple when therefore the will moves the soul with a sovereign movement of affection towards the supreme object of her existence she must of necessity move away at the same time from the less things beneath her and must even give up herself to what is greater than herself which is the greatest act of magnanimity our divine lord has taught us this grand truth in his sermon on the mount he says lay not up to yourselves treasures on earth where the rust and moth consume and thieves break in and steal but lay up to yourselves treasures in heaven where neither the rust nor moth consume and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where thy treasure is there is thy heart also st matthew chapter six verses nineteen through twenty one then he gives us a beautiful illustration of the conduct of the will from the conduct of the eye and of the intention of the will from the attention of the eye the light of thy body is thine eye if thine eye be single thy body will be in light but if thine eye be evil thy body will be in darkness if then the light that is in thee be darkness the darkness itself how great shall it be the eye of the will is compared with the eye of the body if the eye is in an evil condition the whole body is left in darkness and if the intention of the will be in an evil condition the whole soul is in disorder if the will looks to the real treasure of the soul the whole soul partakes of that treasure but if the attention of the will is taken up with inferior things the whole soul suffers deterioration those lesser things become the treasure of the heart instead of the greater things and through abiding in little things the soul becomes little our lord then applies this instruction no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will sustain the one and despise the other you cannot serve god and mammon the soul is no more her own object than the eye it is made for something else and to her object the soul is subject as the eye is subject to what it looks upon either the eye of intention is subject to god which makes her great souled or is subject to what is less than herself which makes her little souled to be subject to god is the magnanimity of humility and this brings her near to god 
which is a very great thing wherefore after further showing that it is the vice of the heathens to seek after those little things our lord concludes seek ye therefore the kingdom of god and his justice and all these things shall be added to you st matthew chapter six verses twenty two and thirty three and to show that whatever we attach ourselves to enters into the soul and makes it great or little good or evil he says elsewhere a good man out of a good treasure bringeth forth good things and an evil man out of an evil treasure bringeth forth evil things st matthew chapter twelve verse thirty five in this divine instruction we have the two sides of christian magnanimity presented to us the one on which the soul seeks the true honour and greatness in god and the other on which she renounces herself and whatever is less than herself for god whereby she contends against dishonour and refuses degradation as she aspires to god she is great by charity as she refuses to be attached to herself to any false idea of herself or to things less than herself she is great by humility st john chrysostom therefore asserts the principle and argues it through a discourse that he is magnanimous and sublime who is truly humble this virtue he says makes the soul healthy and elevated enables a man to do great things makes him sweet and gracious to all men and peaceful within himself whilst the arrogance of pride comes to a debased mind and an illiberal soul but whoever has the sense of moderation is not high-minded even in great things whilst the debased soul thinks in a high-minded way even of little things and makes much of them to reach sublimity from the ground of humility we must take the true measure of human things that we may be enkindled with the desire of divine things because we can be humble in no other way than by the love of divine things and the contempt of present things but as to face the true knowledge of oneself to pursue it thoroughly and to act upon that knowledge faithfully is the most difficult of all things demanding great courage and the great sacrifice of our natural inclinations it is undeniable that true humility demands great magnanimity and on this view of the virtue a distinguished spiritual writer has defined it in these terms humility is the courage which applies the truth to ourselves in its rigour and completeness and which carries it out into all its consequences the magnanimous character of humility is shown in its long and stubborn conflict with pride that most subtle secret tenacious and destructive evil to the soul the first evil to enter the soul and the last to be exterminated this is the greatest of all human difficulties only to be mastered by the most arduous efforts to overcome oneself and to accomplish the destruction of one's pride and self-love the first part of this difficulty is to know oneself a work demanding great courage and perseverance the second is to bring what is wrong in us to judgment and conviction the third is to execute justice and to apply reformatory punishment the last is to devote oneself to the reformation of the criminal but when this criminal is not another but one's very self this is a difficulty so great and so liable to recur that it demands a most magnanimous humility in a well-known literary work dr johnson gave a voice to this side of human nature that is terrible in its truth very few he writes can boast of hearts which they dare lay open to themselves and of which by whatever accident exposed they do not shun a distinct and continuous view and certainly what we hide from ourselves we do not show to a friend 
the natural man shrinks from entering into himself he has neither the light nor the courage to explore the weaknesses that he would there discover he is inclined rather to censure such self-introspection as a morbid disposition of mind confounding the morbid things discovered there with the eye that sees them there may unquestionably be a morbid habit of self-introspection when the mind is under the dominion of fancies and delusions but this is an abuse and not the legitimate use of self-knowledge that true knowledge of one's self on which humility is founded is the result of cooperation with the light and grace of god but to obtain this self-knowledge effectually and to rectify the evils discovered demands great courage and magnanimity especially if the evils that spring from self-love vanity and pride are to be vigorously pursued to their extermination for this cannot be accomplished by any powers of our own nor in a short period of time nor without arduous labours in conjunction with the light and grace of god for pride cannot correct pride nor vanity expel vanity nor self-love overcome self-love this can only be done by a brave and vigorous siding of the will with the light and help of god but the first difficulty is to see ourselves as god sees us which can only be done by taking the side of god against ourselves a routine examination of conscience is one thing and quite a shallow proceeding a vigorous effort to track our evil thoughts inclinations and acts to their origin in self-love sensuality or pride and to follow these down to their cause in our weak and changeable nature and our native nothingness is altogether another thing which brings us to the deep ground we have for being humble this will discover to us that all our weakness and defilement comes of separating from god the source of all strength and purity we then see how far we are on a false foundation and can only recover our true one through the most complete subjection to god but except in rare and miraculous conversions resulting from a great and sudden gift of humility from god this great transfer of the soul from self to god is not accomplished at once nor without long and persevering efforts of the will for after the grace of pardon and justification has been received many inclinations of nature must be sacrificed and this is only done at the cost of conflicts and through patience under humiliating failures not losing confidence in god because of them since it is not he but we who have failed and making a generous application of the means at our disposal before the great work is so far accomplished as to give habitual peace and security to the soul it is very difficult for a man to bring his spiritual eyes into the depths of his soul and to see the true springs of his actions this is the work of interior reflection and interior reflection is difficult to most people but god is a strong helper to good will yet those who go below the surface of the soul or the concrete acts recorded in their memory are not very numerous the plants shoot through the soil but their roots are invisible yet the quality of the roots determines the quality of what springs up from them so it is with the roots of evil until we get at them we can have but a shallow surface knowledge of ourselves and can deal only with the effects and not with the causes of evil of two souls that take account of themselves one sees but the facts that remain in the memory the other sees the secret movements towards evil in the deep region of the soul the last has self-knowledge the first but remembrance 
the magnanimous character of humility is also shown in the fortitude with which we persevere in holding ourselves down to that just and true position which belongs to us never advancing until god advances us and that in spite and contempt of every natural impulse to false elation or the assumption of a place or character that does not belong to us pride has a certain ferocity of self-assumption even in its more subtle ways and this is false and weak but humility is gentle just and sincere which are the attributes of power understand from this that nothing is strong out of its true place humility must also be brave and magnanimous in holding herself steadfast to her height above the opinions of the world for her true place is under god the world's thoughts are not his thoughts nor the world's ways his ways but far beneath them to suffer the soul to be touched or influenced by the vain opinions of the world is to expose her to deterioration the humble soul must therefore despise the levity of remark the offensive satire and the ironical flattery in which the thoughtless world is apt to indulge out of insolent pride against the ways of humility these however are but external trials that have no real influence over solid humility there is another danger that is internal and consequently far more serious and that is the fascinating influence of human respect which is apt to run kindness into compliance and fear of offence into compromise this gives occasion to many subtle falls from consistency but true magnanimity knows how to make the gentle sacrifice of human respect to the sincerity that belongs to humility and calm courage is the shield that protects this delicate virtue from the tremulous movements of human respect but we rise to the sublime heights of humility and hold to them with firmness and constancy when we adhere to god and abide in subjection to his sovereign dominion knowing that our good is from him and not from ourselves trusting in him that he will fully fulfil all his promises and humbly conversing with him in prayer as a child with a loving father it is a noble part of this magnanimity to follow in obedience every grace and inspiration that moves us to acts of generosity and invites us to self-sacrifice it is another part of magnanimity to receive all things from the hand of god and to use them only according to his will as abraham refused that any one but god should enrich him for this is the sublime way of humility that a man be poor in himself and rich in god we will conclude this lecture with a solid instruction drawn from a rare book that is seldom met with the mightiest shield against our adversaries is humility st john climacus calls it the tower of strength against our enemies to be effective it must have certain conditions first it must not be mean or pusillanimous but high and magnanimous the humble man must distrust himself altogether and wholly trust in god he must enter into the powers of the lord and partake of his fortitude and constancy then he will not only resist sin and temptation but will become in a certain way unconquerable by sin st john affirms this whosoever abideth in christ sinneth not and whosoever is born of god committeth not sin one john chapter three verses six through nine and st paul exhorts us let no temptation take hold of you but such as is human and god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able that is beyond what you are able to resist one corinthians chapter ten verse thirteen 
the holy spirit counsels us to unite this magnanimous humility in a firm adhesion with the love of god as a security against all temptation son when thou comest to the service of god stand in justice and fear and prepare thy soul for temptation humble thy heart and endure wait on god with patience join thyself to god and endure that thy life may be increased in the latter end ecclesiasticus chapter two verses one through three separate thyself from thyself by humility join thyself to god in the bond of charity bound in this chain of charity st paul was certain that nothing whatever could separate him from the love of god neither tribulation nor anguish neither height nor depth neither things present nor things to come humility must also be magnanimous in despising the temptations of evil spirits and in making little of them they are fallen creatures overpowered by christ through his death he suffered them to tempt him and then overcame them in himself that as st peter chrysologus says having been once conquered by christ they might give place to every christian who invokes the name of christ against them and that as st jerome says christ might hand them over to his disciples to be trodden on which in fact his apostle exhorts us to do be wise in good and simple in evil and the god of peace crush satan speedily under your feet romans chapter sixteen verses nineteen and twenty let magnanimity then be the just condition of your humility for this is a holy combination magnanimous humility humble magnanimity as much as to say humility and charity these are the two wheels of the sacred chariot on which you ascend to god charity carries you up humility keeps you safe from falling the third condition of humility is to mortify the passions this wrenches them out of the power of the adversary and turns them into instruments of good the fourth condition of humility is to be grateful for all blessings received for as the fathers say true humility is not blind but enlightened to know and acknowledge the gifts received from god to give their honour to the divine majesty and to be grateful but it is a very great benefit to conquer temptations because this comes of the effective grace of god the fifth condition of humility is for the soul to keep herself in a lowly state through self-knowledge that she may justly ascribe the glory of victory over her enemy to god and may attach nothing of it to herself this is the perfect humility that not only protects the soul from evil and makes her safe under temptation but which conquers in every hand-to-hand -hand conflict with the enemy humility then is magnanimous in courage and ardent in charity is mortified in the passions and grateful for blessings is elevated in the light of divine truth and lowly in self-knowledge this armory with its five weapons of perfect humility was possessed by the blessed virgin mary who celebrates its power in her sublime canticle it made her mighty against the powers of evil and sinless End of Lecture 10, Part 3lecture eleven part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture eleven on the detestable vice of pride part one the beginning of the pride of man is to fall off from god because his heart is departed from him that made him for pride is the beginning of all sin he that holdeth it shall be filled with maledictions 
and it shall ruin him in the end ecclesiasticus chapter ten verses fourteen and fifteen as pride is the root of all evil the vice of vices and destruction of the virtues it is the chief enemy of god and of man the right order of every being is its perfection order gives to each being its virtue justness and strength its beauty harmony and value virtue is the moral order that perfects free and intelligent beings destruction is that which breaks up the just order of things and brings it to ruin but what breaks up the just order and destroys the virtues of the soul is pride hence the scripture says that pride goeth before destruction and the spirit is lifted up before a fall proverbs chapter sixteen verse eighteen we have already shown from many points of view that humility is the fundamental law of the rational creature that it holds him in his just and true position that it establishes him in his due relations of dependence on his creator that it founds him on god as his solid firmament that it settles him in just order within himself and that it places him on his due bearings towards his fellow-men but pride contradicts the whole reason of humility and is the most irrational as well as the most destructive of vices it is the most irrational because it is opposed to the whole light of reason whether human or divine for that light springs from the order of truth and justice and pride destroys the order of truth and justice in the rational creature of whom it takes hold the pride of the creature reverses not only the foundation of his nature but of his creation it is not only irrational therefore as all sins are but it is an uncreaturely sin which other sins are not except as they contain in them the malignant venom of pride but he who sins from great pride virtually disowns his creation as the heathens did altogether for he affects to be something great and independent of god beyond his state and measure of a creature lucifer aspired to be like the most high in power and adam in knowledge and all pride has something of this enough to show its descent the proud man does not behave like one whom god has recently created from nothing and whom he may summon to his presence at any hour he acts as though he were not dependent on god and as if what he is and has were not altogether owing to the divine will and bounty he turns from god with the insolence of an upstart forgetting his mean origin and who made him what he is and endeavors to establish himself in opposition to his creator he will not have his dominion however benignant he will not have his law however just he will not have his wisdom however divine he will not have his will however much directed to his good he will not have his good although the great good for which he was created for pride is the love of one's own excellence independently of god and when a man trusts to himself and to his self-sufficiency when he commits himself to his own independent resources he separates from god and the more he separates himself the greater is his pride the vice of pride springs up as st augustine observes when a man trusts above all to himself and makes himself the head and principle of life in thus acting he withdraws himself from the fountain of life at which alone he can drink of that justice which is life and he equally withdraws himself from that unchangeable light by partaking of which the rational soul is in a certain way enkindled so as to become herself a created light by this impiety he ascribes to himself what belongs to god and is driven into his own darkness made by his iniquity 
if the proud man so far forgets himself and the law of his being as to behave as though he were a god rather than a creature how much more unreasonable and absurd will his behavior appear from the fact that he is a fallen creature whose fall from truth and justice has come of the pride that has already brought him to ruin if pride is utterly disgraceful in the creature it is absolutely shameful in the sinner whose degraded condition ought rather to be clothed with humility than with the fig leaves of vanity this vice in short is so thoroughly opposed to the nature and condition of man as well as to the rights and claims of god and is so destructive of all spiritual good that god has proclaimed to us this warning in his scripture pride was not made for men ecclesiasticus chapter ten verse twenty two in its general character pride is defined to be an inordinate appetite for one's own greatness but an account of its generation in the soul will much better help our understanding of it than a definition to do this effectually we must take a large scope what is not made for itself but to receive something better is a very imperfect creature until it has received the nobler existence for which it is made a garden made to receive flowers and fruits is not worth the name so long as it grows nothing but weeds a house is made for man and is desolate without his presence our body is made for the habitation of our soul and without the soul it is but corruption the soul is made for the living god whose light and grace prepare her for his inhabitation in the very centre of our soul is an instinct that urges us to seek after the supreme good for which the soul is made and st thomas notes the terrible truth that even the lost are not without the sense of that higher good on which our good is founded or they would not have remorse for having neglected it a soul then without the spirit of god is an existence without its object a mere failure from the reason of its existence like a house that is never inhabited or a body that is never animated yet with this grievous difference that the soul without god is conscious of misery and of being herself the cause of her desolation if she is not so conscious it is because of a blindness and insensibility which is the bitter penalty of her sins as a moral or intellectual being again is only perfect as far as the will acts according to the perfection of order and as the rule of that order is founded in the light of that justice which proceeds from god as the eternal justice the soul can only be perfected according to the completeness of her conformity with the eternal law of justice that god reveals in her as that again which is the living image of another can only be perfect in so far as it has the life of that other even so only can the soul be perfected as the very constitution of her nature is an image of god in so far as she possesses the life of god in one word the greatness of the soul is her capacity for god and therefore the degree of her union with god is the real measure of her perfection but the essential condition of each degree of this union is that the creature who receives the blessing be subject to the supreme giver of the blessing for by no strength of our own by no effort made by our mere nature to rise can we ever ascend to union with god who is infinitely above every creature he has made and therefore as st augustine so frequently remarks for a creature to ascend nearer to god means the same thing as to be more subject to him and it is through that subjection that we ascend beneath his divine majesty and receive the heavenly influences descending into us 
if then it be the truth of all truths for us that we are made for god who alone can perfect our nature by adding what is divine to it what is it that separates us from god what keeps away from us his gifts by which he desires to perfect us what again is the effect upon us of this separation from god it is of the last importance that we should clearly understand this subject and that we should give it all that patient attention which ensures intelligence it is pride that separates the soul from god the setting up of the soul upon herself the rivalry with god in his own domain of independence the practical assertion of our own sufficiency independently of god the other vices are the stimulants of pride the instruments of pride and the servants of pride but pride itself is the element of revolt and independence in all the vices pride is therefore not only a special but a universal vice it precedes all other sin generates all other sin and is the malignant virus in all sin the holy scripture says that pride comes before a fall that pride is the beginning of all sin and that pride is the root of all sin pride not only precedes the other vices in time but is the cause and principle of evil sin is an aversion from god and a conversion to the creature accepted as a good in place of god against all reason and justice and pride is the aversion from god in all sin it is the revolt from subjection to him the arrogance that claims to act in independence of his law and arrogates to be what he is as though one were a god to oneself assigning to oneself the gifts received from god and using them against the rights of god hence the divine wisdom says through ecclesiasticus the beginning of the pride of man is to fall off from god because his heart is departed from him that made him ecclesiasticus chapter ten verses fourteen and fifteen pride begins then by a fall from god into ourselves and continues through that elation by which we swell ourselves into something greater and higher than what in truth we are how is this brought about through self-love for inordinate self-love is the cause of pride here we must explain what inordinate self-love is and how it generates pride but to do this satisfactorily we must first state in what the true love of ourselves consists st augustine asks this question in his book on christian doctrine and he answers that the just love of ourselves consists not in any enjoyment of ourselves as originating from ourselves but in receiving enjoyment from god who is our good when we are enjoined to love our neighbor as ourselves it is in god and for god that we are to love him this then is the order so fruitful in felicity in which we are to love ourselves the love of god is dominant in all true love even in the love of what is inferior to god this is that charity towards our soul and towards other souls and towards all god's creatures which is priceless pure and animated by a divine principle and so we love not alone not even ourselves but the holy spirit by his grace loves also with our love for charity is not of one but of two of god and of ourselves this love of ourselves is the spiritual ground in which is planted the grace and virtue of divine hope and as our soul is not her own good but the recipient of that good for which we hope and pray it is evident that the true love of our soul cannot be separated from the love of god which is the good and salvation of our soul 
when we reflect on this and on what we have been and on what we now are and on what this charity makes us to be there can be nothing so beautiful nothing so strong nothing so wonderful as this charity of god in a soul that is subject to him what the soul loves in herself is her happiness but this happiness she finds not in herself but in the union of her spirit with the good that is unchangeable and therefore as st augustine remarks in a celebrated sentence that man is the truest lover of himself who devotes his whole life to gaining hold of the unchangeable life and cleaves to god with every affection of his soul he turns not his desires to himself but to him in whom all desires find their contentment and their end but if we only love ourselves truly as far as we direct our love to god our neighbor ought not to be discontented if our love of him repose more on god than on himself such a love ought even to give him greater content because it is that love of charity which is not mere human love but a love that the holy spirit prompts and inspires inordinate self-love excludes the love of god and makes oneself the first and chief object of affection and as we have nothing of our own that is worthy of this devotion by a habitual delusion and self-deception practiced through the imagination the self-love of the soul appropriates many things to herself that do not belong to her which though they may be true in their right place and with their right owner are not true in the soul that lays claim to them does any man doubt asks lord bacon that if there were taken out of men's minds vain opinions flattering hopes false valuations imaginations as one would and the like but it would leave the minds of a number of men poor shrunken things full of melancholy indisposition and unpleasing to themselves the light of truth which god makes to shine into the soul she will make her own light the rules of justice that she sees in her mind she will make her own justice the good things and beautiful qualities that she has anywhere seen or fancied she will make her own qualities into all that self-love thus gathers in fancy to herself she will put her own feelings and affections and though there is nothing solid in them to build her into being nothing but fiction and imagination nothing but the amorous affection with which she embraces these shadows in place of substance all this affection swells the soul with conceit of herself and of her assumed superiority thus looking to a self that is not real but imaginary and flattered by the fiction the true self with all its poverty want and weakness is lost sight of and the more this self-love is indulged the more is the soul blinded to her real condition and to the sense of her real good this self-love is not only fed by unjust appropriations that make her thoroughly dishonest as well as deluded it is also fed by grosser and baser elements by the animal senses and the appetites that move in them by temptations from the evil one and by many external acts and things from which self-love borrows flattery thus that consciousness of ourselves that is given to establish our individual nature and personality and for the sense of responsibility so that through our consciousness of our great wants and our appetite for what is better than we are we might move from ourselves to seek our true good in our true centre is turned by an enormous abuse of our faculties and free will into a disposition to make ourselves our centre and the centre and end of many things which like ourselves have their true centre and end in god thus inflated and inflamed by self-love 
and by the things that feed self-love this inflammation bursts into pride into the inordinate estimation and love of our own excellence that aspires in its blind folly to a false freedom and swells against the law and will of god against dependence on him against the authority he has constituted and in its excess even against god himself ignoring him and setting up this poor needy blinded creature as a god in his place the beginning of the pride of man is to fall off from god because his heart is departed from him that made him such was the fall of satan who was spiritually inflated with himself such was the fall of adam who was both spiritually and sensually inflated with himself the result of this virulent inflammation is blindness in the mind disorder in the faculties internal confusion and the loss of the divine gifts for god resists the proud and knoweth the proud afar off he can allow of no arrogant rivalry in a creature that depends on him for everything of no turning of his gifts against himself without leaving that creature to the desolateness of his disordered nature charity loves all good and through the love of the supreme good unites with all good pride separates from all good by separating from the supreme good hugo of st victor has explained this very clearly these are his words as all good is derived from the supreme good the good we have exists less in the soul than in god from whom the soul derives that good but he who seeks his delight in some detached part of what is good as if it were exterior to and independent of the supreme good whilst he perversely strives to separate that part from the whole for the sake of making it his own exclusive possession he incurs the loss of all the proud will that in the perverse affection of appropriating what she can to herself would cut off the part communicated to herself from the whole supreme good that is so infinitely beyond her reach destroys its life and beauty like separating a faculty from the mind a limb from the body a ray of light from the sun or a streamlet from the fountain the part dries up ceases to shine or expires or more truly in this case the gift of god is withdrawn and its former influence dies out by degrees if not all at once amort has very accurately defined pride as an inordinate appreciation and false estimate of our own excellence it is an excess above and beyond the measure of what we are against all truth and justice it is more than an appetite for perverse exaltation as st augustine observes it is a perverse imitation of god the proud man not only claims an excellence he does not possess but he dislikes the dominion of god and hates equality with other men loving to assert his own dominion over them in place of god's dominion pride therefore is equally opposed to humility and to magnanimity to humility in refusing subjection to god and to magnanimity in aiming at great things in a false and disorderly way notwithstanding its brave show pride is really pusillanimous and especially so in spiritual things because it is hollow within having no spiritual support whilst the humble are brave because they have the inward support of grace and justice the proud can swell but not endure they have a fear of spiritual power and from their very hollowness and imaginativeness are easily intimidated pride not only refuses subjection to god but turns from god and is adverse to god whilst claiming an excellence that belongs to god alone 
and a primal dominion over his creatures that essentially belongs to god we see then how pride is a perverse imitation of god it is therefore that delicto maximum that sin of sins that dereliction or forsaking of god from which david prayed to be free who he asks can understand sins from my secret ones cleanse me o lord and from those of others spare thy servant if they shall have no dominion over me then shall i be without spot and i shall be cleansed from the greatest sin psalm eighteen verses thirteen and fourteen this delictum maximum this greatest sin is the pride that constitutes the malice of every sin the first to enter the soul the last to leave the soul linked in the secret depths of the soul with the fuel of all sin so that when the soul is completely cleansed from this greatest sin she is immaculate because the whole malice of sin is in pride what makes pride the greatest sin is not the conversion to evil of the will created good but the aversion of the will from god this st thomas has explained in the following terms in other sins a man turns from god through ignorance or weakness or the desire of some other good but pride has an aversion to god from unwillingness to be subject to him or to his rule as boethius says all vices fly from god but pride alone rises in opposition to god for this reason god resists the proud that aversion to god which is but a consequence in other sins belongs to pride as its first principle and this makes its acts a contempt of god st ambrose expresses the same truth in more vivid terms on the words of the psalm the proud man did iniquity altogether he says man's greatest sin is pride and from this as from its origin all sin has flowed with this weapon the devil struck and wounded us for had man never listened to the serpent's persuasion and wished to be as god the inheritance of this deadly guilt had never been transmitted to us why do i limit the case to man the devil also lost the grace of his nature through pride when he said i will set my throne above the clouds i will be like to the most high then fell he from the fellowship of the angels and after condemnation to the punishment due to his crime he sought to make man a partaker with him and to transfuse into him the fellowship of his offence what can be worse than the sin that begins with insulting god for this reason the scripture says that god repels the proud he repels the contumely against him he takes up his special war against the proud as though he said this is my adversary this sin is aimed at me this is my cause end of lecture eleven part one lecture eleven part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture eleven on the detestable vice of pride part two the antagonism of pride to god is expressed with a terrible power in the book of job and its consequences depicted with a fearful truth the wicked man is proud all his days and the number of the years of his tyranny is uncertain the sound of dread is always in his ears and when there is peace he always expecteth treason tribulation shall terrify him and distress shall surround him as a king that is prepared for the battle for he hath stretched forth his hand against god and he hath strengthened himself against the almighty he hath run against him with his neck raised up and is armed with a fat neck he shall not depart out of darkness 
the flame shall dry up his branches and he shall be taken away by the breath of his own mouth being vainly deceived by error he shall not believe that he may be redeemed at any price job chapter fifteen verses twenty through thirty one st augustine points out how even light sins may become grievous by the addition of pride even upon those he says who watch and are solicitous not to sin certain sins of human frailty will creep in and though small and few they are sins nevertheless but if pride gives its weight and increase to them they become great and grievous still let devout humility put an end to them and they are easily cleansed by our high priest in heaven pride is not only the greatest but the most blinding of sins it puts the soul in an utterly false position with respect to herself and consequently with respect to everything else and she therefore sees nothing in its true light so that whatever affects the soul is seen reversely from the divine point of view which is the only true one as the soul is turned from god the man is involved in his own shadow and resting mostly on that shadow loses from view the serene light of truth as again the will infected by pride acts upon the fictions of the imagination rather than on the understanding of truth the soul is immersed in error who has not experienced this when inflated with pride against his fellow-man and even against his friend when the heat of anger swells his heart with pride against him he imagines all kinds of evil and malice in him and can see nothing that is good but when he returns to sobriety he is astonished to find that he has been the dupe of such a mass of error as pride closes the soul upon herself in a greater or lesser degree proportioned to its intensity and isolates the mind from what is better she looks not to god but to herself for the standard of truth and justice and the mental eye plunges into the obscurity and disorder arising from the troubled shadows of her own confused and darkened nature st paul has portrayed this condition of soul in describing the pride of the heretical man he consents not to the sound words of our lord jesus christ and to that doctrine which is according to godliness he is proud knowing nothing but sick about questions and strife of words from which arise envies contentions blasphemies evil suspicions conflicts of men corrupted in mind and who are destitute of the truth one timothy chapter seven verses three through five pride is not only the blinding but the destructive sin it is not only the venom of the vices but the destruction of the virtues corrupting with its putridity whatever it touches it is both the head and the foot of sin as the venom is in the head of the serpent pride inspired by the devil is the head of the body of sin but when conceived by man it is the foot of that infamous body treading on inferiors spurning equals and aiming at bringing down superiors david therefore prayed let not the foot of pride come near me every other vice is devoted to some one evil work but pride moves in them all to make them malignant and even besets our good works to bring them to ruin vain says st ephraim is every exercise of piety vain is all patience vain all obedience vain is voluntary poverty vain is every kind of discipline however you multiply its pressure if you be destitute of humility for exactly as humility is the beginning and end of all that is good so pride the beginning and end of all that is evil crafty and cunning is this evil spirit and takes many shapes to obtain dominion over men casting nets on every path in which they move the wise man is caught by his wisdom 
the strong man by his strength the wealthy by his wealth and the beautiful one by her beauty the eloquent one is entrapped by his speech the fine-voiced singer by his sonorous notes the expert workman by his skill and even the beggar by the claims of his poverty in like manner this spirit tempts the spiritual him who has renounced the world by his renunciation him who is temperate and continent by these virtues him who lives in silence by his quiet and solitude him who cultivates poverty by his poverty him who is studious by his facility in learning him who is quick of apprehension by his quickness the religious man by his religious profession and the erudite by his erudition and yet real knowledge and true science are only to be found in conjunction with humility thus doth satan labor to sow his cockle in every field our lord therefore who knows how hard it is to conquer this passion when once it has root in us and how completely useless it makes us despite of all our exertions has given us humility for a banner and a trophy saying when you shall have done all these things that are commanded you say we are unprofitable servants we have done that which we ought to do st luke chapter seventeen verse ten and why should we bring lightness and folly upon us when the apostle admonishes us if any man think himself to be something whereas he is nothing he deceiveth himself galatians chapter six verse three as the most deadly and destructive of diseases pride often demands the most desperate remedies as the healing art inflicts deep wounds or takes off limbs to save the body or administers deadly poisons as a last resource to recover life so when we are unwilling ourselves to apply the severe remedies required the divine healer of souls will sometimes permit one to fall into some shameful sin that through its great humiliation the soul may be recovered from her pride we need not quote st augustine st isidore or st thomas on this point since the doctrine and experience of this runs through the scriptures and the psalmist as well as the prophets invoke shameful things upon the proud that they may be humbled and so restored to health and reason but we will give one brief passage from st gregory the man who exalts himself for his virtue returns to humility through vice as the surgeon makes wounds to heal god also makes a remedy of wounds that when stricken with pride through virtue we may be healed through vice we fly from humility but after a fall we cleave to it for safety a special characteristic of pride is its utter injustice the proud man is almost always the least entitled to be so a man solidly just casts a veil of modesty over his acts which adorn them whilst designed to conceal them and which instead of effacing their lustre but tempers their brilliancy so as not to wound the sensitive eyes of envy whereas the arrogant is commonly a vicious man he exacts respect because he fears that it will not be voluntarily rendered he wishes to conquer the homage which he suspects he does not merit he sees not that he is only assuming one vice more which renders all the rest conspicuous note the man who boasts of some quality you may be almost certain he has the opposite defect for boasting has almost always for its end the imposing on one's self or on others pride is a vice of incredible veracity it feeds not only on all evil but on all good things turning all on which it feeds to putridity other vices observe st gregory attack but the virtues that destroy them anger attacks patience gluttony assails temperance and lust destroys continency 
but pride is not content with the destruction of one virtue it rises against all the members of the soul and as a universal pestilence corrupts the whole body of virtue it bursts upon the mind like a tyrant into a city that he has besieged and drags the wealthiest captives into the hardest slavery for the greater the abundance of virtue if it be without humility the wider will the dominion of pride range over it every other vice remarks st augustine is exercised in evil works to do them but pride is exercised in good works to destroy them following st gregory st thomas enumerates four species of pride the first is when a man ascribes to himself what he has received from god whether of spiritual or corporal good whether in the natural order of providence or in the supernatural order of grace the second is when though the man acknowledges that what he has he has received from god yet he ascribes his gifts to his own merits or so speaks and conducts himself as to lead others to think so the third is when a man arrogates some good to himself that he does not possess or when he endeavors to establish in other persons the opinion that he has this good the fourth is when with a contempt for the less gifted the man affects to have a higher degree of some excellence of which he has but a lower degree whether he claims this excellence in knowledge virtue or skill in the gifts of nature of grace or of fortune there is a fifth species of pride which though it commonly unites with those enumerated is yet a species by itself and that is the pride of ingratitude for to the proud mind gratitude is a badge of dependence it is the open admission that we are indebted for our good to another but this is inconsistent with any original claims to that good or with the notion of its being due to one's merits the proud man therefore would efface all traces of what has passed between the giver and receiver and would cover them with oblivion but the humble are grateful and confess from whom they receive their gifts owing to the many vices which pride animates it presents many faces and as some of these vices are in opposition to each other it will sometimes seem to act in contradiction with itself yet apart from the modification which it undergoes from its union with other vices this may be given as a portrait of its general features the central point of the proud man's character is an intense consciousness of self with comparatively little sense or consideration for what contributes but little or nothing to his self-love yet he reflects his self-love in many things and finds it crossed and interfered with in many more for there is nothing so sensitive or so sore when touched as pride it is as tender as a wound to spiritual things the proud man is short-sighted less from defect of organ than of light from which he is turned by his false position pride makes a man envious and jealous peevish and passionate contentious and disputatious easily provoked he is hard to reconcile especially where his self-esteem is touched for he is suspicious of the kindliest advances fancying them a design to win his submission he has a large appetite for flattery but a queasy stomach for friendly advice which he regards as dictation he is rude and ungenial self-opinionated and meddling ambitious and aspiring as he has no faults or does not see them which appears to him the same his troubles arise from the ill-judged conduct of other persons and especially of his friends he is keen however in citing another's faults or in imagining them where they do not appear he is troublesome and ungovernable resolute against reason 
and stiff against wise counsel contemptuous to his inferiors he is critical to his betters and disobedient to his superiors unfit to govern he is unwilling to be governed with all his show and pretension he is hollow within with all his outward bravery the moral courage inside of him is low and although artificial manners may cloak much that is here described they take nothing of it away from the inclinations of the heart all that we have said goes to show that pride is not only a special vice but a universal vice not only the root of the vices but the malicious element within the vices with the help of st thomas we will explain this further as it is the appetite and affection for our own excellence pride is a special vice having this false excellence for its specific object but as it is a rebellion against god refusing subjection to his law and submission to his will pride is a universal vice to be found in all the vices every appetite of our nature has some good for its lawful object and that good is so far good as it has some kind of resemblance to god nearer or more remote we have an appetite for truth for example but truth has a near resemblance to god we have also an appetite for the things of this world but they have so remote a resemblance to god as to be only a trace of resemblance but everything is excellent in that degree in which it resembles god every virtue is the right and lawful use of some appetite whilst each vice is the unlawful use or abuse of these appetites the rule for the right use of our appetites is the law of god in the light of reason or the light of faith and this rule directs our appetites in their due measure to the good which is their object when our appetite obeys the rule of reason it is good when it goes to an excess beyond the rule of reason the appetite becomes vicious and leads to evil but the fundamental appetite of the soul is for excellence because what is excellent perfects the soul when we exercise this appetite for excellence according to the divine illumination of faith and of the law of virtue it tends to the true greatness of the soul and therefore belongs to magnanimity st paul explains this to the corinthians we will not glory beyond our measure but according to the measure of the rule which god hath measured to us two corinthians chapter ten verse thirteen to exceed this measure in our appetite as we do in seeking for excellence where it is not to be found that is in ourselves and not in god is pride for which reason st augustine defines pride to be the appetite for perverse loftiness pride then is a universal vice in two ways by its diffusion through the other vices and by its effects in them for as god is the final object of the soul and charity brings us to god as our final object when the love of god enters into the other virtues and animates them it brings those virtues to god as their final end for whatever we rightly love is subject to the love of god so in the opposite direction the final end of the love of oneself takes us away from the love of god and sets us upon our own excellence and thus everything that we love inordinately in any vice has the love of oneself and of one's own excellence for its final end thus as the love of god infuses its life and rules through all the virtues pride infuses its malice and rules through all the vices it is for this reason that pride is called the root of all the vices and by its diffusion it corrupts all the powers of the soul and not only gives its venom to the vices but destroys the virtues as sin is committed from some special affection 
that disorderly affection gives to the sin its special character but that same sin may also produce certain effects upon the general conditions of the soul and this makes it a universal sin such in a most singular way is pride which has an effect upon the entire condition of the soul upon all her faculties powers and actions that makes it a universal vice beyond every other every sin is a sin of pride by affection though not the special sin of pride for some are only committed from ignorance or from weakness or from passion but the malice that is in every sin is in the revolt against god against his law or will and this is the effect of pride for this reason pride is hateful to god above all other sins because it is an aversion of the soul from god whilst cupidity is the turning to the creature in preference to god there are therefore two elements in every sin the turning from god the unchangeable good which is pride and the turning to the changeable creature in preference which is cupidity the intensity of pride is measured by the distance to which a soul departs from god a distance not of space but of unlikeness for as we approach to god through the good love of him we depart from god through the evil love of ourselves the nearer we approach to god the more fully we are enlightened by him the further we depart from god the more darkness we encounter in ourselves the psalmist therefore says come ye to him and be enlightened and your faces shall not be confounded psalm thirty three verse six but of those who have gone far from god the book of wisdom says these things they thought and were deceived for their own malice blinded them and they knew not the secrets of god nor hoped for the wages of justice nor esteemed the honour of holy souls wisdom chapter two verses twenty one and twenty two the first departure from god is when one begins to lose one's gratitude and to neglect the worship of god the second and further departure is when one begins to neglect the voice of god in the conscience the third is when one begins to love the creature rather than the creator although not yet going so far as to abuse the creature when for example there is a disposition to neglect any commandment of god rather than suffer some considerable inconvenience or lose some considerable advantage of a temporary kind such a one will do no visible wrong so as to give scandal but his intention is relaxed and the conscience is accommodated to circumstances the fourth degree of departure from god is when the interior is neglected and the sense of the presence of god almost lost whilst the man gives himself more ardently to the creature his inward light grows dull and his recollection is lost in dissipation his affections turn upon himself and on what belongs to him and break out in concupiscence the curiosity of the eye awakens evil appetites these awaken the passions and the pride of life springs into action as the sense of god becomes lost by neglect the sense of self under the stimulation of cupidity passes into its place self-esteem swells into elation and the man begins to fancy himself the author of the good that god has given him for his heart is departed from him that made him the fifth degree of departure from god is when the proud man abandons the unchangeable good to give himself wholly to changeable things his pride has perverted his spiritual appetite and he has lost the taste for divine things he then begins to abuse the creature of god both in himself and in others for pride is not only blind but destructive and not only destructive but cruel 
hardening the heart as nothing else can do turn to sensual tastes as well by passion as by the love of self-elation the proud soul plunges her spirit into shameful and degrading vice the horse-leech hath two daughters that say bring bring proverbs chapter thirty verse fifteen these two daughters of all devouring pride are sensuality and concupiscence the body is not sated with sensuality when pride has sunk the soul from the better things nor the heart with evil desire the sixth degree of departure from god is when a man not only delights but glories in crime and sins because he is proud of his license he takes his license for liberty and his licentious abuse of the creature for the superiority of dominion the devil was first proud of his nature although it was the work of god and then he was proud of his crime because it was his own work they fall into the depth of degradation whose sin of deliberate malice and find a gloomy satisfaction in their malicious actions who leave the right way as the proverb says and walk by dark ways who are glad when they have done evil and rejoice in most wicked things whose ways are perverse and their steps infamous proverbs chapter two verses thirteen and fifteen and of whom solomon says again the wicked man when he cometh into the depth of sin contemneth proverbs chapter eighteen verse three elated with the pride of his sins he despises god and wrapped in the false sense of security he makes light of the enormity of his crimes being blind to their punishment the seventh degree of departure from god is when through a long and studious pursuit of evil in mind and conduct the soul is darkened into oblivion of god and of all that belongs to the salvation of the soul here pride swells into a loathing of the law of god and of the truths of faith and of all authority derived from god of this state the apostle says there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and will turn away their hearing from the truth but will be turned to fables to timothy chapter four verse three the eighth degree of departure from god is into utter darkness when a man becomes so absorbed in self-consciousness and so exalted in self-love as to lose sight of his creation and of all dependence on his creator even to the mania of self-idolization and the making of himself an element of divinity and consequently the source of all he is or has for as pride runs its course of apostasy from god this is its final end after denying god it comes to the denial of man and the substitution of a human god in his place this is maniacal pride the ninth degree of departure from god and of progress in pride is when not content with his own perdition a man seeks to propagate the evil that is in him and to spread his own corruption far and wide even to this the world of our day has come for fiery zealots are on their destructive mission against god and his christ and against the faith and purity of souls men and even women unite the fierceness with the satanic cunning of pride in evil communication and the corrupting of life like the demons they find their pleasure in diffusing corruption that they may have companions in evil and subjects to its power as it reigns in themselves but from all such evils may humility guard us and jesus christ protect us end of lecture eleven part two
lecture eleven part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture eleven on the detestable vice of pride part three let those who are justly shocked with these last degrees of pride make use of them to understand what is hidden in the first degrees for even the beginning of pride contains the germs and seeds of these portentous growths all pride has the same general character and as the wisdom of god warns us in the scripture the beginning of the pride of man is to fall off from god there is some falling off from god in all pride though that falling off may not be consummated yet nothing grows faster than pride when indulged without opposition or restraint how this pride develops from the first instincts of its appetite to its riper monstrosities has been fearfully portrayed by father gratry in his book on logic from the instinct of his pride man proposes to act think and live in no other way than god himself lives he begins his thinking from the little he is and has and knows beyond him exists the great source of all being truth and life but in his self-sufficiency he refuses to be more to have more to receive more to learn more or to know more than he actually does know or has received he will not believe beyond himself see beyond himself or seek beyond himself he would derive all things from himself as god derives all things from himself he takes the posture of one who is always giving not the posture of one who is always receiving from what little he has by sense and by sight he generalizes the laws of the visible universe and dictates laws to god from the small glimmer of light in his intellect he constructs god and the whole order of truth and the whole order of justice if he were a spider he would make the universe a great spider's web and to him god would be as a great spider if he were a bee he would make god out to be a great bee gathering honey from a world of flowers and constructing waxen cells as he is a man he makes of god a being of human faculties with the qualities and limitations of humanity if a sensuous man he will make god sensuous is he prone to abstract speculations he will make god out to be a great abstraction is he a sentimental man god shall also be a sentiment but as a man is not god he ought before all to search after life and come nigh to life before he attempts to explain the mystery of life but to quote another thoughtful writer rather than humble himself to the truth or sanction what his own mind has not created the intensely proud man prefers inventing all sorts of chimeras for he would rather be a creator than accept what god has created yet when he sets himself to create he creates but nothings mere lying vanities that are less than nothing and finds his punishment in the nothingness of his creations he is constantly in the pains of parturition and brings forth wind but pride cannot destroy the creations of god it remains for us to obtain some perception of the way in which pride acts in the other deadly sins and how the habits of those evils react on pride and increase its intensity the seven deadly sins are the seven ways in which our nature is corrupted and defiled they are pride envy anger sloth covetousness intemperance and impurity or lust vice is the corruption of our affections beyond right order and due measure and these seven vices are called capital sins or deadly vices because all corruption of our rational nature flows from them 
the wholeness or integrity of our corporal nature is one thing the integrity of our spiritual nature is another of corporal natures some have existence and form but without sense such as gold others have sense as well as form such as the human body a body that has no sense is corrupted by the violating or breaking up of its unity thus if you break a gold cup to pieces you corrupt its form but if corruption enters into a sensible body like that of man it injures disorders and destroys the strength of that body and we call the person who owns it sick disordered or infirm any one of which states endangers or destroys the mortal life and so brings that body to its final corruption but our spiritual nature the soul within the body is made for truth and goodness and the right order of the soul towards truth and goodness we call justice the soul is therefore in a state of utter poverty and want when separated from truth and goodness and when wilfully separated she is in a state of violence of disorder and disunion for the soul grows in that proportion in which she is united with truth and with goodness and when perfectly united with them she is in perfect unity because there is a perfect unity between the subject and its true object which constitutes perfection the integrity therefore of a spiritual nature like the soul consists in adhering to the truth that is made known to her and to the good that is given to her and it should be remembered that truth is the light of good so that when we have more truth and good as we have in this world it gives us the hope of a good to which we have not yet come this adherence consists in acknowledging the truth and in loving the good which are presented to the soul and this adherence is an act of the free affection of the will but the sincerity of the soul is corrupted and her unity and integrity violated when the affections of the soul resist the known truth or when she does not love that good for which she was created when the soul resists the known truth she becomes divided and so corrupted in mind and when she resists the good for which she was made or the law of order and love by which that good is reached she becomes divided in her will and in all her soul and is disordered and defiled the purity of the mind is defiled by falsehood and rebellion against the truth and the purity of the will and spiritual sense is defiled by vice and rebellion against god's law the spring of this disorder is in the will and its first disorderly movement is to turn from god which is pride whilst the second disorderly movement is to turn with the love of preference to the creature which is cupidity but before we can turn with the love of preference to what is either false or inferior we first turn in pride from the truth of god or from the law of god or from god himself to what is low and base in other words pride rises in the will before the will enters into cupidity and stimulates concupiscence into sin this was the case with lucifer who turned from god before he turned to himself and abandoned the love of god before he gave his whole love to himself this was also the case with adam who turned from the truth of god before he accepted the falsehood from satan and ceased to be subject to god before he aspired to be equal to god through independent knowledge the soul in her integrity is united with god in affection through the medium of his light and grace and through that union is united in affection with all the good that proceeds from god whether to herself or to any creature and through this affection is ready to acknowledge and to honour that good wherever it appears but there are seven deadly corruptions of this affection 
of which pride is the first this false and disorderly love of one's own excellence as if it were the chief and most desirable good disorders and deforms our whole affection by drawing it to one poor and needy part of being and cutting it off from the whole for as we have already said all good is from one supreme good and the good that proceeds from god is less in itself than in him in whom we live and move and have our being acts chapter seventeen verse twenty eight whosoever then puts his delight in any good apart from the supreme good perversely gives himself but a part and loses the great whole of good by this separating of the soul from the supreme good and source of all good all the beauty of rational affection is destroyed the soul is left in an evil and most absurd position and is exposed without defence to every evil and punishment for the six capital vices that follow pride bring grief and punishment to the soul the punishment of pride becomes visible in the vices that follow it for whilst pride begins all iniquity the vices that follow punish the iniquity of pride pride would have good for its own exclusive property for the proud soul delights in having or imagining or wishing a good that another has not this love of having one's own especial excellence as an individual and exclusive property is the distinctive characteristic of pride and is the reason why the vice is defined to be the love of excellence as one's own property but this causes a hatred of all communion in good from which springs envy the first daughter of pride for you would not be displeased at another's good unless you first wish to have it yourself and to have it alone what wounds and grieves your pride in another's good or happiness is the sense it awakens in you of your own deficiency and the discovery that you are not what you imagined you were or wished to be in taking an unjust delight in your pride you are justly tormented by envy your pride makes you pleased with what you think you are and your envy makes you displeased with what another is the less conscious a soul is of the malice of her pride the more deeply she is corrupted by it and the more alluringly it has entered the more deeply has it penetrated its very first influence is to blind the soul to its presence and we mostly see it when through the dawning of humility it begins to disappear but envy wounds pride and inflicts pain yet even then it is not the evil that is felt so much as the bitterness and so this envy is the beginning of the punishment of pride the vice of anger follows that of envy it is an irrational perturbation of the soul that also brings with it a certain punishment for if the good or the happiness of another is wounding to pride how much more is it wounded when another rises to oppose or to offend our pride then it will rouse up with an irrational excitement and reason is lost in anger being utterly unable to endure with patience the soul becomes agitated and tormented revealing a weakness and want of foundation and is incapable of bearing adversity with calmness there is a just anger of which the scripture says be angry and sin not psalm four verse five but this is that righteous indignation which refuses to accept to countenance to encourage or to do evil it is quite different from that evil anger that refuses to suffer infliction just anger rejects sin unjust anger refuses the punishment of sin and is restless and disquieted losing all patience in the presence of opposition thus pride suffers misery whilst the body is tortured with anger and the soul with its grief these three capital vices pride 
envy and anger are in most vicious ways opposed to god pride denies him envy accuses him anger flies from him the man whose glory is in his independent excellence will have no superior in envying the good given to another he accuses the divine giver in taking anger to his heart he expels the divine lover of peace and breaks into language that either insults god in himself or in his creature pride says god is not my good envy says he is not my benefactor the good i loved he has given to another anger says he has not sent me good but evil thus are these three vices especially injurious to god for pride separates from him envy is offended with his goodness to others and anger expels his memory from the soul after these three those four other vices follow in which god may be said to avenge the injuries that pride commits against him for when the soul abandons god god abandons the soul to her own devices and she sinks from one degradation to another the first of these four is sloth which is a weariness of soul arising from the loathing of interior good for after a soul has lost her spiritual good she finds herself in a solitary and deserted state that leaves her in pain and bitterness and without any disposition to seek what she has lost after this follows covetousness or avarice which is an immoderate cupidity for external goods for as the soul is without internal good and is utterly insufficient for herself she is driven to fill her appetite with external things that are far below her nature sloth fills the soul with weariness and pain and avarice distracts her with incessant cares and labors upon many inferior things but when it is taken up into the pride of possessing the heart becomes extremely hardened the fruits of all this toil and care are hoarded up from use and gloated upon and the avaricious man obtains the name of miser or miserable yet this is but one base and conspicuous form of that vice of pride which by its selfishness and exclusive claim to good of one kind or another is miserly in everything after covetousness comes the vice of gluttony the soul lost to interior solidity and framed upon exterior things is caught by intemperance an ignominious passion that satiates the body whilst it obstructs and brutalizes the mind and whilst under the plea of necessity it disorders both body and soul it leads to yet viler things lastly comes the vice of lust or impurity to which intemperance directly leads the pride of the spirit ends in the pride of the flesh and what begins in rebellion of the soul ends in the rebellion of the basest part of our human nature the first of these seven vices brings down the soul from the highest and noblest good the last brings her down to the lowest degrees of turpitude as the psalmist says i have come down into the deep mire and there is no substance psalm sixty eight verse three the inflation of pride has no substance reaction comes from that inflation and still seeking the substance of good where it cannot be found sinks into the shameful mud of uncleanness this last vice is the mockery of the first and self-elevation rebounds into self-degradation these are the seven vices that corrupt the whole integrity of the soul of which pride is not only the first but the bitter root that provides the poison of malice for all the rest of these unhallowed vices whereby the sanctity of god is insulted but against these seven destructive evils god has sent his seven witnesses into all humble holy and penitent souls in the seven gifts of his holy spirit 
from the beginning to the end of the holy scriptures we shall find if we study them attentively one fundamental truth and one unceasing admonition we hear it in paradise we see it on the cross it runs through the sacred histories is loud in the prophets frequent in the sapiential books continuous in the gospels and rises in many pages of the apostolic writings this fundamental truth instructs us to know this constant admonition exhorts us to act on the belief that what god accepts from man is humility and that what he rejects is pride his blessings are for the humble his maledictions are for the proud in every virtue it is humility that he rewards in every vice it is pride that he punishes and when we remember that it is humility that subjects the soul and the virtues to god and that it is pride that sends the soul away from god and inflames the vices with its malice we shall see that it cannot be otherwise st caesarius of arles has left us a remarkable homily in exposition of this truth which he has drawn from every part of the scriptures the whole doctrine is summed up in a proverb of solomon which is repeated by st peter and by st james that god resists the proud but gives his grace to the humble proverbs chapter three verse thirty four one peter chapter five verse five james chapter four verse six this truth is so obvious to humble souls that they see it by a spiritual intuition and feel it by a spiritual instinct it should however be observed that the humble are sometimes in the sacred scriptures called the poor and sometimes the right of heart for the humble are the poor in spirit and the right of heart are those whose hearts are in just submission to god on the other hand the proud are often called the arrogant or the stiff-necked or the malignant or by other terms denoting their insurrection against their creator and lord a few passages will show how all maledictions evils and punishments are denounced or directed against pride in the book of leviticus for instance the almighty declares to the israelites who despise his law or contemn his judgments i will break the pride of your stubbornness leviticus chapter twenty six verse nineteen and in the book of numbers the soul that committeth anything through pride whether he be born in the land or a stranger because he hath been rebellious against the lord shall be cut off from among his people for he hath contemned the word of the lord and made void his precept therefore shall he be destroyed and shall bear his iniquity numbers chapter fifteen verses thirty and thirty one and in the book of job it is said the praise of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment if his pride mount up even to heaven and his head touch the clouds in the end he shall be destroyed as a dunghill and they that had seen him shall say where is he his bones shall be filled with the vices of his youth and they shall sleep with him in the dust job chapter twenty verses five through eleven and the proverb says the proud and the arrogant is called ignorant who in anger worketh pride proverbs chapter twenty one verse twenty four of the impious man the psalmist says the proud did iniquitously altogether psalm one hundred eighteen verse fifty one of the heretic st paul says he is proud knoweth nothing one timothy chapter six verse four in these and in a great number of passages besides pride is pointed out as the malignant element in the other vices as the cause of those vices as that which is hateful to god in them and as that which is punished as the prophet joel says of the enemy of god's people his stench shall ascend 
and his rottenness shall go up because he hath done proudly joel chapter two verse twenty for as isaiah says the day of the lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and high-minded and upon every one that is arrogant and he shall be humbled isaiah chapter two verse twelve but whilst the god of all goodness reprobates the proud because they are the enemies of all goodness humiliates them because they lift themselves in conceit and brings them to confusion because they labor in their vanity to confuse all things in what page of his divine revelation does he not love and bless the humble he looks down upon the humble visits the humble gives his grace to the humble consoles the humble dwells with the humble gives his peace to the humble sends down his spirit upon the humble and promises his kingdom to the humble why do we speak only of humility and pride and not also of charity and cupidity since charity is the perfection of virtue and cupidity the root of evil for this plain reason that it is humility that obtains charity and pride that gives malice to cupidity without humility we could not receive charity as without pride cupidity might slumber without evil action humility is the human preparation for charity the sacrificial altar on which it is enkindled pride is the malicious side of cupidity that awakens and excites it to sin pride sets fire to cupidity and cupidity is its smoky flame humility is obtained with great labor charity descends from heaven upon the toils of humility humility and charity are by the grace of god inseparable but cupidity and pride are the double fetters that bind the wicked to their misery when you hear the scriptures or the church sound the praises of humility you know that charity is in her company but when you hear their execrations upon pride you know that pride is bound up with cupidity whoever therefore would be freed from pride must labor also to extinguish cupidity and whoever would obtain true humility must strive as well for perfect charity let us then entreat of god with our whole powers that in his mercy he would deliver us from pride and cupidity and would grant us the inestimable gift of humility and charity that we may not follow the evil spirits in their pride to destruction but christ the divine master of humility to sanctification which may god in his goodness grant us now and forever amen End of Lecture 11, Part 3。Lecture 12, Part 1 of The Groundwork of the Christian Virtues by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 12 The World Without Humility, Part 1. When they knew God, they have not glorified him as god nor given thanks but became vain in their thoughts and their foolish heart was darkened romans chapter one verse twenty four the light of reason is sufficient to teach the knowledge of god but not to bring man into union with his creator for the light naturally implanted in the human mind bears witness to god and the conscience is his voice all his works speak of their creator and in the action of his providence he manifests his care of them but the pride that is in man separates him from god turns his soul from the light corrupts his interior sense and smites him with spiritual blindness when that pride has gone so far as to isolate man from god and his self-love has deluded him into the absurd notion of self-sufficiency 
his understanding is drawn from the light that makes god known and retreating behind the fictions of his imagination he proceeds to deify himself as it is the natural effect of pride to swell the imagination and obscure the understanding the effect of this again is to fancy that the more independent a man is of superior truth and authority the more liberty he gains but to have less of truth is to have more of darkness and darkness is the loss both of liberty and power those men of progress backwards who seek light from the things beneath and not from the things above them cannot understand what the incarnate truth has taught us that if therefore the sun shall make you free then you shall be truly free st john chapter eight verse thirty six in the scriptures and the church we learn that the true progress of man is towards god and that the path of this progress is upwards to greater truth and higher justice but the heathen world teaches us the terrible lesson of the final end of false progress of progress away from god through the dreary downward path by the ways of negation and false liberty first the sense of dependence on god is lost and so the virtue of humility departs then man forgets his creator forgets him until he no longer knows that he is a creature and so the intellectual principle of humility disappears from his mind pride then remains master of his heart without a rival but still wanting a god though a god consistent with his license he begins to deify the creature next the keener intellects begin to theorize and philosophize apart from god working their proud intellects under the influence of their proud imagination and confounding the light of those eternal principles that gleam in their obscured reason with the phenomena reflected to their mind from the visible creation but as the loss of humility is the loss of that god-given light which makes the distinction clear between what is of god and what is of nature in the mind they confound god and nature in one and transfer this confusion to the universe they thus find a miserable self-flattery in bringing down god to the level of the soul and in raising the soul to a level with god making the material world a changeable garment of illusion to both pantheism is the leveling system carried into the sphere of divinity there is but one descent lower into which the debasing tendency of intellectual pride can fall and this is the terrible revenge that the mind takes of its own deification when both mind and life are turned into the material results of a material cause this is the work of minds so steeped in animal sense and matter that they can no longer see spirit or understand its nature very pitiful it is that when these results of the defects of mental vision are put into many words they should be mistaken for science although nothing but a cloak for ignorance and want of light st paul describes the mental condition of the heathens whom he knew so well in these words the nations walking in the vanity of their minds having their understandings darkened being alienated from the life of god through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts who in their callousness gave themselves to luxuriant lasciviousness to every work of uncleanness with greediness ephesians chapter four verses seventeen through nineteen this sensuous and unclean life thickened the darkness of their minds and intensified their egotism immeasurably winding their heart with an ever-increasing pride thus separated from god by their pride with their minds turned from the truth and cut off from the source of light these proudly imaginative men like children in the dark were subject to many fancies and illusions which became their punishment 
they made gods for themselves whom they projected from their imagination and whom they filled with their own life and character for these gods of human make of necessity partook of human qualities with such exaggerations as the poetry of the obscured mind could furnish as the sun sheds light from the heavens and fertilizes the earth and is the brightest and most imposing of visible things the man in search of the god he had lost transferred his life and intelligence to that luminary and made it his god as the moon predominates in the night and mitigates the darkness he made the moon his goddess under many names for as he draws his types of life and action from human nature he naturally imagines gods of both sexes the stars become to him as minor gods and the clouds as ministering spirits carnalized as he is by the predominance of sense and imagination over intelligence the man has lost the power of penetrating beyond the material into the spiritual heavens and of realizing to his mind and heart the purely spiritual and perfect nature of god for his pride and sensuality combine to blind his intelligence but as pride grows with habit with time and through the constant interchange of minds divorced from god and as the reaction of sensual elation upon mental elation increases in proportion the imagination becomes more gross though not less vivid and upon this like fanciful children who reflect their own vivacious life into whatever interests them whether a rocking horse or a doll these lost children of a larger growth began to imagine life and divinity in woods and mountains in caves and streams in gardens and springs and wherever they found indications of power beauty or beneficence and as fear begets the imagination of power victories and panics fevers and their cures whatever things in short affect humanity strongly were ascribed to special gods until at last almost everything from the visible heavens to the household hearth had its peculiar divinity each with its special character and many limitations behind all the chief features of nature and in all that was useful to man the heathens imagined the presence of deities requiring to be honoured or feared until almost everything became the abode of some god and the god who made all things was alone forgotten what is this but an enormous corruption of the truth that the action of god is everywhere to the vague notion of a divinity that still hung in their minds the heathens put their own corrupt imaginations and fancy gods innumerable that were only the caricatures of themselves yet still was there left in them a sense of one great mysterious and universal power that filled their minds with awe and dread a power that ruled both gods and men and whose decrees were inevitable into which however they feared to search and to which they gave the name of fate undoubtedly this was a shadow upon their mind though lost to their understanding of the one eternal god almighty who rules all things but of whom because alienated from him they stood in fear and dread after imagining their gods the next step was to represent them externally this was first done in rude symbols or fetishes that seemed to localize their influence attempts were next made to represent them in human forms or in forms uniting the animal with man finally with the progress of skill they took the naked human figure with all its refinements and allurements as the fitting representation of those gods of human fashion forever as idolatry advanced the gods became nearer in likeness to human nature in its fallen state as we see them represented by the poets with not only the virtues but the vices of mankind 
but the vividness of the corrupt and pride inflated imagination stopped not here there is testimony in the pagan writers that their idols were assumed to be inhabited by the gods they represented even the sacred scriptures declare that they were not gods but demons and certainly where pride is so great as to put the figures of mortals in the place of god the demons cannot be far away many writers have dealt copiously upon the sensual vices of the heathen world and upon its innumerable superstitions but scarcely any one seems to have gone to the root of the evil which accounts for all the rest neither the writers on pagan morals nor the commentators on the classics take much notice if any of that terrible pride which not only separated the heathens from god and threw them in full reliance on their own self-sufficiency but so completely possessed and blinded them that they mistook that for the first power of their nature which was the first of their vices and the chief cause of all their moral weakness and superstition much care is taken and justly taken by every truly christian teacher to guard the minds of youth from the impurities of the classics but whoever thinks of cautioning them against the false foundation of their virtues st augustine who had such bitter remembrance of his own pagan youth and was so intimate with the pagan philosophies never ceases to instruct his hearers and readers upon the radical difference between christian and pagan morals as based on the opposite foundations of humility and pride we will here give a cluster of his maxims that pervade his voluminous writings in many forms man loses god by pride he regains god through humility of which christ is the author a proud soul is the greatest of miseries but a humble god is the greatest of mercies the law of christian life and almost the whole of its discipline is the virtue of humility in vain shall we look for this virtue in the writings of the philosophers or in the schools of error it is peculiar to the sacred scriptures and the church of christ in his great work on the city of god to which he devoted so many years his whole object is to show that the pride of man explains the history of the action of god in the world and that but for his providential visitations in the shape of humiliations calamities and sufferings the uncurbed pride of man would have brought the human race to destruction he then shows how the humility of christ is changing the world of his time the heathen sages and heroes claimed the virtues their wise men disputed on them they had much to say on prudence justice fortitude and temperance and great examples of these virtues to allege yet they had nothing capable of standing by the virtues of the gospel or even of the old testament they knew absolutely nothing of their creation and as little of the principle of grace and were utterly ignorant of the virtue of humility at the root of their virtues lay the poison of pride and the admitted ground of them was the self-sufficiency of the man for whatever he chose to undertake it infected them all through and pervaded their philosophical expositions of them in a well-known passage of st augustine who had examined all their philosophies he says the confession of sin the humbling of the heart the saving life that subjects oneself to god that presumes in nothing on oneself that ascribes nothing to one's own power this is not to be found in any of their books who are alien from us not in the epicureans not in the stoics not in the manichaeans not in the platonists we find excellent moral precepts and rules of conduct in them but humility cannot be found humility comes from another direction it comes from christ this way is from him who was high and came in lowliness 
by this humility we approach to god who is nigh to the contrite of heart but in the deluge of many waters that lift themselves against god and teach proud impieties they cannot come nigh to god as cajetan observes one or two of the heathen sages caught a distant glimpse of the virtue for a moment and that was all plato had a passage in his laws in which he speaks of god as the avenger of those who fail from the divine law and of the coming happiness of the man who adheres to justice with a composed and modest mind and follows the conspicuous guidance of justice with constancy and that he deserts the man who is inflated with pride depriving him of force and success this solitary passage rises far above the habitual thinking of heathen philosophy even above plato himself at other times and seems to have found its way to the writer from a hebrew source the famous oracle of delphi know thyself makes little to the argument unless we know to what extent man was advised to know himself humility arises from the knowledge of god and of oneself and the true knowledge of oneself is only obtained in the light of god some few writers as we have observed in a previous lecture have attempted to identify the magnanimity taught by aristotle with christian humility but this will not stand even the briefest inquiry not to speak of the ethics being nothing more than an exposition of political morality we have only to examine the famous chapter on the magnanimous man to see that it is nothing more than the description of the shrewd self-seeking worldly ambitious man of all times who cultivates honour as the way to social success the very name of magnanimity says the philosopher implies that great things are its object whatever is great in each virtue would seem to belong to the great-minded this virtue then would seem to be the ornament of all the other virtues in that it makes them better and that it cannot be without them it is obvious that magnanimity is put forth as the supreme of pagan virtues brightening and perfecting all the others it holds the place that charity holds among the christian virtues but how does it accord with humility let us hear further he is thought to be great-minded who values himself highly and yet justly the man who esteems himself lowly but yet justly is modest but not great-minded he who values himself highly without just grounds is a vain man though the name must not be applied to every case of unduly high estimation he that values himself below his real worth is a small-minded man thus man is constituted the supreme judge of his own worth and is high or low-minded according to that judgment st paul says on the contrary be not high-minded but fear the great high-mindedness here described is not from humility but from pride as it comes out more clearly in what follows honour then and dishonour continues the master of heathen philosophy are specially the object of the great-minded man and as such honour as it is great and given by good men he will be moderately pleased as getting his own or perhaps somewhat less for no honour can be quite adequate to perfect virtue but still he will accept this because they have nothing greater to give him but such as is given him by ordinary people and on trifling grounds he will despise because this does not come up to his deserts and dishonour likewise because in his case there cannot be just ground for it then the philosopher tells us that honour is the cause of power and wealth being worthy of choice for certainly they who have them desire to be honoured through them it seems too that pieces of good fortune contribute to form this character of great-mindedness i mean the nobly born or men of influence or the wealthy 
are considered to be entitled to honor we see then that the chief heathen virtue begins and ends in the man its foundation is self-esteem its object human honor and its chief instruments what we should call the advantages of fortune it resolves itself into self-regard worldly success and the worship of honor received from honorable that is from successful men this was the heathen wisdom of which st paul says the world through wisdom knew not god and the wisdom of the world is folly with god tertullian cuts this wisdom to the quick when he called its votaries the animals of glory it was the proud self-seeking worldly wisdom philosophized into a virtue for the select few men of better fortune it could not have been preached to the multitude excepting in bitter irony on their lot in life the multitude were the ordinary and small-minded men incapable of magnanimity whose little tributes of honor were to be despised because they were unworthy the notice of the great-minded man that the circle of the favored few formed the limits of this magnanimity is obvious from the terms in which the virtue is described and is more explicitly stated in what follows it is the characteristic of the great-minded continues the philosopher to ask favors not at all or very reluctantly but to do a service readily and to bear himself loftily towards the great or fortunate but towards the people of middle station affably because to be above the former is difficult and so a grand thing but to be above the latter is easy and to be high and mighty towards the former is not ignoble but to do it towards those of humbler station would be below him and vulgar compare this heathen wisdom with the teaching of the eternal wisdom whose first words when he opened his mouth to instruct were these blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven this pagan magnanimity is neither more nor less than the exaltation of pride the very reverse of christian magnanimity it rests on the sufficiency of man whilst the christian even when employing the sources of human influence rests his virtue on the sufficiency of god yet this chapter is entitled to careful study because it anatomizes the heart of the polished man of the world of all times whose first principle is himself and the breath of whose life is the good opinion of his social circle that plato had heard something of the divine wisdom revealed to the hebrews is rendered probable by other passages than that we have quoted from his writings for example where he says that the triangle is the figure that nearest resembles the divinity and again the famous passage in the second alcibiades where he puts the declaration into the mouth of socrates that man knows not what to ask of god until the divine governor of man shall come to teach him the dialogue deserves to be quoted in proof of the utter darkness and perplexity of the wisest of all the heathens with respect to god and himself socrates do not you remember you told me you were in great perplexity for fear you should pray unawares for evil things whilst you only intended to ask for good alcibiades i remember it very well socrates socrates you see it is not at all safe for you to go and pray in the temple in the condition you are in lest the god hearing your blasphemies should reject your sacrifices and to punish you should give you what you would not have i am therefore of the mind that it is much better for you to be silent for i know you very well your pride i say will probably not permit you to use the prayer of the lacedaemonians therefore it is necessary you should wait for some person to teach you how you ought to behave yourself towards both gods and men alcibiades and when will that time come socrates and who is he that will instruct me 
with what pleasure shall i look upon him socrates he will do it who takes care of you but i think as we read in homer that minerva dissipated the mist that covered the eyes of diomed and hindered him from distinguishing the god from man so it is necessary that he should first scatter the darkness that covers your soul and afterwards give you those remedies that are necessary to put you into a condition for distinguishing good and evil for at present you know not how to make the difference between them alcibiades let him scatter them let him destroy this darkness of mine and whatever else he pleases i abandon myself to his conduct and am very ready to obey all his commands provided i may be made better by them socrates do not doubt of that for this governor i tell you of has a singular affection for you alcibiades i think i must defer my sacrifice to that time socrates you have reason it is more safe so to do than to run so great a risk in this singular passage written by the most soaring mind among the greeks and described to the wisest of them we see what was the condition of the most enlightened heathens after all their investigations they were ignorant of their final end and of the real good of the soul in consequence of that ignorance they knew not what it was safe to ask of their gods and confessed that the one god alone is the secure guide and teacher of man st clement of alexandria observes that plato's writings prepared the minds of the heathen for christianity but though st augustine owed his conversion from materialism to them he declares that their general spirit inspires the heart with pride the social system set forth by this divine man as he was called embraced the wildest schemes of modern communism absorbing the family in the state rejecting the marriage tie transferring the care of all children from the parents to the state and advocating the unnameable vices to their last extremes end of lecture twelve part one lecture twelve part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture twelve the world without humility part two if we turn from the greek to the roman moralists we find them enamoured of the proudest as well as of the sternest of all systems that of the stoics the man who studies wisdom if we are to believe cicero thinks of nothing that is abject of nothing that is humble if the chief virtue of the greeks was magnanimity that of the romans was a stern fortitude not the christian fortitude but a fortitude based on the pantheistic notion of the divinity of the soul yet this divinity of the soul was limited in practice to men of honour and rank for the multitude whether of freemen or of slaves was looked upon with contempt satanic rather than humane this fortitude implied the scornful rejection of all providential humiliations and the presumption of an inward strength to resist and despise the chastisements of god observe says cicero that although good affections take the name of virtues that name belongs not properly to all of them for virtus avero virtue takes its name from manliness and the virtue proper to manliness is fortitude this is chiefly exercised in the contempt of fear and death again he says if there be any virtue and of that cato has removed all doubt that virtue looks upon all adversities that befall a man as beneath him so that in despising adversities he may scorn the trials of life and being innocent of criminality he may think that nothing concerns him 
but that virtue yet this cato the model of roman virtue was a man of stern and cruel pride who showed a positive indifference to his wife's purity and instead of enduring adversity with courage committed suicide to escape from it the pagans had no consciousness of sin for the very notion of it was excluded by the overmastering influence of their pride and by their self-deification they could not say with ephraim thou hast chastised me and i am instructed convert me and i shall be converted for thou art the lord my god and after i was converted i did penance jeremiah's chapter thirty one verses eighteen and nineteen left to themselves the punishment of pride was the paralysis of their conscience it has been said of seneca that he had imbibed some degree of christian doctrine and had even conversed with st paul if this were true the christian teaching never reached his soul the very root of his philosophy is the stoic doctrine that man is all-sufficient for himself and that he has the inherent power to scale the summit of virtue and to set himself on equality with god according to his teaching reason or the soul for he makes them one is nothing else than a part of the divine spirit merged in the human body and as reason is divine and there is no good without reason all good is divine and as there is no distinction in things divine there is no distinction between one good and another this confounding of the objective light of reason with the subjective soul is the false foundation of all pantheism from this view of things the philosopher concludes that the supreme good of man is to follow nature with the will of nature that the one virtue receives various forms according to the matter to which it is directed that all virtues are equal and that all men are equal by the exercise of this virtue joy is therefore equal to the strong and obstinate enduring of torments all this he deduces from his first position that the spirit of man is a part of the divinity merged in the human body which when a man dies is returned to its former elements from this notion of the divinity of the soul he concludes that nothing is so great nothing so strong as man he may be good just gentle temperate and acquire all virtues by dint of his own strength the pride of this philosopher goes to yet further excess there is something says seneca in which the wise man surpasses god god is without fear through the good of his nature and the wise man through his own good behold a great thing that man in his weakness should have the security of god incredible is the force of philosophy to repel the force of fortune no weapon finds a place in its body it is fortified and solid and as the weapon comes its way the philosopher bends and avoids it he shakes these things from him and hurls them back on him who sent them epictetus thought that the will of man had no object beyond itself and he taught a morality whose sole object was to concentrate the will upon self alone with the view of seeking all things as far as possible in self alone the philosophical emperor antoninus called the delight of mankind rendered worship to himself as being a part of the divine nature with all the stoics these men professedly sought their final end in themselves and if we take the most celebrated philosophers of the grecian schools one seeks his final end in health of body and mind another in honesty a third in wisdom a fourth in the contemplation of ideas a fifth in the science of numbers a sixth in the moderation of pleasure and so on but not one of them even among those who believed in the unity of god ever dreamed that god is the final end of man 
nor can any one of them unless it be pythagoras stand an examination into their moral conduct by the test of their own teaching low and defective as that was cicero admits as lactantius observes that the lives of the philosophers were far removed from their teaching and that their wisdom was more for ostentation than for the guidance of their lives and seneca remarks that these sages did not exhibit their doctrine in themselves plato zeno and the rest he tells us taught not how they themselves lived but how men ought to live there was not one of them who whilst privately teaching but one god and secretly despising the gods of the multitude did not offer their sacrifices to the popular gods as though they entirely believed in them origen truly says of them that their lives were so contrary to their knowledge that by the just judgment of god they lost the knowledge of the true god and of his divine providence and fell to such blindness and ignorance as to give that honour to corruptible creatures which was due to the eternal god it is even so and the revolt of the intellect from god leads straight to the revolt of the animal man and the egotism of the interior man breaks forth into the sensuous egotism of the exterior man he who is not subject to god cannot subject his lower to his higher nature the imagination which is the mental seat both of pride and sensuality becomes intensely active and puts the intelligence under an eclipse the sense of self-sufficiency arises in the absence of the sense of god and when he has lost the sense of accountability to god the man becomes accountable only to himself but when he is only accountable to his own pride what is there he will not do in secret devoid of every shame in their gods the poets deified their own vices and passions and the philosophers quoted them without any reprehension there were no martyrs to philosophy not one for they never opposed themselves to the vices oppressions or false opinions of those in power or went in their conduct against the world at large yet the gentiles had the natural law within their hearts nor were all their acts vicious for they did the natural works of the law some of them more some less as st augustine tells evodius except that they did not worship god but worshipped vain inventions according to their national institutions serving the creature rather than the creator many of them led lives that were in a certain degree praiseworthy and in the rest of their morals they were chaste and sober and despised death for their country's sake and they kept faith with their fellow-citizens and even with their enemies and these things they deservedly set forth for imitation but when these habits are directed by no just or sincere motives of piety but go to the motive of conciliating human praise and glory even these virtues vanish into nothing so to speak and are barren to their possessor the secret of the heathen's heart was this by a prolonged alienation from god pride became rooted until it was taken for an element of nature and the spring of moral strength and from this the intellectual notion arose that the spirit within him was divine and so the man was sufficient for himself the loss of the knowledge of god led to the loss of the knowledge of sin and to such an obscuration of the conscience that the inner soul so little known so far from the all-revealing light of god was hidden from the man this explains the magnanimity of the greeks based altogether on self-sufficiency and the self-inebriating enthusiasm of the brahmins and buddhists based on emanative pantheism the law of virtue became the regulator of pride the pride rebuked by the heathen moralists and lashed by the satirists 
was not the principle of pride but the offensive and excessive manifestations of it that disturbed or inconvenienced the pride of other men no one dreamed that its roots were to be extirpated what was to be avoided was the too great obtrusion of one man's pride upon that of another from the virtues that moderated the exhibition of pride arose civil refinement public usefulness and pleasant friendship but the true spirit that lay beneath these social virtues is amply revealed in the chapter from the ethics already quoted the philosopher says further that the magnanimous man must speak and act openly for this is a characteristic of one that despises others he is bold in speech and therefore is apt to despise others and truth-telling except when he uses dissimulation but to the vulgar he ought to dissemble after describing the meek man as one who feels anger according to the dictates of reason and for a proper length of time the philosopher says but the meek man seems to err rather on the side of defect for he is not inclined to revenge but rather to forgive this accepted exposition will suffice to show that heathen virtue was but the management of pride yet god left not himself without a witness in the world at any time take that period when the roman empire was at the worst when either pantheism or materialism was the wisdom of the learned and the most corrupt idolatry and vice were the practice of the multitude as well as of their masters in that terrible period when the roman world was contending against the advancement of christianity the grave tertullian gives most remarkable evidence of the tendency among the common people to invoke the true god and proclaim their dependence on him notwithstanding all their idolatry and superstition in his book on the testimony of the soul he appeals to the heathen world and calls on all its men and women to bear witness that they know the god of the christians he declines to summon the men of letters from their schools and libraries he will not listen to the wise philosophers he calls upon all the rude simple and unsophisticated souls from the public ways the streets and the workshops he rests his cause in complete confidence upon those who have nothing but their souls to bring in evidence then the great apologist of the christians tells us that at every turn he hears this heathen people crying out quite naturally god grant it or if it please god thus ignoring the multitude of gods in their temples whether saturn juno mars or minerva nor are they ignorant of the nature of god for they say god is good and god be good to us and they know who is the author of blessings for like the christians they exclaim god bless you and they know that god is present and that he judges them for both at home and abroad without fear of ridicule or hindrance these poor pagans cry out well god sees all or i commend you to god or god reward you or god will judge between us and these things they say even though they carry about them the symbols of saturn of ceres or of isis and when they execrate evil deeds they will ascribe them to the demons or will call those persons demons who are malignant or impure all these observes tertullian are natural testimonies to the truth but where does he find these witnesses to the truth not among the learned disputers with their wise conceits but among the lowly the laboring and the suffering poor who as he says have nothing but their souls then he offers these shrewd remarks souls existed before letters speech before books and men before philosophers and poets did men never utter these speeches before there were books and theories 
did they never speak of the goodness of god or of death or of hell of which they now speak so openly and naturally before mercury was born let us suppose they have learnt all these from books yet the holy scriptures brought down the tradition of them long before those books were written and from those sacred pages alone could they have learnt to speak of god but god formed the conscience of man as well as the scriptures and nature also bears witness to him after contemplating this general testimony of souls to the christian's god the great apologist exclaims in an excess of fervour o soul thou art by nature christian after which he makes this appeal to the heathen's mind every soul is both a culprit and a witness of the truth and each soul shall stand at the judgment seat of god with nothing to plead in her defence thou didst proclaim the one god but thou didst not seek him thou didst execrate the demons yet thou didst adore the demons thou didst call god into judgment yet thou didst put no faith in the god whom thou didst call upon to judge thou didst admit of the eternal torments but didst not shun the eternal torments thou didst know the name of the christian's god yet thou didst persecute the christian this instinctive knowledge of the one god which lay deeper in the conscience than the superstitions encrusted upon it this spontaneous crying of the untutored populations to the true god in the habit of which their humble position preserved them undoubtedly prepared them to receive the gospel of christ whilst those who were cultivated in the falsely grounded philosophies which they called wisdom who held the high places of the world and who despised humility as something utterly ignominious and contemptible as their language to the christian martyr showed remained for the most part for ages in their pride and darkness the frenzy of self-deification came not upon the world at once the parents of our race under satanical temptations aspired to be as gods but their fall quickly opened their eyes to the delusion after pride had caused apostasy from god the powers in the heavens were first idolized and then the powers of nature on the earth whether as causes of beneficence or as objects of fear the one they invoked to their aid as children invoke the objects of their fancy the other they strove to propitiate much as friday entreated the gun of robinson crusoe not to kill him then came the deification of heroes whether of a beneficent or destructive character such as the inventors of arts the founders of cities or mighty conquerors but after deifying their fellow-men the next step was to deify themselves this self-deification arose from causes that require careful consideration in looking on things far removed they are confounded in your vision one with another the mountains blend with the skies the hills blend together the woods cannot be distinguished from the soil the reason of this confusion is the faintness of the light reflected to the eye of the spectator from objects at so great a distance but the reverse of this may be the case the objects may be near the spectator and with full light upon them whilst the eyes are weak or diseased he then sees all things confusedly and without much power of distinguishing one thing from another the loss either of light or of sight is the loss of the power of distinction and thus one thing is confounded with another now what takes place in the understanding is not unlike what takes place in our corporal eyes the understanding is the eye of the soul and it sees its objects by the means of spiritual light if the eye of the soul is far removed from the spiritual light or if that eye is greatly disordered and obscured in either case and much more in the case of both 
the power of distinguishing is to a great degree lost children see mental truths in confusion and as it were blended together but as their mind strengthens and they are subjected to education they learn to distinguish truth from truth and one thing from another the process of education is chiefly by analysis it is the process of finding out the distinction of things that are united in one common light after the heathen world had departed from the true god had lost the clear knowledge of him and abandoned his worship after men had devoted themselves to the worship of the powers of nature and to their sculptured representations the lights of their mind became greatly diminished although they still retained a certain vague and indefinite notion of one supreme spirit as all the records of history bear witness the image of god was still in their souls however much obscured and they still retain some general notion however vague of a first cause of all things but with the loss of all definite knowledge of god the knowledge of him as their creator was lost and consequently they lost the knowledge of creation the primitive revelation of the creation of the world and of man had died out of their traditions the common notion of the heathen world was that all the elements of things had existed from everlasting although the forms of things were constantly undergoing change with even the wisest greeks creation was nothing more than the fashioning and forming of things that had an eternal existence in their elements they knew nothing of that power of god that creates from nothingness their maxim was that nothing is made from nothing but when the heathen world was brought to this obscure state of mind when they made almost everything a god except god himself when the earth made for the glory of god was almost reduced to a temple of idols when the human mind was brought to that state of darkness that men neither knew their creator nor even that they and the world around were created from nothing there came a reaction in the minds of men from the deification of the material creation to the deification of their own souls when men began to think more upon themselves or as we now say to philosophize the keenest intellects found a spiritual force in themselves and a principle of causation greater and more effective than all the material forces which they worshipped and believing all things to exist from eternity they concluded that their own rational spirits had existed from eternity remote from god in mind and heart inebriated with the love of that self which they imagined had existed from eternity and blinded with the pride that springs from self-love finding also in their reason certain principles that are universal and unchangeable though obscure in their light in the intoxication of their pride they lost the power of distinguishing between their subjective selves and the objective light of truth presented to their mind and confounded themselves with the eternal light finding in themselves a principle of causation they confounded this principle with the eternal cause observing in themselves an originating force they confounded this spiritual force with the eternal power in short as they had lost all knowledge of their creation they concluded that their souls were a portion or particle an emanation or an evolution from the one eternal divinity they did not go so far in absurdity as to imagine that each one was the whole divinity but they fancied themselves to be an element of that divinity the deification of heroes had its influence no doubt in confirming this notion for if the souls of certain men were found after their death to have been divine there was no reason why other men's souls should not be equally divine the result of this self-deification 
is to fill the soul with a terrible egotism elation and enthusiasm if the enthusiasm of the anomians against whom st chrysostom delivered his magnificent discourses was so great because they fancied they saw the very light of god if the enthusiasm of the greek monks of mount athos in the eighth century was not less because they imagined they could see the same light through the navel a delusion not unlike modern spiritism if the enthusiasm of the false ontologists led by malebranche was fervid because they thought the light of truth was seen in god if the enthusiasm of certain sects who imagine they have received assurance of an unchangeable justification is attended with a dreadful spiritual and even animal elation and with a proud contempt of others what must have been the inebriating enthusiasm of those who first imbibed the notion that their spiritual part was an emanation of the divinity but this false enthusiasm lends itself with terrible force to the propagation of its own fancies and is so exceedingly flattering to the pride of human nature that the doctrine of pantheism was rapidly diffused through the populations of india china and most of the asiatic nations pythagoras brought the doctrine from syria into south italy in the fifth century before christ and from him it spread among the philosophers of greece and invaded mighty rome the natural consequence of this super exaltation of the human spirit equalized with god was to look upon the material world and the human body as something utterly weak although strong enough to detain the spirit from returning to its first principle until the body was destroyed but they concluded that the soul alone was substantial and the body an illusion such is the final result of the inebriation of self-deification from this came the doctrine of the soul or mind of the world pervading all things and mingled with it imprisoned in bodies like a celestial fire or divine air and of the soul of man being a particle of the divine breath which virgil poetized and which was taught in the writings of seneca and in those of the emperor marcus antoninus in these terms there is one common substance distributed among countless bodies one soul distributed among infinite natures with their individual circumscriptions one intelligent soul though it seems divided how this soul returns to itself from inhabiting bodies the imperial philosopher expresses in these terms as bodies after a certain time are changed and dissolved and make way for other dead bodies souls are also transferred to the air where they are changed and fused and set on fire and received into the seminal region of the universe and thus give place to other souls that come into the same regions of the weakness of matter he thus speaks what ought we to fear from the death of the body and the departure of the soul consider the brevity of this life the immensity of our past and future life and the imbecility of all that is material then comes the conclusion as a matter of course that man is everything to himself these things says the emperor are proper to the soul endowed with reason she sees herself forms herself makes herself what she wishes to be and reaps the fruits that she bears the pagan systems of morals had no other foundation than this self-sufficiency not even the ethics of aristotle or the offices of cicero aristotle himself defines happiness as a certain energy of the soul the gauls celts and germans believed equally in a soul animating all nature united with all bodies and producing all phenomena whilst their druids or priests offered sacrifices to propitiate that spirit that he might not turn those phenomena into fearful and destructive forms 
End of Lecture 12, Part 2lecture twelve part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture twelve the world without humility part three as the civil state is the centre of mind force and authority to whose dominion men look for law government justice and protection after men had deified themselves they were led to deify the state as something much more divine than the individual man and this deification was not unfrequently followed by religious worship on this part of our subject we may accept the able summary given by mr lecky speaking of the roman empire he says we find the city itself as the centre of civilization and seat of law is deified by its rulers and people and thus the laws themselves are accounted divine to pass over the great eastern cities of earlier civilization the athenians worshipped themselves in the divinity of their city the romans worshipped themselves under the name of rome the emperors as incorporating in themselves the social power were elevated into divinities and altars were raised to their worship the eastern nations subject to rome and their profound corruption were ever the first to exhibit this idolatrous worship to the city or ruler that held them in subjection this was nothing new to them we read that the statues of the kings of persia were adored in babylon domitian went so far as to deify himself calling himself lord and god in his public documents so that no one dared to address him otherwise again this writer says with great truth with the greeks the state was considered a divine institution and its welfare the supreme end of life to all and each of its members they belonged body and soul to the state justice consisted in what was profitable to the state and morality in doing the will of the state and in the worshipping of the gods of the state in the manner in which the state commanded the pride of the greek was to exalt himself in the community of freemen to leave labour to slaves and to look on the rest of the world as barbarians mr lecky justly observes that for some centuries before christianity patriotism was in most countries the presiding moral principle and religion occupied an entirely subordinate position but in what did that patriotism consist not in the care of the well-being of the people but chiefly in the pride taken in the power of the deified state and in a passionate love of extending the power of the state over other countries at whatever cost and sacrifice of blood and life perhaps says the same shrewd observer the greatest vice of the old form of patriotism was the narrowness of sympathy which it produced outside the circle of their own nation all men were regarded with contempt or indifference if not with actual hostility conquest was the one recognized form of national progress and the interests of nations were therefore regarded as directly opposed the intensity with which a man loved his country was a measure of the hatred which he bore to those who were without it these sound remarks on the broad and general facts of heathen life and government point to certain affections or rather defections that belong to all strongly developed pride humility is large free sympathetic with all life and good whether in heaven or on earth and partakes of all the good with which it sympathizes but as pride is the practical development of egotism or selfishness its necessary tendency is to isolate and contract the affections and to harden them towards all that it excludes 
but there is a corporate as well as a personal pride and this corporate pride has a strong tendency to intensify personal pride and to increase contempt for those from whom whether as individuals or corporate bodies the proud are isolated for a man augments his pride by reason of the family corporation or nation of which he is a member the heathens fed their pride on the multitude of slaves who served them and whom they looked upon as property on their superiority to the nations they conquered on their being the members of distinguished families on the rank and distinction of the corporate bodies of which they were members and on their belonging to some nation whose state was regarded as divine but all beyond that circle of humanity of which they formed a part they regarded with contempt this was their corporate pride but within those circles their personal pride had sway and often showed itself in one towards another of the same family rank or corporation in jealousy envy anger isolation hatred or contempt for pride is always seeking personal superiority distinction domination and consequently isolation st paul points to one of the grand results of the christian faith in the breaking down of the partition walls that separated the nations which as faith destroyed pride brought all men into one family and brotherhood for you are all the children of god by faith in christ jesus for as many of you as have been baptized in christ have put on christ there is neither jew nor greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for you are all one in christ galatians chapter three verses twenty six through twenty eight we must not omit egypt out of our general survey of heathen pride for out of that extraordinary country came the greatest abominations even greece derived its mythology from egypt as well as its arts and civilization herodotus tells us that greece in early times offered sacrifices to the gods but had no names for them and had never heard of their names they simply called them gods but after a long lapse of time the names of the gods came to greece from egypt at that time there was but one oracle in greece which had been established by a dark-colored egyptian who had been stolen from egypt this oracle was consulted whether they should adopt the names that had been imported from the foreigners and the oracle replied by recommending their use such is the origin of that grecian mythology which has fascinated the world on egypt we may hear mr william palmer in his preface to his egyptian chronologies the end of the false religion he observes in opposition to the true being to glorify the enemy by leading men and nations more and more astray from god and enslaving them to evil lusts this end was not only aimed at in egypt through an outward ceremonial and a powerful priesthood with the worship of almost everything except the true object of worship but it was especially sought and attained by the deification and worship of the living ruler the monarch was the keystone of the whole fabric to him the deceiving serpent the dragon to whom the religions as such belonged delegated his own seat his own power and great authority that evil character of pride ambition selfishness and cruelty which the false religion naturally formed was enthroned and deified in him as the centre of human society the source of that law and order without which society itself could not exist nor consequently its highest forms of perversion be developed the monarch was not inappropriately compared to the sun and he was not merely so compared metaphorically but he was actually worshipped as the sun-god the kings of egypt from very early times took the title of pharaoh or pharaoh 
which is the name of the sun god with the article prefixed the egyptian king meets and embraces the gods more as a brother and an equal than with any humility as a worshipper he receives from them all that can gratify his pride and ambition they give to him never-ending life and the empire over all the world they give him victory over all his enemies and put their necks under his feet and he on the other hand massacres in their presence his vile enemies and as with the people below so with the gods themselves who might seem to be above the delegation of their honour to the king as their living representative or embodiment is so complete that at the very first sight of the walls and sculptures of any egyptian temple the beholder is struck by the impression that the king its builder is not only one of the gods of egypt and of that temple but that he has a far greater share in it than all the gods to whom it is ostensibly dedicated and than all the gods of egypt put together the same blasphemous titles and the same deification and worship with temples altars sacrifices libations and incense to their honour passed from the egyptian pharaohs to the ptolemies and at length to the roman emperors in the time of herod under whom christ was born at that same time the development of sin in the world jewish and gentile had reached its height not merely were the characteristics of the old egyptian kings their tyranny cruelty and pride too faithfully repeated and on a vaster scale by the roman people whether under a popular or imperial government but in the emperors the concentrated profligacy of the heathen world boasting itself in enormities unheard of before and almost inconceivable publicly enacted and even surrounded with the forms of legality was enthroned and deified and worshipped such on a general view was the world without humility it was not merely a world without god but a world antagonistic to god to his dominion to his light to his law leviathan the monster apostate is king over all the children of pride who through his numerous satellites ruled the fallen world of man he elated their souls inspired them with the mutual hatred that broke up the brotherhood of mankind hardened them into cruelty sensualized them into the worship of the creature rather than the creator suggested they should be as gods and took all the honour to himself but the prophet isaiah proclaimed the day when the lord with his hard and great and strong sword shall visit leviathan the barring serpent and leviathan the crooked serpent and shall slay the whale that is in the sea isaiah chapter twenty seven verse one then was the weakness of the king of pride made visible before the power of the humble king god hath overthrown the power of the proud princes and hath set up the meek in their stead god hath made the roots of proud nations to wither and hath planted the humble of those nations ecclesiasticus chapter ten verses seventeen and eighteen pride crucified humility and humility arose from the dead and put an end to the dominion of pride then was the power of leviathan destroyed for a thousand years and the cross was placed on the crowns of the rulers of the world light streamed everywhere from the cross and the powers of darkness fled with broken forces now from one nation now from another and christendom was ruled by the law of christ yet pride was still left in the world for the old adam continued to produce new children of elation and though the spirits of evil were so much weakened in the presence of christ and of his servants they were allowed to range the world for the trial of the humble the victory of the faithful and the punishment of the proud from the embers of pride blown up by evil wills heresies arose and dreadful scandals 
testing the souls of men bringing out their hidden qualities perfecting the humble revealing the proud the dreadful spectacle of the world without humility that is of the world without god must necessarily bring the mind to these two conclusions first these monstrous developments of pride completely show the intrinsic malignity as well as the blinding influence of this vice of vices even as it exists in its first germs and beginnings he who has within him the fermenting germs of a life-destroying plant has only to be left to his own ways for it to grow and to expand its virulence in the spiritual system blinding the intellect corrupting the will and producing every evil in the soul st john says whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer one john chapter three verse fifteen not that he has actually destroyed his brother but he fosters the disposition that leads to destruction and has already destroyed him in his love and our lord says that the devil was a manslayer from the beginning st john chapter eight verse forty four he destroyed the spiritual life of man by pride and falsehood and gave death to his immortal body and he who fosters in himself the germs of pride until they corrupt his mind and heart destroys his own soul the second conclusion forced upon us by the actual condition of the world is this the rejection of the humility of faith and of the gospel is rapidly bringing the world at large to the old heathen conditions of thought and conduct and to the old heathen confusion of substituting the powers of the world for the sovereignty of god this is manifested in many ways again the idolatries of the modern world are in various respects more gross than the idolatries of the ancient world for the ancient world idolized nature and however erroneously still associated that nature with some ideal of the divine and ascribed divine attributions to its departed heroes but the modern idolatries are given to the gross unidealized facts and products of nature and to human inventions without having associated any divine ideal with their powers the ancient world had a sense of religion however corruptly applied and even to the heroes whom they deified they ascribed certain divine attributions but modern heathenism has dismissed every sense of the divine and has given its devotion to the bare powers and phenomena of nature or to the worship of poor fallen humanity to the deification of accumulated wealth to the veneration of mechanical inventions to the cultivation of material luxury and to the super-exaltation of pride independence and self-reliance whatever a man seeks honours or exalts more than god that is the god of his idolatry there is no need of temples altars or statues for material mental or social idolatry whatever is preferred in mind and heart to god whatever is chosen as the chief end of man's pursuit in place of god constitutes the idolatry of these times to these we must add the idolatries of the mind which bring us back to plato's theory of the end of man in the worship of ideas this has led to pantheism on the one hand and to the shallow ignorance of blind agnosticism on the other the two extreme results of intellectual pride in the opposite extreme sensual pride with its idolatries of materialism has led to the revival of the spirit of democritus and of epicurus and even to the worship of human nature impiously proclaimed to have no end beyond the grave nor ought we to omit the worshippers of that science falsely so called which excludes god from his works and is therefore devoid of the first principle of science 
and is consequently as blind and foolish as when st paul rebuked it in the heathens when the light of god is wrenched from its true position as a gift of god implanted in the mind of man and the perversity of egotism has claimed that light the testimony of god to the soul as a subjective product of the man there is no theory however absurd of which from his false position the mind of man or rather his imagination will not be capable even to the deification of his own wide erring intellect this fall from the light of truth as it descends from god has led even to the greater folly of setting up material facts for intellectual principles and thinking them strong enough to encounter and break to pieces the eternal truths which god has imparted to reason or to faith truths most perfectly adapted to the requirements of the soul the destructive influence of failing heresies that have run their time and in their decay have revealed their utter want of foundation in divine authority have done much to destroy men's confidence in the christian religion begun in the negation of authority they have decayed by developing in the direction of negation which has eaten even into the principles of natural religion and by its indifference has left free play to the action of godless science and to the influence of those numerous idolatries that have taken hold of the unreligious world modern states have certainly not claimed divinity for themselves like the old heathen governments their tendency is to discard religion as a foundation and to remove its sanctions from beneath their constitutions and laws hence their instability and the ever-growing tendency to substitute temporary expediency for the fixed principles of wisdom and the unstable voice of the multitude for the maxims of experience and the long foresight of prudence there is everywhere visible an enormous jealousy of the authority of religion over the souls of men and like the heathens of old the ambition of states is to reign alone and to have no power above their own in the world in nothing is this shown more than in those secular systems of education held in the hands of the state in which all minds shall be trained by compulsion upon the mind of the state after the fashion of the spartans leaving the rights of god and of the family out of consideration and reducing all minds to one dead level of rationalism after this dreary and desolating survey of ancient and modern heathenism one requires some christian refreshment let us turn again to the ages of faith and conclude with a parable not without a moral that old gower poetized from an ancient chronicle there was a king both young and wise the solomon of his age who took delight in putting questions that were shrewd and deeply imagined but a certain knight of his court was quick and skilful in answering them so that the king was disconcerted at this rivalry of his shrewdness so he pondered long and carefully in preparing three questions the answers to which bore a profound signification he then put them to the knight and as the sphinx propounded her riddles so he required them to be answered in a given time on pain of death the first question was this what is that which least needs help but which men help the most the second was this what appears to be of the least worth although it is of the greatest worth the third was this what is that which costs the most although it is worth the least and goes ever to utter loss but the wit of the night was of a worldly sort and after many castings about he could not penetrate to the truth hidden in these questions fearing for his life he wasted away in perplexity and grief then his daughter a virgin of innocent heart and with a mind that looked to god observed how her father pined away won his secret from him and resolved to answer the king's questions 
brought to the king's presence with eyes cast down and heart lifted up to god she said your first question o king is this what is that which least needs help but which men help the most what least needs help is the earth and yet men help it all day and every day and at all seasons of the year they dig and plough it they sow and plant and enrich the earth man and bird and beast come from the earth tree and herb and grass and flowers spring out of its bosom yet they all die and return to enrich the earth already so rich justly then may it be said that the earth has the least need of help although men help it the most the second question of your highness is this what appears to be of the least worth although it is of the greatest worth i say it is humility the which from pure love brought down the eternal son from the most high and most holy trinity unto mary chosen to receive him for her humbleness whoever is truly humble wars with no one he is peaceful in himself and would have all to enjoy the same peace much more might i say of its great worth and little cost but let this suffice the third question from the king's lips is this what is that which costs the most although it is worth the least and goes ever to utter loss i tell you that it is pride for pride could not live in heaven but in its fall brought down lucifer to hell it cost heaven to lucifer and paradise to adam pride is the cause of all our woes the whole world cannot staunch the wounds it inflicts nor wipe out its reproach pride is the head of all offence and the root of all sin wasting whatever it touches and putting nothing in the place of what it destroys pride is the sting of evil and the malignant element in all wickedness let it spring up where it will it is the most costly and worthless of all things then the king was glad because he had heard the truth from innocent lips and he laid aside his wrath end of lecture twelve part three lecture thirteen part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture thirteen on the foolish vice of vanity part one blessed is the man whose trust is in the name of the lord and who hath not had regard to vanities and lying follies psalm thirty nine verse five vanity or vainglory is the offspring of pride and the eldest daughter of that detestable vice pride is her father self-love is her mother and cobwebs are her clothing she is such a light fond thing that were it not that her seductions weaken and undermine the best formed minds and hearts both of men and women for her own sake she would be unworthy of any serious consideration a man or woman given up to vanity is filled with light follies unworthy of the dignity of the soul and the noble end for which the soul is created it may be more secret as a rule in men than in women but is not the less dishonest for that reason the objects of vanity may also be different in the two sexes not always but as the current of vanity runs with our pursuits if we compare pride in its elation to a dark swelling wave vanity is the foam upon its surface if we compare pride to a soul-destroying fire vanity is the smoke that flies out of it if we compare that worst of vices to a foul stream laden with death-giving poison vanity is formed of the bubbles that spring up from the noxious gases that mingle with the black current of pride the word vanity sounds of things hollow shallow and trifling but that is no trifle which makes the soul light and trivial and unrobes her of her dignity 
we shall better understand what vanity or vainglory is after considering the sense of the word vain that is vain which is vacant or devoid of good or which is unstable or unreliable or unsupporting or which has no rational object use motive or end that is a vain thing that fails of its purpose or that will not do what ought to be done or will not support what has need of support vanity is labor in vain and labor in vain is labor without fruit that again is relatively vain which is small trivial or empty as compared with things greater and more worthy and in this sense the sacred scriptures call all creatures as they are objects of desire vain when compared with god and all earthly goods vain as compared with heavenly goods every creature has in it a natural vanity because created from nothing and unless supported by god of its own nature it would go back to nothingness it is vain also because by the mere force of its own nature no creature can come to its final end this can only be accomplished through the action of god's providence and in intelligent creatures by the action of his grace after solomon had meditated on all things in the light of that wisdom which god had given him and had surveyed the world of humanity and all the toils and solicitudes of men for the uncertain ever fluctuating and unstable things of this world to the neglect of things eternal and unchangeable he pronounced this solemn sentence vanity of vanities and all is vanity ecclesiastes chapter twelve verse eight but before him the psalmist in his musings on many things had reached the same conclusion nevertheless all things are vanity every man living psalm thirty eight verse six and going more profoundly into the subject st paul declares that the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly but by reason of him who made it subject in hope that is to say the creature made vain in its own nature and become vainer through the fall is made hopeful for a better end especially after the resurrection when all things shall be renewed in christ this the apostle explains because the creature also itself shall be delivered from the servitude of corruption unto the liberty of the glory of the children of god for we know that every creature groaneth and travaileth in pain even till now romans chapter eight verses twenty through twenty two temporal goods are called vain as compared with spiritual goods because they are unsuited to the nature of the soul and therefore do not satisfy the mind or fill the soul because they are uncertain and apt to glide away and because they cheat the hopes entertained of them and bring not the happiness of which we are in search all things are called vain that have much show and little good that look strong and are weak that promise to be satisfying but pall upon the spiritual sense made for eternal things hence the wise solomon again exclaims i have seen all things that are done under the sun and behold all is vanity and affliction of spirit ecclesiastes chapter one verse fourteen in this relative sense the scriptures have applied the words vain and vanity to temporal good as compared with eternal to sensual delights as compared with spiritual to secular science as compared with divine to beauty of body as compared with beauty of soul to labors upon earthly motives in grief and vexation as compared with the cheerful work done for god's sake and to the multiplicity of empty words that fly from the vain glorious as compared with the few and thoughtful sentences of the wise and prudent 
the words vain and vanity are also attached in the sacred scriptures as hollow qualities to every kind of sin and to every sort of sinner for sin is vain and unsubstantial false in its motive proposing good and doing evil vain also in finding misery when seeking for content the sinner is also vain through his sin losing his foundation in grace and doing nothing to his final end like the passing wind he is unstable like the loose cloud he is unsolid like the lamp hastening to extinction he is expiring from life like some light thing suspended in the air he is tossed about by the breath of temptation the book of wisdom says all men are vain in whom is not the knowledge of god wisdom chapter thirteen verse one and the psalmist exclaims man is like to vanity his days pass away like a shadow psalm one hundred forty three verse four the habitual sinner is vain that is to say empty in many ways vain in his mind and imagination vain in his acts and conversation vain above all in his pride and presumption st paul describes the gentiles as walking in the vanity of their mind having their understanding darkened ephesians chapter four verses seventeen and eighteen and the psalmist rebukes the vanity of all sinners o ye sons of men how long will ye be dull of heart why do ye love vanity and seek after lying psalm four verse three after this universal view of vanity as contemplated in the scriptures we come to its specific character as it constitutes a special vice as pride is the inordinate appetite or love of one's own excellence vanity or vainglory is the appetite or love of making that excellence known that it may be seen admired and praised by men whether that excellence has any real foundation or is only imaginary and therefore false as vanity and vainglory are one and the same in different degrees we shall use these two words indiscriminately st bonaventure defines vanity with precision as being the love of one's own praise on account of apparent excellency when the object of vanity is to exalt oneself in the general mind it is fame when admiration is sought to be added to praise it is glory when we seek this exaltation among friends it is social reputation or it may be sought in the mind of some individual whose good opinion or praise we covet the ways of vanity are well known to be manifold and the methods by which vanity seeks to gain its ends are very numerous for it is the most subtle elastic and inventive of all human passions it is not however to be assumed that every manifestation of our gifts is vainglorious our divine lord has said let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven st matthew chapter five verse sixteen what is not done from ostentation or to attract notice praise or admiration but purely that god may be honored is not vice but virtue but the humble make no display they speak not of themselves or their good works except rarely and with careful measure and prudence they leave their works to speak without putting them forward to speak for their author our lord has said on the other hand and with much more emphasis when thou dost an alms deed sound not a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be honoured by men amen i say to you they have received their reward but when thou dost alms let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doth that thy alms may be secret and thy father who seeth in secret will repay thee and when you pray 
you shall not be as the hypocrites that love to stand and pray in the synagogues and corners of the streets that they may be seen of men amen i say to you they have received their reward st matthew chapter six verses two through five here and also in the exhibition of fasting the motive determines the vice that they may be seen of men and they have already received their reward vanity has received its vain reward vanity may be known as st thomas points out by one or more of these three conditions first when a man vainly glories in what is either wholly or partly false as when he claims for himself some good or gift or ability that he has not got or some virtue that he does not possess or some degree of excellence in these things or in learning skill or accomplishment or whatever else it may be beyond what he can justly lay claim to again if one glories in things as one's own that belong to another or that have been received from another and especially if one puts forward as one's own what has been received from god to such st paul says what hast thou that thou hast not received and if thou hast received why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received one corinthians chapter four verse seven there is a vain glory unhappily too common that boasts of wickedness that was never committed of errors never entertained or of seductions never attempted for vanity like its parent pride is voracious of all kinds of reputation and distinction that may awaken surprise admiration or envy and the vain who cannot boast of good will boast of evil this commonest kind of vanity made up of false pretensions is directly opposed to truth and sincerity as well as to humility and the sacred scriptures call such persons as practice it liars deceivers and hypocrites the greeks give a very fitting name to this vain glory and call it kenodoxia which means the acting a part like performers on the stage though without their justification they are like the jackdaw in the peacock's feathers of the fable and are as readily detected by less pretentious birds although unhappily they can seldom be dealt with in the same way so that they continue unconscious that they have made themselves ridiculous the second mark of vanity is when a man idly glories in things that are not entitled to bring him praise or honour because they are transient and corruptible and imply no merit in their owner such are personal beauty showy ornaments the merits of ancestors or other things that never came of our own virtues or labours again when the vain seek glory from the vain whose opinion has no value to confirm anything who are themselves insincere who commend but to flatter and know that what they say is worthless this is one of the common vices of society the third mark of vanity is when a man says things of himself or does acts that are not directed to any good or justifiable end neither to the honour or service of god nor to the utility or good of his neighbour nor yet to his own veritable good but are said or done solely for his own exaltation or vain glory as vanity is not directly opposed to the love of god or of our neighbour it is not in itself as st thomas observes a mortal sin but venial yet in certain cases it is combined with conditions opposed to charity that bring it under the guilt of mortal sin the first of these cases is where the matter on which a man glories is false and contrary to the reverence of god as when the king of tyre lifted up his heart and said i am god and i sit in the chair of god in the heart of the sea ezekiel chapter twenty eight verse two 
so also when a man glories in the gifts of god as though he had never received them from above again when a man glories in new and false opinions knowing them to be contrary to faith a man also sins mortally if he glories in mortal sins or seeks praise for them whether he has or has not committed them for this is to glory in the mortal offence of god of such persons the prophet isaiah says they have proclaimed abroad their sin like sodom and they have not hidden it woe to their soul for evils are rendered to them isaiah chapter three verse nine and the psalmist says the sinner is praised in the desires of his soul and the unjust man is blessed psalm nine verse twenty four the second condition which makes vanity mortal is when a man prefers the temporal good in which he glories to god of this god himself speaks through the prophet jeremias thus saith the lord let not the wise man glory in his wisdom and let not the strong man glory in his strength and let not the rich man glory in his riches but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me for i am the lord that exerciseth mercy and judgment and justice on the earth for these things please me saith the lord jeremiah chapter nine verses twenty three and twenty four the third condition in which vain glory becomes mortal is where the opinions of men are preferred to the testimonies of god this occurs in the vain glories of heresy also when men shrink and draw back from avowing the truths of faith from human respect or neglect their solemn duties to god for fear of human opinion or censure or for the sake of being thought liberal this was the case with those chief men among the jews who believed in jesus but because of the pharisees they did not confess him that they might not be cast out of the synagogue for they loved the glory of men more than the glory of god st john chapter twelve verses forty two and forty three the fourth condition that makes vain glory mortal is when the man makes it his final end and refers his works whether for or against virtue or anything he does to the final end of satisfying his inordinate appetite for fame praise or glory st augustine has set forth the evil of this vice and its undermining influence in these impressive terms to seek to be loved and feared by men with nothing else in view but the delight that this may give us is to secure a wretched life of shameful boasting instead of a life of real delight it comes largely of this that men do not love god or chastely fear him therefore it is that he resists the proud but gives his grace to the humble it is needful in the performance of certain human duties that we should be loved and feared by men and taking advantage of this the enemy of our happiness scatters among his snares the exclamations of well done well done and whilst we greedily pick them up we are caught by them and letting our delight in the truth drop from us we take our delight in the deceptive voices of men but in thus enjoying being praised and feared not for god's sake but for our own we have those with us who are like ourselves not in accord with charity but in fellowship of punishment with him who strove to imitate god in a perverse and crooked way and who served that lucifer in cold and darkness who declared he would establish his throne in the north except under the circumstances above stated vainglory or vanity is but a venial sin because however inane it is not opposed either in its object or motive to charity yet it is a habit to be contended against and shunned and suppressed by every effort as weakening to the soul undermining in its influence and shameful in its disorder 
even good works done from vanity lose their eternal reward as our divine lord teaches us and no one can obtain eternal life by sinning although the sins be venial but there is a consideration of far more gravity so grave that we shall express it in the theological words of st thomas for as much as vain glory makes a man presumptuous and excessively self-confident it disposes the soul to grievous sins and so by degrees to the loss of his spiritual goods for vain glory is a capital sin from which other vices spring and was so treated by the fathers st gregory the great who had a most profound intuition into the ways in which the vices spring out of one another puts pride and self-love by themselves as the sources of all sin and then places vain glory as the first of the capital sins cassian who reverses the order of the capital sins puts vanity or vain glory as the seventh and pride as the eighth in which he undoubtedly follows the method of the ascetic fathers of egypt in explaining the method of st gregory st thomas points out that it is not necessary for a capital sin to be mortal in itself if mortal sins spring from its influence for as he further observes mortal sins spring from venial sin when venial sin disposes the soul to mortal sin st gregory enumerates seven vicious daughters born of vanity these are disobedience boasting hypocrisy contention obstinacy discord and the presumption of novelties the descent of these vices from vainglory or vanity is thus explained by st thomas the end of vainglory is to exhibit our own excellence and we may add to assert our own superiority a man seeks this in two ways either in words and this is boasting or by acts which if true but done to excite admiration have always something new and unexpected in them which is the presumption of novelties but if these acts are false and deceptive then it is hypocrisy End of Lecture 13, Part 1there is also an indirect way of exhibiting one's own excellence by ostentatiously upholding one's equality with others or one's superiority over them a person may do this in any of four ways the first regards his intelligence and shows itself in discord sticking to his own opinion and refusing to give way even after he sees that another is nearer the truth or is altogether right whilst he is in the wrong the second regards the will and this is obstinacy when a man will not give up his own will and way for the sake of peace and agreement with others the third regards speech and this is contention when a man clamorously disputes and contends for no justifiable reason but only to satisfy his vanity the fourth regards facts and this is disobedience when for any of the above motives a person refuses to obey his superior vanity is evidently the root of every one of these vicious habits and as this same vanity springs from pride and self-love it is also evident that the one true remedy for all of them is humility there are disorders in the human frame that cause alarm because they are visible and painful to the sufferer but when the physician is called in he sees that what has caused alarm is only symptomatic of a disorder more deeply seated of which the patient is unconscious 
he therefore soothes and assuages the more sensitive and symptomatic disorder but directs his chief attention and stronger remedies to the radical disease that is more hidden well knowing that when that is removed the symptomatic disease will disappear what cures pride cures vanity and what cures vanity cures those more ostensible disorders that spring from vanity the remedy therefore will be found in humility the seven daughters of vanity have all a strong family likeness to pride with the same bad blood and the same vicious temper vanity also though of lighter carriage has this resemblance to pride that the more hidden it is the more dangerous it is it is never without some plausible pretext to cover its weakness and this is not unfrequently the entertainment instruction or good of other persons which seem to ennoble vanity with charity or it is the removal of misconceptions in doing but fair justice to oneself and so the pretext is but common justice although the real object all the while is self-glorification some persons not a few cover their outward persons with vanity in dress and manners and make themselves beacons of levity with as bad a taste socially as mentally and spiritually they hang out a sign on which this inscription is plainly legible the vanity of vainglory to be had cheaply within others more grave in outward form love to parade their knowledge or experience before it is asked for embarrassing the common right of freedom with the ventilation of their vanity others again are forward and intrusive unable to be patient until their singular merits are recognized and their superiority admitted some will tell you or would have you to think that they are too proud to be vain which is a very coarse vanity out of a pride too gross to understand its offensiveness there is a morose and apparently retiring vanity as well as a light and salient variety and the last is innocent in comparison with the first the thoughtless coquette of vanity is not by any means so bad as the calculating prude a plain exterior will sometimes cover more vanity than a gay one as sovereigns dress plainly for distinction from the brilliant circle around them but whatever the outward shows of vanity they are but symptoms of the malady within and show themselves more in manner than in material for vanity is less in show than in acts less in acts than in words less in words than in thoughts and less in thoughts than in those inward movements of self-love from which as from their secret springs all the shows of vanity proceed vanity is a light fond motion of the soul but wonderfully elastic its worst effect is that it makes the soul empty and inane for the motive of vanity rests on nothing solid on nothing that long abides neither on god nor on truth nor on justice nor even on any abiding human affection it rests not even on self in any steady way as pride does which gives it a sort of evil consistency that does not belong to vanity for in vanity a man seeks himself in the ever-shifting and uncertain opinions of other persons and is always flitting like the butterfly from flower to flower from one to another taking its colour like the chameleon from what is nearest at the time it is this extroverted and ever-changing character of vanity always under the influence of other persons opinions and ever casting about for flattery that so much weakens the prudence and judgment of the vain it may be taken as a maxim that where sound judgment and habitual tact is required it should never be looked for where vanity is the predominant weakness st bernardine of siena 
a man with vast experience of human nature as well as great spiritual insight has taken special note of this fact much he says is the malice of the vanities affecting the mind with such a weakness that when these vanities pass into the affections the whole judgment of reason is thrown into perturbation what st bernardine has so justly observed may be noted by any one who unites a little modesty of mind with observation pride as we have said has a certain evil consistency because its motive though false is within the man but vanity has its motive in other persons whom it is always endeavouring to conciliate or to draw into admiration and is therefore inclined to a compromising policy then it is always shifting its ground and is one thing to one person and another to another its object is always changing so that it has no consistent ground even of the human kind on which to rest a permanent judgment even when judgment concerns other things than vanity its motives will be constantly intruding and suggesting how this or that will look in the eyes of those whose esteem or flattery we covet thus vanity makes our judgments timid and uncertain or warps them from their just course and our conclusions are often hesitating or contrary to what is wise and just or not in accordance with the truth they take not the high ground of what is best before god but the low one of what is agreeable to men or what is most for one's own display and not unfrequently end in some compromising of principle upon the destruction wrought on our good works by vanity we may take the calm judgment of st basil a most eminent guide of souls most especially he says we must shun vainglory it will not frighten us from labour though this would be a less evil but it deprives us of the crown of labour this insidious traitress to our salvation is not easily got rid of she sets her snares in the very orbs of heaven bringing down those virtues to the earth that have their ties in heaven the good merchant of piety may have well freighted his ship with all sorts of virtue and vainglory may raise a tempest that will endanger the sinking of his precious goods he is steering his way to the supernal kingdom but if he looks back to the meaner things left behind and especially to vainglory the blasts of vanity will scatter the wealth of his soul and overset the foundation that carries his virtues when we seek rewards from men for what we have done for heaven we destroy the fruit of those labours which ought to be given to god that he may keep them and reward them but if we prefer the glory of men to the service of god and seek the vain reward of human praise we shall deservedly lose the divine reward for we have not worked for god but have hired ourselves out to men and after boasting of their reward what right have we to look to god for reward seeing that we had no intention of acting from his grace learn this truth from the gospel where christ says of those who do their works to be seen of men amen i say to you they have received their reward let us shun vainglory then that agreeable thief of spiritual wealth that pleasant enemy of our soul that moth of the virtues which eats into our good things so sweetly vainglory mingles its poison with honey and hands the fraudful cup to the minds of men that they may be filled with the vicious draught for human praise is sweet to the inexperienced when subject to vanity they think that nothing can take them from sound judgment into error yet their thoughts and judgments are so utterly perverted that whatever the multitude admire they take to be most excellent if they have little souls or rash minds 
they will be ready to accept anything whatever these wise judges of conduct think the best however evil it may be and will be eager to do what may win their praises thus vanity not only destroys good but leads to evil it is just therefore that we fix our eyes on right reason with preference and on the god who rules right reason and that we take the path on which god moves before us to lead us right if some should praise us on the way we need not take much notice of their praise except to congratulate their sound judgment but keep straight on with eyes raised to god whose praise is always just if others should dispraise this way that is no reason for us to turn back but a reason rather for compassionating their want of judgment and their mental darkness all that we have said brings us to this principle that true glory depends on the judgment of god and on the conformity of the human with the divine judgment but vainglory takes the direct opposite course and not only values the judgments of men beyond their worth but neglects to compare them with the judgments of god as expressed in the conscience and why this neglect except in the interests of self-love and pride under the influence of these fictitious interests we not only believe good of ourselves that does not exist but long for others and if possible for everybody to believe this falsehood the remedy for this disorder is unquestionably in the exercise of that most sincere of virtues which wars against pride and all its offspring and which bears the name of holy humility through the honesty of this virtue we look to the evil within us rather than to the good we judge the evil and conceal the good lest vanity corrupt the good into evil as the evil within us is true though not according to truth humility is willing that even that truth be known where the honour of god and the good of our neighbour do not forbid its being known who can tell how many vanities are united in vain glory vanity of vanities it unites a thousand vanities to the shame of human nature you have only to watch its interior movements or even its indicator the sensitive responsive tongue and it springs in light wave after wave of emotion from self-love as it is attracted by one external motive after another and with the agile play of subtle contrivances seeks to win undeserved applause and unmerited admiration nay the scenes of vanity can even be acted in solitude upon an imaginary stage before an imaginary audience where self-love will supply both the vanity and its flatterers yet vain are all these little human glories when brought to the light of conscience the ready dissolver of all such follies they are vain because their flatterers are vain and they are vain because those who accept flattery for truth are vain the subsistence of vanity is a creature of imagination for vanity is an artist of fiction and the servant of self-love but when truth steps in with its revelations it causes soreness sorrow sadness or anger yet for the sake of these fictions we become the slaves of opinion and of an opinion that is rarely sincere and that cannot judge rightly because the interior is closed against the eyes of opinion this many-tongued opinion is more capable of imagining than of judging and of feigning compliments that have no serious meaning attached to them yet on this imaginary good the vain think to grow to become better and to rise superior to their neighbours examine all this and there is nothing in it but a fantastical folly that makes us first blind next unhappy then ridiculous 
for to gain the reputation of vanity is to become a jest as nothing in human nature is so sensitive as vanity there is nothing that suffers more it is easily wounded often mortified and frequently disappointed a word from an innocent child may bring it to confusion and as vanity is a jealous and an envious vice it suffers much from the success of others hence the vain are censorious and love to pull down or to hear others pull down those who seem to be more in favour it is said in holy scripture that the perverse are with difficulty corrected this perversity belongs to the dull and the vain but especially to the vain but with the dull it is a simple want of intelligence but the vain man has such an image of his perfection before his eyes that when you point out his failings he cannot recognize them as belonging to that image give a much-needed advice especially intended for him and if there are fifty persons present he will applaud its wisdom and see its application to every one but himself give him the same advice in private and whatever be the wisdom and authority of the adviser and however kind and gentle the admonition it wounds him to the quick that any one should think of him that of which he is so utterly unconscious although everybody sees it but himself there is no armour so impenetrable to advice as the chain-mail of vanity in an ancient book on the contemplative life long ascribed to st prosper we have one of the most complete descriptions of the internal evils of vanity ever written and with an abridged summary of this description we conclude this lecture for if anything will deter from vanity it must be a knowledge of the evils that it involves vanity is the inflated affection of a soul that languishes after a variety of inane delights the vain eager after honour know not how to gain honour but are puffed with a disease of fancied excellence that is hollow morbid and restless the imperious mistress of light souls vanity has her own bland ways that are unpleasant to solid minds and when she has captivated the weak she is tyrannical to her victims to dissemble her vices she affects the virtues and often stains her mind with evil thoughts she has an appetite for those dignities that swell the vainglorious but are perilous to the weak and bitter to the perfect place her in authority and her vanity will make her imperious to her subjects yet she will be weak before the strong but will captivate the weak and enjoy their captivity she will vex the ambitious but the little-minded she will inflate and when they become inflated she will humiliate them the timid will serve her in fear the vain will flatter her with a show of worship the feeble and failing will think they stand firm under her protection this is that vice of vanity which does not strangle the virtues as some suppose but when the vicious embrace it it gives free play to their vices for vanity cannot penetrate a soul that is filled with the solid virtues what vanity tempts is the empty soul and the soul inflated with the ruinous pride of ambition and it brings them to the shame of ravening in the delight of public reputation like a ship without ballast these vain ones are tossed with every wind like the chaff blown from solid grain they are at the mercy of every breath of flattery their vanity does not so much make them vicious as show them to be vicious as they are swept round in the whirl of vain and idle affections the vain give up their weak will to every light impulse of their vanity they boast of things of which they know they are ignorant they undervalue holy persons as compared with themselves because they do the vile office of flattery to themselves 
and can see no perfection of which they are in want they love to be talked about and are not particular whether what is said of them be true or false they are fond of salutations are attentive to those who say to them pleasant things are docile to what delights them and are pleased with base things they love to teach what they do not know and to have great things believed of them and they will in words express their detestation of what in their hearts they covet deluded themselves they are grateful to those who will help their delusion and will clothe their vice with the name of virtue swift to promise they are slow to fulfil changeable in good they are tenacious in evil and can be grave in words when vile in thoughts elated in prosperity they are frail in adversity and are soon fretted when reproached and as they are immoderate in joy so are they easy-going in human things and difficult in spiritual things such is the morbid softness of vanity unconscious of its own disease and intolerant of the physician end of lecture thirteen part two lecture fourteen part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture fourteen the humility of faith part one you are the children of god by faith in christ jesus galatians chapter three verse twenty six our life begins in utter ignorance of all things and our mind is first opened by the instinctive faith that we place in those around us without this faith we could make no beginning of knowledge the simple open confiding spirit of childhood and the wonder awakened by the newness of everything enable us to learn much in a short time the first labor of learning begins with books and the reason is that printed words are mere arbitrary signs twice removed from the things that they represent but youth advances in knowledge through faith in the teacher as well as childhood we are now speaking of human faith there are three moral elements in this teachableness the first is the consciousness of ignorance which is an element of natural humility the second is the opening of the mind with submission to the teacher which is the second element of humility the third is the belief given to the teacher which is a third element of humility but the moment the scholar ceases to believe in his teacher or the disciple in his professor so soon as he begins to judge and to criticize he assumes superiority his faith is gone and he ceases to learn for he has closed his mind to the authority of the teacher if notwithstanding there is a real superiority of knowledge and wisdom in the teacher it is the pride of the pupil that has closed to him the gate of knowledge but if the pupil remains faithful to his teacher what he learns on faith will grow into knowledge through subsequent thought observation and experience this is the human way to knowledge it begins with faith and the greater part by far of every one's knowledge has no other ground than faith were a man to separate his knowledge into two parts and distinguish what he knows from his own observation or perception from what he only knows on the testimony of other men he would be amazed to find how little he knows at first hand and how much he knows upon the faith of testimony and on no other ground place the son of some wild untutored tribe by the side of the son of an educated and accomplished family in the civilized world and compare the contents of their minds the one has nothing beyond the scanty traditions of his tribe the other has the whole traditional knowledge of the human race at his service how does he acquire it chiefly on faith 
the great map of every one's knowledge rests on faith what we know not on personal knowledge we take on the testimony of those who had or who have personal knowledge we thus know history and what passes at a distance from us and what is in other men's minds and what others have seen or investigated or experienced it is upon faith in each other that the whole business of life is conducted society exists and is held together on the principle of faith and the cessation of faith in each other would be the dissolution of society the vulgar man who says that he will believe nothing but what he sees contradicts his words at every turn by his actions the man who is habitually sceptical whether from natural obtuseness or from conceit is one who ceases to learn from intolerable dullness or self-sufficiency it is important however to observe that there is a foundation in the mind itself into which all communicated knowledge is received and where it is tested and that foundation is the light of reason which god has implanted in the mind without that light we should be incapable of knowledge for as the light of the sun makes all things in the world visible the imparted light of reason makes all things in nature intelligible so that when natural truths are presented to our mind we see them in that light let us suppose that like animals we knew nothing but what we could see with our own eyes and feel with our own senses and instincts imagine this state of things but our soul has a light of its own the light of intelligence which has in it eternal and unchangeable principles and laws of justice and responsibility that go straight to the conscience and tell us of things beyond this visible world and show us that we belong to the world of spirits and lead us up to the supreme cause of all things let us suppose again that there was no such thing as faith in the world no belief of men in each other the knowledge of every man would be limited to his own observations we should know nothing of the past nothing of the distant nothing of the minds of other men nothing of their knowledge what poor shrunken things our minds would be without the help of human faith and in what a narrow circle our slow minds would move but beyond the world of nature and the reach of human reason there is another sphere of being and of knowledge which is beyond the report of our senses beyond the stretch of our natural reason and which no man living in this world has ever seen of that boundless world the boundless heavens are the visible symbol and from that boundless world come proofs into this that are accessible to reason and known to reason before columbus undertook to sail to the unknown world he had much circumstantial evidence to convince him of its existence and he knew he was nearing the unknown land by the things that drifted from its shores the testimony of god is everywhere in the light of the mind whose light partakes of the infinite and unchangeable and is everywhere the same in the voice of conscience which proclaims our responsibility to god in all times and places in the works of god around us that proclaim their almighty and intelligent cause in the action of his divine providence everywhere visible and in the general voice of mankind the natural conscience of man leads up to god and makes him sensible that god everywhere beholds his conduct men even punish the violation of the natural law where there is neither human law nor contract on the principle that every man even the most savage has the natural law written in his heart of visible things and even of rational truths we only know the human side and we feel there is a vast knowledge of them that is altogether beyond our reach there is not an insect or a blade of grass that does not present a great deal more mystery than knowledge 
and which does not awaken in us the consciousness of our ignorance who can solve these mysteries but him who made them of ourselves our nature and destiny we know little until god teaches us everywhere we meet with insurmountable bars to our inquiry and limits that repel our curiosity there must be a knowledge of all things but that knowledge is not in us everything around us stretches away towards infinity and eternity our souls touch upon that infinity but are far from being infinite our minds see eternal principles though far from being eternal and around and within us are mysteries beyond our power to understand the mind within the man has always and in all time seen the spirit within the man has always felt that the soul is immortal and that an eternal world awaits him how are we to know that eternal world or our own destiny or our duties with respect to our eternal destiny unless on the faith of testimony from that world what we know but have not seen with our own eyes in this world we know by faith on the word of those who have seen and what we know of the great invisible world we know on the word of god whose eye sees all things and whose mind knows all things by faith we know from him what without faith we can never know as the knowledge and the duties of life rest on faith in man the knowledge and the duties of religion rest on faith in god who accompanies his revelations with the demonstration of his power but revelation alone is not sufficient to establish a divine faith in man as there is a medium within us for receiving natural truth in the light of reason we require a medium within us for receiving supernatural truth and that medium is the supernatural light of faith for there is nothing proportioned between the natural man and god that can bring man into a divine communion with god until god establishes a beginning of proportion by planting in him a divine light capable of receiving his supernatural truth and as to know god truly we must be subject to god and adhere to him we need a divine strength to raise up and invigorate the will before we can either adhere to the divine truth or love the giver of it who has thus established the soul in communion with him these gifts are always ready for all who are ready to receive them what makes them unready is that pride and self-sufficiency upon which the heathens base their virtues and from which men in great numbers in these days resist the voice and authority of god when we look through the heathen world we see what man is without divine faith when we look through the modern world we see what men become through renouncing that humility of mind and heart to which the gift of faith is given outside the church of god we see nothing but an ever-shifting and restless opinion from which one truth drops after another the result of departing from that divine authority upon which faith essentially rests although divine and human faith have sufficient resemblance to justify their having a generic name in common yet the principles of divine faith are so totally different from the principles of human faith that they must necessarily be distinguished by specific names from each other hence we call the one christian or supernatural or divine faith and the other natural or human faith when men oppose themselves to the principles of divine faith they very seldom understand them but most commonly fall into the error of arguing from the principles of human faith in searching for divine truth they too often take the ground of mere human faith and apply to it a human measure it is therefore of the greatest importance to have clear views of the real principles of divine or supernatural faith 
the broad distinctions between divine and human faith may be briefly expressed in these terms human faith rests on the testimony of man divine faith on the testimony of god human faith is received and estimated by the light of the rational soul divine faith is received and estimated by a supernatural light given by god to the soul above the light of reason and without this light there can be no divine faith in human faith the man gives the assent of his will to a statement on human motives in divine faith the assent of the will is given on divine motives in human faith the assent is given on natural judgment in divine faith the will is helped to assent and adhere to the truth by the help of god's grace divinely communicated to the soul in human faith one man believes another at a distance through messengers sent with authentic tokens in divine faith god sends his messengers duly authenticated to deliver his revelation finally god sends his son exercising all the powers of divinity to deliver his final dispensation to the world and he deposited his truth and power in his church and invested it with his divine and infallible authority to preserve and to deliver that truth unchanged to men even to the end of time when we consider the vast difference between the principles of divine and the principles of human faith it at once becomes evident that the natural man cannot understand divine faith he must be prepared for it and god alone can prepare him as faith rests on external authority for its teaching and on internal grace for its belief what has to be externally sought is the authority appointed by god but what god may teach through that authority human reason cannot anticipate because revelation is above reason and beyond reason and no one by the light of nature can say what god may reveal or what he may ordain for it must necessarily be altogether different from the experience of the natural man yet at the same time suited to the human soul as the truth revealed is above all created nature and is divine the grace of god must dispose the soul for its reception and this disposition is obtained not by study but by prayer not by disputation but by humility before explaining more fully what faith is it will be well to say what it is not faith then is not a product of human thought although just thinking upon god and the soul will lead to faith it is not a work of the imagination or of sentiment it is not a thinking but a believing not an imagining because the object of faith is independent of the man and is most certain not a sentiment but a truth to which the will assents it is not opinion for opinion is uncertain and changeable whilst faith is fixed and unchangeable when a man says these are my religious opinions we know he has not faith when another says i respect your religious scruples we know he does not understand the nature of faith faith again is not hope or trust in christ this was the error of the early reformers who confounded the virtue of faith with that of hope but faith is the foundation of hope and trust for as st paul says he who cometh to god must first believe hebrews chapter eleven verse six faith believes in god and in his revelation hope and trust rest upon the divine promises revealed to faith we may consider faith in its object as it exists in god in its communication as it is received by man in its subject as it dwells in man in its action as it is exercised by man and in its fruits as it fills the soul with light and truth 
and with the knowledge of all things available for the sanctification and salvation of the soul let us first draw attention to that very precise and definite term the faith as expressive of the object of faith this term denotes that there is only one faith one body of truth revealed by god and imposed by him on the belief of man it is always one and the same one and undivided in all who have the faith although not communicated to all in the same degree or with the same expansiveness one lord one faith one baptism says st paul who unites these three unities with profound significance for the truth proceeding from the one god must be one and the way appointed to reach that truth must be one that way is baptism the one door of the one church in which the one god has deposited his truth god is one his truth is one the faith that accepts the one body of truth is one uniting all believers in one truth and the divine authority appointed to teach that one truth and to administer the grace of faith is one all these unities flow from the unity of god the truth of faith is therefore one in god one in the church and one in each of the faithful who in partaking of the one truth become united with it and so with god hence st paul describes the fruitful result of the preaching of the church to be our meeting in the unity of faith ephesians chapter four verse thirteen the object of faith is not only one indivisible body of truth but it is one and the same from the beginning to the end of time for the substance of faith is summed up in these words by the divine author and finisher of our faith now this is eternal life that they may know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent st john chapter seventeen verse three the first revelation of the mystery of redemption was made in paradise after the fall and it became a great tradition incorporated in the rite of sacrifice the same revelation was enlarged to the patriarchs the priests and religious teachers of their time it was incorporated in the law of moses and expressed in multitudinous rites and observances revealed from mount sinai to the prophets the whole mystery of christ was revealed in the fullest detail of his divinity and humanity of his birth life preaching miracles conduct sufferings death and resurrection and all this in such minute details that the prophets have been called the gospel before the gospel then came christ on earth and fulfilled what had been prophesied and believed from the beginning what god revealed from the beginning was fulfilled in the end and what he once revealed he never recalled the gifts of god are without repentance romans chapter eleven verse twenty nine the shadows of truth were absorbed into the very truth present in the world as the dawning light is absorbed in the full light of day the revelation from the beginning was not only completed but enacted by the son of god in person he deposited the whole revealed truth from the beginning and his very self the truth of truth with the apostles and the church and promised in solemn testament that both he and the holy spirit should be with his church in her teaching and ministry even until the end of the world for the profoundest reasons the development of the faith was ordained to be progressive until the coming of christ into the world and nothing can be imagined more sure or perfect than this unity of the faith in its progressive development after the fall of man for a moment all was blank and dreary with dark clouds as at the moment after the crucifixion the second great crime of humanity then the first dawn of the promise appeared in paradise 
the first rays of the revelation of christ and of his redemption to noah and the patriarchs that dawning reddened into stronger light the top of mount sinai caught the glow of the yet unrisen sun and cast it upon the children of israel as the sun of justice neared the horizon the stronger beams of light sent before him fell upon the souls of the prophets who from their mountain caves saluted him afar off and proclaimed the hour of his rising then arose the sun of truth and justice and gradually covered the earth with his splendor that light for the revelation of the gentiles and the glory of god's people was never again to set or be diminished except in the hearts of the proud and the incredulous to this day as in all days past the one church of christ having the one christ with her shines throughout the world in unbroken descent and unity of authority with the one undivided plenitude of truth most conspicuous to all men and most distinct from everything of mere human origin or institution full of charity intolerant of error intolerant of division the very perfection of this unity of truth and society ever enlarging never diminishing in one tittle of divine revelation is a stumbling block to men accustomed to nothing but their own variable and inconstant thoughts and ever-changing sentiments it is equally a perplexity to those born in sects that carry but fragments of the truth picked out by their founders from the body of revealed truths and ever-changing with the change of teachers but god is not like men his work is perfect and if a miracle is asked no greater miracle can be exhibited than to see one divine full and indivisible truth held unchangeably in the faith of men of every nation tongue and tribe of the earth whoever reflects deeply on what men are and on what this faith is must exclaim this is the work of god and it is wonderful in our eyes psalm 117 verse 23 st paul has expressed this unity of the faith of all times in these expressive words jesus christ yesterday and to-day and the same for ever hebrews chapter thirteen verse eight yesterday that is he was believed before he appeared to-day that is as he was preached by the apostles the same for ever because his truth can never change but jesus christ is all that he truly is all that he taught and all that he instituted the object of faith is god and the end of faith is god but in different ways for the object of faith is god as he is the sovereign truth who reveals the truth to us but the end of faith is god as he is the supreme good whom the truth of faith manifests to us and as he is our good the first end of faith is to make god known to us and to make known all that he has done or will do for us that what we know by faith we may desire by hope and love with charity faith is therefore the beginning of our union with god by making us partakers of his truth and that divine truth illuminates his goodness to our minds but the final end of faith is god himself we were made for union with god in his beatific vision in which as st john says we shall see him as he is one john chapter three verse two this is our final end but the first beginning of the communication of the eternal light is in faith whereby the light of divine truth is placed in us and we are placed in that light faith is therefore the first light the heralding light the foundation placed in us of what in its final perfection will be the beatific vision of god it is the beginning of the eternal ways in us the commencement of our union with god 
and is compared in the scriptures to a first espousal of the soul with god i will espouse thee to me in faith o c chapter one verse twenty it is the first thing that makes us acceptable to god for as st paul says without faith it is impossible to please god hebrews chapter ten verse six we please him by the humility with which we acknowledge him to be the fountain of truth and subject ourselves to him as the children of his truth end of lecture fourteen part one lecture fourteen part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture fourteen the humility of faith part two our divine lord calls faith the work of god this is the work of god that you believe in him whom he hath sent st john chapter six verse twenty nine he likewise calls it an attraction of god when doubts were raised among his hearers about his saying that he had come down from heaven he said to them murmur not among yourselves no man can come to me except the father who has sent me draw him st john chapter six verses forty three and forty four st paul also calls faith the gift of god by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves for it is the gift of god ephesians chapter two verse eight it is the first great gift to the soul and the preparation for all the rest but faith is informal and imperfect without the gift of charity which quickens it into life and gives to it form and perfection hence st paul says we in spirit by faith wait for the hope of justice for in christ there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision but faith that worketh by charity galatians chapter five verses five and six for what avails it to know god unless we love him it will only serve to our condemnation faith without charity is dead as st james teaches who therefore requires the works of charity to prove the life of faith st paul has described faith in these words now faith is the substance of things to be hoped for the evidence of things that do not appear hebrews chapter eleven verse one the word substance is here open to two senses both in themselves true and both beautiful if we consider faith as it dwells in us then as the commentators observe we must give to the word the hebrew sense of foundation as the bones are the foundation of the body the truths of faith in the soul are the firm foundation in us of the things to be hoped for for the light of those truths believed though not seen is a reflection of the things that we hope for but if we consider these truths objectively as they are in god and of which the image is in a certain way in the light of our faith they are the light reflected from the substance of things in god for which we hope but which in the time of faith we cannot see until faith is absorbed in the vision of god st paul has himself explained this word substance a few sentences before where he says to those who have suffered the loss of their earthly substance for the faith knowing that you have a better and a lasting substance do not therefore lose your confidence which hath a great reward for faith is necessary for you that doing the will of god you may receive the promise hebrews chapter ten verses thirty four through thirty six this would seem to indicate a substance not yet received but which remains to be received the substance or object of faith as it dwells in god 
yet there is a certain subsistence of these things in the soul in the faith that gives us the firm conviction of them and this st paul describes as the evidence of things that do not appear the greek word elenkos used by st paul is much stronger than the word argument used in the vulgate or the word evidence used in our version it signifies a convincing argument demonstration or proof this proof or conviction is contained in the three elements of faith already described the first is the light of faith in the mind which is thus described by st paul god who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of christ jesus but we have this treasure in earthly vessels that its excellency may be of the power of god and not of us two corinthians chapter four verses six and seven the second is the outward teaching of the church delivering to us the form of sound doctrine that accords with the inner light of faith received in baptism the third element is the inward grace by the help of which the will adheres firmly to the truths of faith and st basil defines faith to be the unhesitating and approving assent given to the truth of the things proposed by the divine gift these elements of submission to divine authority and of inward light and grace helping adherence to the truth revealed constitute that inward subsistence of truth in the soul that firm and assured proof captivating the mind and make those things for which we hope and which we desire already to be after a certain manner in the mind and the heart for we already see them as st paul says darkly as through a glass being even now conscious of their existence the substance of things to be hoped for says st bernard is no fantasy of things inane the word substance will not allow you to take liberties with the faith to dispute at will or to wander here and there among vain opinions and diverging errors the word substance implies what is fixed and certain it fixes you within certain bounds and keeps you enclosed within certain limits for faith is not opinion but certainty whilst then the things that we hope for have not their substance in the soul but in god they have a subsisting foundation in the soul in their light grace and truth and st thomas has expressed this in his definition of interior faith as being an act of the mind essentiating the divine truth through the ascent of the will moved by grace the great theologian explains this by a similitude the things to be hoped for are like a tree still hidden in the virtue of the seed through faith they already exist in us in a certain way as the tree exists in a certain way in the seed or we may use this comparison a certain beaming into our eyes of light reflected from mountains in the distant horizon gives us an obscure impression of them and travellers from that region give us a detailed information respecting them we know then that they are no mere clouds or illusions because they abide always and are always the same so in a general light given to our minds we see the objects of faith which we know in their clear and certain outlines and distinctions from the testimony of god in the teaching of his church the more we give our mind and will to them the more do they grow upon us become clearer and more vivid harmonizing most beautifully with each other and also with the wants and desires of the soul so that they are constantly infusing greater light and serenity a joy in the truth a consolation in believing a calm peace and a great hope and this hope and serenity grow in proportion to the conformity of our life with the faith revealed to our conscience after st paul has described the heroic faith of the great saints of the old testament he says of them 
all these died according to faith not having received the promises but beholding them afar off and saluting them and confessing they are pilgrims and strangers on the earth for they that seek these things do signify that they seek a country hebrews chapter eleven verses thirteen and fourteen but to us who have the grace of christ and his very presence these things are not afar off they are nigh and even at our doors the sublime effect of christian faith is to make living and present to us the eternal mysteries of christ which are perpetually renewed in the body of christ which is his church and all the faithful partake of them and they become the living things of our heart and of our love the soul of the faithful one is actually clothed with christ as st paul intimates in various places he says as many of you as have been baptized in christ have put on christ galatians chapter three verse twenty seven and to the romans the apostle says put ye on the lord jesus christ romans chapter thirteen verse fourteen and elsewhere he speaks of the faithful as having the sense of christ one corinthians chapter two verse sixteen but they who have the sense of christ are not far from him the grandeur of those divine things that are in such contact with us that though we see them not in open day we feel them close upon us cannot fail to make us sensible how utterly unworthy we are of the divine condescension and goodness like the saints of old we feel ourselves strangers and pilgrims in this low and sensuous world but unlike them who could only salute the eternal mysteries from afar we feel that nothing but the yet unregenerated body that invests our soul and the stains upon the soul keep us back from beholding them in open day and we are inclined to exclaim with st paul unhappy man that i am who will deliver me from the body of this death romans chapter seven verse twenty four we will now give two descriptions of the faith one from a very early writer of the church in which we may contemplate its sublimity another from the authoritative catechism of the council of trent in which we may consider its practical value but let me first invite the reader to reflect on the origin of all truth the eternal word of the father is the personal truth he is the enlightener of all intelligences and the revealer of all truth who revealed the mysteries of god to the angels and then to man he revealed all truth that was made known to man from the beginning and then he took the form of man to perfect his revelation he is the light of the truth of all things heavenly and earthly and gives reason to man and to the humble man the light of supernatural truth he enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world and when he described himself he said i am the light that hath come into the world st john chapter one verse nine and chapter twelve verse forty six after a preface on this character the book on the divine names proceeds as follows god the word who is the very truth is the infallible knowledge of all things but divine faith is the abiding firmament of the faithful founding them in the truth and the truth in them so that the faith of truth becomes one with those who believe even as iron placed in the fire becomes one with the fire and operates as the fire operates for faith is said to act as well as those who hold the faith and who believing in a certain knowledge that is simple have no division whatever and no doubt because knowledge unites the things known with those that know them whilst ignorance is the cause of division with the ignorant nothing therefore can move him who believes in the truth from the household and firmament of the faith but according to the apostle he who is in the darkness of ignorance fluctuates in error 
and is carried about by every wind of the wickedness of men like those who are tossed in a tempest and they imagine that those who possess this knowledge are out of their senses as festus said to st paul when he heard him preaching the truth much learning hath made thee mad but the christian is one who knoweth christ and hath through him the knowledge of god he hath the one knowledge of truth this knowledge is outside the world being by no means concerned with the science of the world or the errors of unbelievers and knows itself to be sober and free from wide wandering infidelity wherefore they who have this knowledge die daily for the truth and are not only daily in peril of death for the truth but as approved christians they die to ignorance and live to knowledge from the catechism of the council of trent we select the following paragraphs as conveying a solid instruction as the end proposed to man is his beatitude and as this end is far above the reach of his natural understanding he stands in need of receiving knowledge from god this knowledge is faith whose virtue causes us to hold firmly to that which god has delivered and which the church sets forth for as god is the very truth the faithful can have no doubt of those things of which he is the author from this we understand the great difference there is between the faith we give to god and that which we yield to the writers of profane history but though faith has a vast comprehension it differs in its degree and dignity in different persons for in the sacred scriptures it is said to one o thou of little faith why dost thou doubt and to another great is thy faith and others pray increase our faith and it is also said faith without works is dead yet these different degrees of faith are of the same kind and are included in the same definition nothing contributes more to confirm our faith and to strengthen our hope than to keep our mind fixed on the truth that nothing is impossible to god for after understanding the omnipotence of god we readily and without hesitation assent to whatever he proposes to our belief however great however wonderful however above the order and measure of nature nay more for the greater the truths proposed by the divine oracles the more readily the mind assents to them and if any great good is to be expected the greatness of the gift will not discourage the soul for she is animated and strengthened with the reflection that there is nothing which god cannot do with this faith should we strengthen ourselves whenever we have any great work to do for god or for the service of our neighbor or when we ask some great favor of god in prayer our lord has taught us the first of these lessons in rebuking the slow faith of his disciples if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed you shall say to this mountain remove from hence to yonder place and it shall move and nothing shall be impossible to you the other lesson st james has insisted on let him ask in faith nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea that is moved and carried about by the wind therefore let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the lord the faith also brings with it many advantages in the first place it forms the soul to modesty and humility according to the word of the prince of the apostles be ye humbled under the mighty hand of god it admonishes us to fear nothing where no cause exists for fear and therefore to fear god alone for our saviour says i will show you whom ye shall fear fear ye him who after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell by this faith we also recognize and honor the benefits of god to us for whoever thinks on almighty god can scarcely be so ungrateful as not to exclaim he that is mighty 
hath done great things to me as humility is the receptive foundation of the christian virtues and faith their positive foundation humility must precede faith for the obstacle to faith is pride and pride is removed by humility which is the first disposition of return to god then faith is by its very nature a subjection of the mind and will to god as he is the sovereign truth a subjection to his divine authority as the illuminator and teacher of the soul and the subjection to the truth which he teaches by revealing moreover as a test and trial of this subjection to him god is pleased to require that this subjection of faith shall be openly made and manifested before all men by our open submission to the church which he has appointed to represent his authority and to the voice of her teaching and to her ministry of grace as exercised in his name and by his power this is not only faith but the humility of faith because it is the subjection of the mind and heart to the authority of god and to his truth in the way that he imposes and prescribes adam first lost his humility and then his faith he first aspired to be as god in knowledge and then disbelieved the command of god humility must remove pride and open the soul that the grace of faith may enter the grace of faith subjects the soul that the light of faith may illuminate the soul this order of returning to god is vividly exhibited in the order in which the catechumen enters the church he is first subject to a twofold discipline that of humility and that of instruction for this reason st cyril of jerusalem in instructing his catechumens on the nature of faith warns them that humility is the key of knowledge an expression also used by st augustine the catechumens were kept for a considerable time under a humble discipline they held the position of humble petitioners for the faith they took the last place in the assemblies of the faithful and were commanded to withdraw during the celebration of the divine mysteries when after due probation they were admitted to baptism they were asked what they sought of the church of god and they replied that they petitioned for faith they are then submitted to exorcisms to expel the proud spirit of evil before receiving the illumination of faith the whole process plainly shows that the grace of humility is the preparation for the grace of faith but when faith is received with hope and charity they perfect the grace of humility what prevented such numbers of those who followed our divine lord and attracted by curiosity heard his words and saw his mighty power in his miracles from believing in him our lord himself has proclaimed the three causes of their unbelief their pride their love of this world's interests and their human respect and he proclaimed the two conditions which would alone enable them to follow him as disciples and to become members of his kingdom these were humility and self-abnegation he says unless you become as little children you shall not enter into the kingdom of god st matthew chapter eighteen verse three and blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven st matthew chapter five verse three after a terrible rebuke to the cities on the lake of gennesaret and after all his miracles worked in the midst of them they had not humbled themselves and done penance that they might receive his truth christ turns to his heavenly father and says i confess to thee o father lord of heaven and earth because thou hast hidden these things from the wise and prudent and hath revealed them to little ones st matthew chapter eleven verse twenty five those cities were commercial in which men were absorbed in traffic and gain 
and he speaks of the worldly prudent and the wise in their own conceit from whom the light of truth was hidden even when present before their eyes and of the simple and humble as the little ones to whom that light was revealed both heard the truth from the mouth of god both saw the miracles of god but the souls of the humble were open to his light and the souls of the proud were closed when jesus healed the sick man in jerusalem who had been five and thirty years on his bed of infirmity it was the sabbath day and for this reason the jews persecuted him and when justifying his healing on the sabbath day he said my father worketh until now and i work they sought to kill him because he said god was his father making himself equal to god then he said to them rebuking their unbelief i know you that you have not the love of god in you i am come in the name of my father and you receive me not if another shall come in his own name him you will receive how can you believe who receive glory one from another and the glory which is from god alone you do not seek st john chapter five verses forty two through forty four christ is speaking to the doctors of the law to the men revered in israel and he points to their own hearts for the cause of their unbelief they sought not god but themselves not his glory but their own the parable of the sower who sowed his seed is professedly the parable of faith the rocky ground on which the seed withered up is the soul that is obdurate with pride where faith cannot strike root the thorny ground is that in which faith is choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of life and yields no fruit st luke chapter eight verses five through fifteen these two obstacles are removed the first by humility the second by self-abnegation end of lecture fourteen part two lecture fourteen part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture fourteen the humility of faith part three faith demands a certain elevation of the sentiments as st chrysostom observes and a certain energy of soul to surmount the impressions of the senses and to triumph over the proud ignorance of human reason there is no true faith but what rises above the prejudices of custom what can be so magnificent to a creature still tied to earth and earthly sense and earthly ways as to live mentally in a sphere of divine truth invisible to mortal eyes and in that vast sphere of light whatever its shadows of obscuration to tread the secure firmament of truth with the movements of his mind and wing his thoughts upwards from earth to heaven from light to light from truth to truth from mystery to mystery in the wonder of his soul his heart ever following his mind with love and veneration what so sublime to him as the meditations of faith where whilst the body still holds to its native earth the spirit soars to heaven and his faith converses with the father the son and the holy spirit looks up with awe unto the glorious majesty of god and aspires with hoping love unto his infinite goodness and clemency and the heart is purified by every ray of descending light and expanded with every grace from the eternal love faith looks with lucid eyes upon jesus christ the author and finisher of our faith now glorified in our human nature at the right hand of god faith looks upon him executing his mission of salvation to the world now listening to his divine words and opening the heart that they may sink with his light into its depths 
now gazing upon the awful spectacle of his passion and crucifixion inexhaustible in its depths of mystery and grace to faith and love and gratitude there we behold the living door to the eternal sheepfold through which all who are saved must pass and his wounds are as the open gates through which we have access to his spirit and his life i am the alpha and omega the first and the last the beginning and the end blessed are they who wash their robes in the blood of the lamb that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in by the gates into the city apocalypse chapter twenty two verses thirteen and fourteen faith also contemplates the son of god ever present in his church serving in this world of trial enlightening her with his eternal light and quickening her life with his spirit and partaking of his light the faithful soul partakes also of his crucified spiritualized and glorified body the sacrament of life in which the plenitude of the godhead dwells united in communion of light and charity with the angels and saints and with all believing souls whom the light of christ embraces the faithful soul is conscious of being within this vast communion of prayer that extends from the hearts of the poor on earth to the spirits of the seraphim that burn in love and adoration before the eternal throne of god and is conscious too that we like them are the children of god the brethren of christ and the heirs of heaven o wonderful faith embracing our spirits with the divine light wonderful light sealing our souls with the seals of eternal truth wonderful truth setting our souls free from the petty confines of this world and opening the eternal heavens to our contemplation wonderful heavens in which is the supreme good for which our souls are made the soul filled with the light of faith is filled with christ and with the father and in that soul the holy spirit spreads his love and whilst the wonder of what the soul contemplates in faith grows ever more and more the wonder grows less and less that men of faith should leave all things for god and should even cheerfully give their mortal lives to martyrdom that their faith may be changed more quickly into vision as faith rests not on human reason or judgment but is imposed on man by the authority of god and is received in humble obedience to that sovereign authority even before we know by full possession the magnificence of the gift we must expect to find it taught in the holy scriptures from this point of view accordingly st paul calls the assent of the will to faith the obedience of faith romans chapter sixteen verse twenty six and st peter calls the faithful the sons of obedience one peter chapter one verse fourteen st paul says to the romans we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith in all nations for his name romans chapter one verse five and he asks the galatians who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes jesus christ hath been set forth crucified among you galatians chapter three verse one to the corinthians the apostle rises into more elevated language to display the power of faith the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty to god unto the pulling down of fortifications destroying councils and every height that exalteth itself against the knowledge of god bringing into captivity every understanding unto the obedience of christ two corinthians chapter ten verses four and five the weapons of the church are the truth the grace and the virtue of christ the powers to be overcome are the strongholds of unbelieving science the counsels of worldly wisdom 
and the pride that lifts itself against the knowledge of god the capacity of the understanding in the obedience of faith is a deliverance from the captivation of error to the captivation of truth as the apostle says in another place of the work of christ he led captivity captive he gave gifts to men ephesians chapter four verse eight the whole language of the sacred scriptures indicates that faith is a humble submission of the mind as well as of the will to the eternal wisdom and reason of god yet not a blind or compelled submission but a free enlightened willing and contented submission as all but who have the unspeakable gift of faith know by experience st jerome says with great truth that it is ridiculous for a man to dispute the faith before he possesses it he may dispute on the evidences that lead to faith but what faith itself is as it rests on light and grace in the soul he cannot understand before experience how can he understand the power of that abiding grace that lifts the will to the divine light in the mind embracing the greatest of all truths without study or effort yet with a free and grateful adhesion how can he understand the wonderful harmony that reigns between the truth taught and the light within the mind how can he understand the marvellous facility with which children baptized in their infancy so soon as their minds are opened drink in the expositions of faith as though their nature assisted them yet it is not their nature but their supernatural light and grace that prepare their mind and will the first two chapters of the catechism contain the profoundest questions that have ever engaged the mind of man and are what human science would call the most abstruse metaphysics and yet the catholic child can enter into them with intelligence can hold them firmly in their order and sequence and give a clear account of them whilst the man without faith however well trained will labor in vain to make them a part of his intelligence why but because he wants the humility of faith and his mind is not open to them why but because he is striving to measure the divine reason and truth with his own small measure of reason why but because he never reflects that truths that are so great and so high above the scope of his native mind can only be received by submission to their author and must be believed that the soul may possess them before she can understand them for unless you believe you shall not understand isaiah chapter seven verse nine but when faith is established in the soul it illuminates the reason with its divine light and reason obedient to the light of faith devotes its own light to the service of faith as a loyal and devoted servant for these two lights which have one and the same origin though they come to us by different ways reunite in the soul and from their union has sprung the most magnificent of sciences the science of theology this cooperation of reason with faith has been admirably explained in the authoritative words of the council of the vatican which we here translate the perpetual consent of the church of god hath held and doth hold that there are two orders of knowledge which are not only distinct in their principle but in their object in their principle because we know the one by reason and the other by divine faith and in their object because beyond those things that can be reached by natural reason there are the mysteries hidden in god which are proposed to our belief and which we could not know unless they were divinely revealed to us wherefore the apostle testifies that god was known to the gentiles through the things that are made but in speaking of the grace and truth that is made through jesus christ he says we speak the wisdom of god in a mystery a wisdom that is hidden 
which god ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew but to us god has revealed them by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of god one corinthians chapter two verses seven through ten and the only begotten son confessed to the father because he had hidden these things from the wise and prudent and had revealed them to little ones but when reason is illuminated by faith and seeks diligently piously and soberly it obtains by the gift of god a certain knowledge of the mysteries which is most fruitful as well from the analogy with things that are naturally known as from the connection of these mysteries with one another and with the final end of man yet is never able to comprehend those truths as in their own nature they exist for in their own nature the divine mysteries so far exceed the created intelligence that even when delivered by revelation and received by faith they are still covered with the veil of faith and remain concealed within a certain darkness so long as in this mortal life we are absent from the lord for we walk by faith and not by sight thus whilst faith is far above opinion because the truths of faith are known to us as most certain fixed and unchangeable it is beyond the comprehension of science from the very nature of the truths revealed and the limitations of the human intellect also because it is a part of the design of god that faith should be our probation before we are rewarded with the divine vision yet as we have seen faith is not without knowledge and the knowledge increasing with the growth of faith and piety we know in part says st paul but however much we know we can never comprehend for how can the human mind encompass the infinity of god or take the measure of divine and eternal things and what we know is not the cause but the effect of faith the fruit which the divine revelation produces in the soul commenting on the words of christ you shall know the truth st augustine asks did they not know the truth when the lord spoke it to them but if they knew how did they believe it they believed it not because they knew it but they believed that they might know it for what we shall know neither eye hath seen nor ear heard nor hath it entered into the heart of any man to conceive what is faith but to believe what you do not see but to know the truth is to see what you have believed faith is in its nature catholic or universal that is to say it extends to all the truth that god has revealed and which the church of christ teaches from his divine authority for it is not what a man chooses but what god imposes that forms the body of faith and constitutes its integral object and what a man may not know explicitly from want of instruction he believes implicitly because he accepts the whole revelation of god without distinction the divine faith is parallel in this respect with the divine law which forms a part of the faith the creed is a law of obedience as well as the decalogue and both rest on the same divine authority st james teaches that whosoever shall keep the whole law but offend in one point is guilty of all st james chapter two verse ten the reason is that he offends against that principle of justice and that authority of god on which the whole law rests and from which every point of law proceeds so that he who grievously offends in one point offends against the principle of justice and the authority of god and consequently loses the grace of justice and the friendship of god so also is it with the law of faith to reject one point of doctrine revealed by god and proposed by the church of christ is to reject the principle on which faith is founded 
and is a rebellion against the authority of god so that he who disbelieves one point is guilty of all in other words as he who sins grievously in one point has lost all justice he who disbelieves in one point has lost all faith for this reason the apostles called those who accepted some points of their teaching and rejected others by the name of heretics which translated from greek into english signifies choosers for these men set their own private judgments above the authority of christ and of his church and thrust their natural reason into the revelation of god from which they choose some things and reject others reducing faith to human opinion and destroying the very principle of faith but who hath known the mind of god who can say what is truth with him who can dictate to the eternal truth and say to him this i will allow to be thy truth but this i shall not allow we hear much outside the church about the beauty of a simple creed by which is meant a small low creed that contains much of the reason of man and little of the reason of god and bears all the marks of human construction on its visage but these makers of simple creeds forget that the more truth and the higher the truth the more simplicity that the greater of all beings is the most simple of all and that the more truth the more liberty although we must grant that it requires more humility in creatures so far beneath that truth for the difficulty is not in the truth but in the disposition of the soul to receive the truth what gives freedom to the soul our lord tells us the truth shall set you free st john chapter eight verse thirty two but these choosers think that the less truth the more freedom more freedom from humility certainly for as david says in thy truth thou hast humbled me psalm one hundred eighteen verse seventy five for the greater above our nature the truth revealed to us the less we feel ourselves to be again then we ask what gives freedom to the soul not less truth but more truth provided we enter into it it is ignorance not truth that destroys freedom every increase of truth enlarges the soul and increases her freedom for her liberty is proportioned to the extent and greatness and elevation of the truth in which the soul can live and move and grow you might as well think of cutting off some of a man's limbs to perfect his body or of taking out some of his faculties to perfect his soul as to take away portions of divine revelation to perfect the creed this is the process of heresy applying human criticism to divine things which necessarily ends in negation and protest for it is the measuring of infinite things with finite intelligence but that very intelligence tells us that we must expect god to say what we cannot comprehend and to do what we could not anticipate the incarnation and the cross are the answer to everything there are not a few persons who would find it equally agreeable to their natural inclinations to choose a simpler code of law out of the decalogue but the cry of conscience and of human law is too strong to allow of this yet even to this has the cry of atheism reached in these unbelievable times so true it is that the destruction of faith leads to the destruction of morality and all in the name of freedom but the eternal truth has said if you continue in my word you shall be my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free st john chapter eight verses thirty one and thirty two if god has exhibited to us the riches of his truth and the wealth of his grace to make us partakers of his inexhaustible goodness 
if he has offered us such an abundant provision of means for perfecting our souls and bringing us to his kingdom that it rivals and even exceeds the copious provisions of his providence for our earthly life who are we that we should refuse his divine generosity who are we that we should pick and choose select and reject among the divine gifts of the omnipotent goodness who or what are we that we should say god can do this but he cannot do that who are we to prescribe bounds to the power wisdom and generosity of god what right have we to judge after god who alone knows what we are what we want and what we ought to be or to determine for ourselves what he alone can determine namely the conditions on which he will receive us to eternal life it was after contemplating the state of unbelief in which all men were included that the mercy of god might reach all through faith that struck with the withering poverty of that unbelief by the side of the wealthiness of faith st paul exclaimed o oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and of the knowledge of god how incomprehensible are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways for who hath known the mind of the lord or who hath been his counsellor or who hath first given to him and recompense shall be made him for of him and by him and in him are all things to him be glory for ever romans chapter eleven verses thirty three through thirty six god has given his great revelation that he may be glorified in the souls of men but the unbelievers refuse him this glory what is the revelation of the holy trinity but the manifestation of the life of god what the revelation of his eternal word but the manifestation of his infinite truth but he is also revealed as the giver of light to all intelligences what is the revelation of his holy spirit but that of his infinite love and sanctity but he is also revealed as the giver of grace and sanctity to angels and to men what is the open and visible incarnation of the son of god but the crowning of his creation and the recovery to its divine end of an intelligent creation lost to god what is it to believe in christ but to believe all that he is in his divine and human nature all that he has taught all that he has done for us and all that he has ordained and provided for our salvation and sanctification christ is not divided he was divided on the cross for our redemption but he lives for ever and can be divided no more whoever attempts to divide his authority his truth his sacraments or his church divides not christ but divides himself from christ humility then is the groundwork of faith and faith the groundwork of the other christian virtues which are all exercised in the light of faith humility frees the soul from pride and error faith fills her with light and truth humility opens the soul that faith may enter humility brings us to the knowledge of ourselves and faith to the knowledge of god but the knowledge of god brings so great an increase to the knowledge of ourselves when we use that knowledge rightly that humility may be said to rest on faith as much as faith rests on humility so that as st chrysostom remarks humility is the inseparable companion of faith and indeed it is that element in the virtue of faith that subjects the mind to god and to his truth and then faith becomes the eye of humility for it opens to us such a view of god and of divine and eternal things above and beyond us and shows us to be so little so poor and defective by the contrast that we are led to exclaim with the psalmist in thy truth thou hast humbled me psalm one hundred eighteen verse seventy five 
and as the light of faith illuminates the creature as well as the creator and shows us the horrors of error and vice as well as the splendors of truth and justice and gives us the power to see and to weigh the value of all things from the divine point of view faith dispels our errors and rectifies our judgments faith therefore both exalts and humbles us it exalts us in the light of god in the knowledge of what god is to us and in the knowledge of our noble destiny it humbles us in the sight of our nothingness apart from the mercy grace and providence of god but to quote the great saint leo the force and wisdom of faith is the love of god and of our neighbor for charity is the life of faith and faith is the light of charity but each illuminates the other for whilst faith gives its luminous truth to charity charity gives its fire an ardent sense of god to faith and so faith works by charity for charity gives its force to the will to cleave to the truth of god for the love of god faith is the end of the divine incarnation and god is the end of faith humility is the counterpart of faith in the soul and charity is its perfection wherefore let us cultivate humility that we may have a larger soul for faith and charity and faith that we may have a greater light from god and deeper knowledge of the eternal mysteries and charity that we may obtain the fruit of faith and humility through the closer union of our soul with god but faith is cultivated by prayer and by meditation and by contemplation and by living and thinking and acting in the light of faith and in the presence of god end of lecture fourteen part three lecture fifteen part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture fifteen on the schools of humility part one take fast hold of discipline leave her not keep her for she is thy life proverbs chapter four verse thirteen every science is founded upon certain fixed and unchangeable principles of truth and is guided by rules that spring from those principles the science of humility rests upon the knowledge of god and of oneself it fills the whole distance between the creature and the creator the giver of this science is god whose light descends into our interior and shows us what we are in his sight and what we ought to be but though divine in the origin of its light it is the most human of sciences inasmuch as it teaches us the knowledge of ourselves that most difficult knowledge which men are most reluctant to enter upon the fundamental facts of this science are the spiritual nature of man considered as he is made for god and god himself as he is the object and the end of man its principles arise from the subjective relations of the human soul to the light the grace and the bountiful providence of god humility not only implies a certain just truthful and reverential demeanour towards god and towards all that belongs to god but it is intimately concerned with the purification of the soul for which it is the essential disposition and preparation but the principle of this purification is the light and the grace of our divine redeemer who purifies the mind from error and delusion with an ever-growing light of faith and the heart from pride and sin with an ever-increasing grace proportioned to the increasing humility of the subject soul finally humility is the essential counterpart to that love of god to that sanctity of soul and wisdom of life 
of which the holy spirit is the animating principle hence the science of humility is profound descending as well as ascending beyond the sphere of human comprehension for the depths of the soul are unfathomable and the heights of god are unattainable in this day of probation we must therefore learn the great laws of humility from god who has sent us his son to teach them who is himself their great example and whose cross is lifted up as the beacon flame of his doctrine over the whole troubled sea of human life the rules that guide the science of humility spring from all the relations that ought in justice to exist between the soul and god the first of these relations is the absolute dependence of the creature on her creator the second is the relation of the intelligent image of god towards its divine original the third is the relation of justice which our divine redeemer has re-established by his grace between the fallen spirit of man and the sanctifying spirit of god the fourth is the relation of human subjection in all things to the divine power bounty and supremacy the fifth is the relation of utter need and want on the part of the soul towards her divine illuminator and provider who gives to all according to the measure of humility with which they own and confess their wants the sixth is the relation of humble self-surrender in reverential faith and love to him who is our everlasting good and the seventh is the relation of gratitude to him who has given to our native poverty all that we have there is one unrivalled master in every science and our lord jesus christ is the supreme master of humility but the science of humility is not humility the science only provides the knowledge and the rules for its exercise humility is a virtue and belongs to practice it is a divine art or discipline exercised in the deeper regions of the soul an athletic training of the soul to fundamental sincerity and just bearing towards god and herself and it implies three things abstention endurance and right action of the spiritual powers according to the best rules and examples by this discipline the soul is opened enlightened purified and invigorated to act with freedom in the gifts of god every art and system of discipline has its great schools which preserve its best traditions use its best methods produce its great examples and send forth its best teachers the more important and difficult the art or discipline the greater is the need of maintaining those schools for the general benefit as well as the advantage of their disciples but the most difficult of all human habits and exercises to understand thoroughly and acquire perfectly is that of humility and as the well-being of the soul depends on its acquirement it is the most important the church has therefore her great schools of humility in her monastical and religious institutions they may be properly called the schools of the beatitudes devoted as they are to the methodical cultivation of the divine counsels that were delivered to mankind by the son of god they are founded on the virtues of humility and charity their system of training is based upon humility and their discipline is perfected in the exercise of that virtue whose spirit pervades the beatitudes as it begins with the first of them and whose true disciples are the choice and privileged portion of the church of god clearly provided for in the gospel anticipated in the schools of the prophets and traceable in their principle to the apostolic times these schools of humility took definite shape form and expansion so soon as the church was freed from the pressure of heathen persecution they were perfected by men of great genius and high sanctity 
who reduced the maxims of the perfect life to system and rule and from these rules of discipline inspired by the genius of saints the great religious orders arose in the church in the earlier ages of christianity men and women of whom the world was not worthy in their love of god and of justice withdrew from the world as did the prophets and their disciples took refuge in solitary places and there under the direction of the wisest of their number obtained great lights on the interior ways of the soul and a vast experience in the best methods of subjecting the body to the soul and the soul to god the number of these ardent souls who in the fervent times of transition from paganism to christianity gave themselves wholly to god was very great and their profound experience in the ways of god in souls their shrewd maxims and heroic examples preserved with much care have been a great spiritual light to all subsequent ages then st basil arose to perfect the form of spiritual life in the east and st benedict in the west and their rules have been the models of religious discipline to all subsequent ages the religious life matured like all great things in solitude and silence after its vigorous and fervid youth had reached a matured constitution was henceforth called upon to do a great work in the church of god men trained in these schools of humility were placed on the episcopal thrones and even in the chair of peter and became fathers of the church and great authorities in the spiritual life monasteries spread over the desolated world and with their spiritual and corporate solidity encountered the barbarous tribes that overthrew the roman empire converted them to christianity and replaced the lost civilization of the old world with the new one based wholly on christian principles and the old pagan languages ceased to live that the new ones imbued with christian sense and sentiment might providentially take their place thus that spiritual force and discipline that had silently grown to maturity for ages abiding in the strength of its discipline reconquered the world to christ and the church in the thirteenth century when through a powerful combination of secular influences the ministry of the church had lost much of its spirit and energy the religious life arose in new forms and restored vigor to the church retaining the spirit and much of the letter of the old monastic discipline and fed on its traditions new orders arose in the church who evangelized the people in humility and poverty or devoted themselves to the revival of sacred learning these orders were fertile in saints as the old ones in their fervor had been and under their holy guidance many of all classes of the population took the way of perfect life and the third orders of these great schools of humility became the popular schools of sanctity in the sixteenth century when heretical desolation invaded the world in forms that struck at the foundation of all spiritual authority another combination of the monastical with the clerical life arose to reinvigorate the church in the various institutions of regular clerics of which the society of jesus was the most conspicuous they still however looked back to those earlier schools of humility to their spirit maxims and examples and still made humility and obedience the foundation of their discipline subjecting the whole of life to god hitherto the life of religious women had been wholly secluded from the world but in the seventeenth century st vincent of paul established the sisters of charity from which time the union of monastical discipline with every kind of active charity in the service of the poor sick and ignorant has taken a prodigious expansion among the devoted female sex through all these developments and expansions of the religious life there is growth 
sequence and adaptation suited to the requirements of the church as they arise under new conditions first the life given wholly to god was secluded that its inward spirit might be perfected and a vast experience might be accumulated of the best methods for the guidance of all the future then the rules of religious life were reduced by great and wise saints to what may be called their scientific perfection next at a time of great disorder and confusion the monasteries with their corporate strength and discipline were brought into action to missionarize the world and restore order and civilization when secular influences pervaded the church and wealth brought its many abuses the life of humility and self-sacrifice arose in a new form but still in corporate strength to evangelize the people and to perfect the science of theology in the dominican and franciscan orders and it is worthy of remark that each of them had special links with the old monastic order of st benedict when heresy struck at the foundations of faith and authority and the new learning was invented wherewith to put aside the ancient truth for the criticism of reason was absurdly applied to the authority of divine revelation st ignatius and the other saintly founders of the regular clerics united the old religious discipline of humility and obedience with a new order of training adapted to the apostolic life and the work of christian education and here again we find a close link between the new and the old which is thus expressed by father alvarez de paz one of the most eminent spiritual writers of the society of jesus st benedict the venerable patriarch of all holy religious is in a special way the holy father of our society for in his most observant monastery of our lady of montserrat our blessed father st ignatius passed from the service of the world to the service of christ it is also worthy of remark that that monastery at the time had a special system of spiritual exercises drawn up by a previous abbot the well-known cisneros although that of st ignatius has a special character of its own and he was the first to popularize the spiritual exercises the purpose of these historical observations is to show the unity of spirit and tradition which pervades the interior religious life from the earliest to the latest ages finally after the powers of the world had confiscated or destroyed the old catholic institutions and provisions for the poor as well as the monasteries at which they were helped and relieved after the principles of political economy had supplanted the principle of christian charity when money and the distinctions obtainable by money became the ruling passions of the world when the science of the wealth of nations became the ruling principle of state policy when systems of mechanical benevolence were substituted for personal charity when manufactures and commerce with their hard calculating ways opened a yawning gulf between the rich and the poor and the poor multiplied in numbers and in distress beyond all precedent then it was that the humble self-sacrificing life of religion took another shape and devout women of all ranks gave themselves to god in the severe and heroic life of humility united with active charity but all these forms of religious life however varied in their works rest on one and the same basis the three vows are the three forms of self-renunciation that tend to bring the soul to humility and charity the rules of the great orders from the third to the seventeenth century have been conveniently brought together in one code these we have carefully collated and with them not a few of more recent date and find them all tending in their chief spiritual provisions to one and the same end of discipline by the exercise of humility 
to secure the perfection of every christian virtue some have a greater and some a less profound apprehension of this spirit some have a milder and others a stronger discipline but all have the one aim of subjecting the soul to god with constant reverence and self-sacrifice but what is striking in all these orders and institutes when we come to examine their spiritual manuals is the uniform disposition to look back to the maxims and examples bequeathed by the earlier monastic life as most valuable helps in forming the religious life and spirit thus the fathers of the desert still instruct the religious of both sexes who are combating the evils of the modern world if we consider the instruments of religious discipline poverty gives freedom by removing the world and its concupiscences from the soul purity gives force and elevation to the soul obedience destroys self-will which is the root of all sin everything receives dignity from its reference to god obedience and prayer are direct and immediate exercises of humility whilst purity of life gives them holiness for obedience subjects the will to god through the voice of the rule and the superior nor is this a capricious authority or obedience for all is constitutionally regulated nor can that constitution be changed even in its details without the voice of the governed as well as the voice of authority prayer is the subjection of the soul to god in adoration supplication and gratitude everywhere within the church of god humility is exercised for there can neither be charity nor hope nor faith without this virtue but there are as many degrees of humility as of sanctity and as some persons by their natural gifts become skilful artists without the help of schools so there are not a few souls who through fidelity to the special help of god obtain a good degree of humility and sanctity without the training of religious life for the grace of god is not bound and sanctity belongs to all states of life that god has ordained yet always on the same foundation of humility but when we would learn the higher degrees of its perfection we naturally go to its great schools or listen to its wisest teachers cassian repeats their instructions when he tells us that the first way to humility is to keep the commandments of god for this is to subject the will to his eternal law then come the divine beatitudes and counsels of christ which perfect the subjection of the soul to god to see this we have only to enumerate them for they are poverty of spirit meekness the mourning over evil and over our distance from god the hungering and thirsting after justice mercifulness cleanness of heart peacemaking and the suffering of persecution for justice sake those are nearest to christ who lead a life of poverty detachment from the body and obedience and the next are they who though engaged in the secular life use the world as though they used it not let us hear the great patriarch of oriental monachism demonstrating how all we have lost through pride is recovered by humility st basil says if man had but remained in the glory he first received from god he would have had a true instead of a fictitious elevation the divine power would have made him apt for this the divine wisdom would have enlightened him and he would have delighted in eternal life and all its good but when he hurried in the quest of something better that could not be he gave up the desire of divine glory and lost what he might have had we can now only recover the ground of our salvation the healing of our maladies and the return to our first state by being humble not by inventing a glory for ourselves but by seeking the glory of god 
we shall thus be corrected in what we have erred be healed in what we are infirm and return to the sacred precepts we had left after proving this at length from the scriptures the great founder of the religious life asks how are we to get rid of the tumour of pride and come to this health restoring humility if we exercise ourselves in those things that express humility and guard against everything whereby we may encounter loss for the soul becomes like her pursuits and exercises and is formed and shaped to what she does in his rule he replies to the questions what is humility how is it gained it is to account all others better than yourself according to the apostolic injunction and it is gained by reflecting in the first place on the lord's command learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart and in giving faith to the words that he who humbleth himself shall be exalted and in giving yourself a steady and determined will to the exercise of humility in whatever you are doing for what is true of the arts is true of this virtue thinking will not gain it without practice three more pithy sentences may be added from this father the progress of the soul is the progress of humility the knowledge of piety is the knowledge of humility and meekness humility is the emulation of christ should some reader be inclined to think that these fundamental truths are too often repeated though in different forms he must be requested to reflect on the difference between entertaining the mind and teaching the most difficult of all sciences and in the following sentences of father tanner the carthusian he will find the grave reason for this method to reach our object usefully and compendiously we must search after the springs from which this excelling virtue flows if we come often to them and by reading and reflecting make them familiar to our mind we shall find humility itself flowing little by little into our soul and then we shall not neglect to exert ourselves in those acts of humility which the virtue demands if there be a stubborn error that is wilfully blind in this sensual world so ignorant of its own sensuality it must be in the professing not to know how the humiliation of the body can contribute to the humility of the soul for this is in direct contradiction to the world's own practice which in its corrections its revenges and its administration of justice is constantly afflicting the body to humble and amend the soul he who has never much reflected on the action of body on soul and soul on body knows little if anything of the discipline of human nature and still less of the nature of self-discipline on this subject the shrewd st dorotheus has some very pertinent remarks how he asks is humility of heart obtained through bodily labours what has corporal labour to do with planting habits and affections in the soul i will tell you after the unhappy soul had fallen from her good estate through transgressing god's commandment she was given up to various delights and to all the concupiscences and was left to her own will and judgment however erroneous they might be she then began to love corporal and material things and became in a manner corporal and carnal as god said in the scripture my spirit shall not remain in man for ever because he is flesh for the soul is moved and affected according to what is done and felt in the body hence an old man among us used to say that corporal labour leads straight to humility for the soul is moved and affected one way in health and another in sickness one way in hunger and another when the body is filled with food the man who rides a horse feels very differently from the man who plods along on an ass 
and he who sits on a throne has a disposition of soul altogether different from him who sits on the ground he who is clothed in soft beautiful and precious garments cannot feel like the man who is begirt with rags and patches labor humiliates the body and brings down its pride and when the body is humiliated the soul is humbled so the old man justly said that bodily labor brings the soul to humility and humility frees the man from the greatest evils and protects him from many and great temptations end of lecture fifteen part one lecture fifteen part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture fifteen on the schools of humility part two this instruction is gradually leading us on to the practical degrees of humility and therefore what we have at present to keep in mind is that it is not merely a special but a universal virtue entering into the composition of all christian virtue this is clearly put by st thomas in his masterly analysis of the virtues he observes that though the theological virtues stand higher in dignity because they command and direct the other virtues from an elevation yet in this essential respect humility is the most noble important and first of the virtues that the others have each of them but one essential object on which it is exercised whilst humility has the task of submitting the soul to the whole order of truth right reason and justice and to every good and pious inspiration of grace we shall not cease to repeat that the whole labour of virtue is in humility and that the reward of humility is charity if we labour at the first says st augustine god will bring us to the last and now listen once more to st lawrence justinian when humility shall have filled brought down and melted the soul then shall she begin to be enlarged with charity irradiated with truth filled with light and raised in spirit this brings us to the question of the right method of building up the soul we constantly use the word edification without much consciousness that it refers to the art of construction you are god's building says st paul according to the grace of god which is given to me as a wise architect i have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereupon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon for other foundation no man can lay but that which is laid which is christ jesus one corinthians chapter three verses nine through eleven the virtues are the materials of the building and humility the jointing of every part how shall we build a temple to the living god on this foundation we shall find no better guidance in this work than st dorotheus gives us in his admirable discourse on the harmonious building up of the soul a man he says should take heed to every part of his soul that the whole edifice may rise together in fit and due proportion this the venerable abbot john was wont to say give me the man who is constantly adding a little from every virtue and not the man of whom there are so many who is always insisting on one virtue to the neglect of the rest he gains some mastery perhaps in that one and feels no conflict from the opposite vice yet is led away by other passions to which he gives no heed this is like building a single wall with no thought beyond making it as high as possible never dreaming that the first strong wind will bring it to the ground it is neither bonded nor supported by other walls no man can put a roof on a single wall he must wait till the rest are built this is no sound way of building 
let him who would build and roof his house raise it all up together and make it as strong and firm as he can this is the true way of building that st paul recommends that doing the truth in charity we may in all things grow up in him who is the head even christ from whom the whole body being compacted and fitly joined together by what every joint supplieth according to the operation in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in charity ephesians chapter four verses fifteen and sixteen mark well that all through the construction there must be truth jointing of materials and charity for humility and charity are universal elements we lay the first foundation of faith in the open foundation of humility obedience comes to hand put in the stone of obedience someone is moved to anger with you put in the stone of patience whatever virtue the order of providence brings to hand take a stone from it and place it on the building raising it all round with steady perseverance here a stone of meekness there a stone of mortified will here a stone of mercy there a stone of some other virtue but look well and carefully to patience and magnanimity for these are the angles that bind wall to wall and brace the whole building see also that they neither start nor shrink from each other for without this you cannot perfect a single virtue without some fortitude the soul will endure nothing nor build what can endure hence our lord says in patience you shall possess your soul st luke chapter twenty one verse nineteen but the builder must set every stone in a bed of mortar from top to bottom and all through the structure for unless each stone has its bed there will be nothing solid and secure this mortar of the earth on which men tread is humility tempered with the waters of compunction thus the whole building rests on humility and every part of it is couched in humility for continues st dorotheus the fathers say that without humility no virtue is a virtue and this was the judgment of them all that it is as impossible to save a soul without humility as to build a ship without nails whatever good a soul would do let her do it with humility or the labour is lost the house must also have its beams and its mouldings for increase of strength for division into compartments for binding the edifice together and for ornament but the roof is charity which perfects the virtues as the roof completes the house and round the roof must be a battlement as prescribed in deuteronomy when thou buildest a new house thou shalt make a battlement to the roof round about lest blood be shed in thy house and thou be guilty if any one slip and fall down headlong deuteronomy chapter twenty two verse eight this battlement again is humility crowning and guarding all the virtues and giving them perfection for the progress of all the saints is through their access to greater humility and the closer a man adheres to god the more clearly he will know and the more openly confess that he is a child of sin but what are these little ones for whom the law provides that they fall not headlong these are the newborn progeny of our mind to be kept within the custody of humility lest they fall and this guarding of the little ones is perfect virtue the building will now be complete provided it has had a wise and skilful builder who really understands his work but it not unfrequently happens that the builder is without knowledge and undoes with one hand what he does with the other like a bungler he pushes one stone down whilst putting up another and is so awkward at times that in setting up one stone he will pull down two for example someone hits you with a sharp word 
you take it silently and bear it patiently presently you meet a friend you tell him how you have been insulted you warm upon it exaggerate the fact and conclude by saying how patient and silent you were don't you see that in putting up one stone you have pulled down two another gets some deserved rebuke and bears it for the credit it will do him this one cannot distinguish between humility and vainglory he pulls down the very stone he is putting up another receives rebuke but without knowledge for he thinks that all that is required is silence and forgets to submit his heart but another will even magnify himself in secret and fancy he is doing great things in bearing rebuke and that he is very humble withal unhappy man he acts without knowledge not understanding that he is nothing had he reflected in the truth and reflected justly his very temptation would have shown him his nothingness one has the care of a sick brother but he does it for some end of his own this is no wise service to serve the sick wisely is to do it in loving compassion and with tender kindness for when we act from mercy we feel nothing to be a difficulty or a trouble one who acts from this motive believes that the sick man does him more service than he is doing the sick man nor would i have you ignorant of this that whoever devotes himself to the sick and suffering from right motives will be wonderfully freed from the passions of the soul and the attacks of the devil some have been freed from painful and humiliating illusions by assiduously serving those afflicted with sickness and as the old man maximus told evagrius there is nothing so effectual against passions of this kind as the doing of mercy our fathers also and those before them were strongly impressed with the conviction that bodily labors undertaken with right intention are the certain way to humility let every man in short so build the virtues into his soul as to consolidate them into habits and he will be a wise builder but whoever would complete his work must beware of thinking that perfect virtue is too high for him to reach this is to give up confidence in the divine help and to become drowsy and stupid if we do what is demanded of us no grace will be wanting to our prayer if we exert the will we shall have the power it is written thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself stand not on your distance from this virtue or you will begin to say how can i love my neighbour as myself how can i enter into his feelings and sorrows they are hidden in his heart how can i feel them as my own if you take to this fashion of thinking you will imagine the virtue impracticable trust in god and begin as you can open to him your desire and you will soon feel that his help has come to you imagine you are between two ladders one of which ascends to heaven the other goes down to the infernal abyss you may say how can i fly to the top of this ladder but if god had intended you to do so he would have given you wings your first care is not to slip down below don't injure your neighbour don't revile him don't despise him respect him reverence him and you will begin to do him good speak kindly to him be gentle with him compassionate his sorrows and when he has need of you you will serve him when he is in want of what you have you will give it to him and by degrees you will reach to the top of the ladder that rests in heaven from the first little help you will come in the end to wish the same happiness to your neighbours that you wish yourself you will get as far as this if you choose to try and if you humbly ask god's help that help will quickly come for he says ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find knock 
and it shall be opened to you we ask when we pray to god for help we seek when we look out for occasions of virtue we knock when we put our hand to the work he then who works with knowledge and skill is the wise architect who built securely and our lord has called him the wise builder who founds his house upon a rock that the assaults of his enemies can neither injure nor disturb this ample explanation will enable you to see how humility works through all the virtues yet not unless this virtue be itself the object of special attention and careful cultivation once make a good fire and everything combustible will feed it once get a good foundation of humility and every virtue that it receives will increase its power where a good soil has been well opened out and the heavens are propitious you may grow any fruit in it but to humility the heavens are always propitious for the god of heaven loves truth and humility is the truth that makes the man true the god of heaven loves justice and humility is the justice that makes the man just the god of heaven loves order and humility is the moral ordering of the soul the god of heaven loves to see a soul that is open to his benefits and humility opens the soul the god of heaven loves to see all things in their due place and humility gives the soul her right place before him the god of heaven loves to perfect whatever is in a condition to be perfected and he is able from their condition to perfect the souls of the humble it remains to consider the degrees of humility and the methods by which they are reached those degrees are the successive steps by which a soul advances from her first self-renunciation and conversion to god into greater self-renunciation and subjection to god until she is able to say with st paul i live no more but christ lives in me galatians chapter two verse twenty and with the same apostle your life is hidden with christ in god colossians chapter three verse three whither shall we go for this instruction but to the great schools of humility which have filled heaven with saints but as there are many such schools each with its own methods though all have one basis it will serve no purpose to perplex you with a great diversity of methods and we shall do best to take the one which takes the largest view which has exercised the widest influence and from which the others have derived not a little of their tradition this will bring us to the celebrated twelve degrees of st benedict which we must put in a more popular way and with due explanations the rule of st benedict was drawn up towards the close of the fifth century but the twelve degrees of humility have an earlier history st benedict drew largely but with great judgment from cassian and st basil who incorporated in their rules the earlier traditions of the great eastern saints the twelve degrees of humility which form the seventh chapter of st benedict's rule are an expansion of the ten signs of the progress of humility contained in the institutes of cassian which he declares he heard delivered in egypt by the famous abbot pinufius the history of whose wonderful humility he has recorded these twelve degrees of st benedict have been contrasted by st bernard in a special treatise with the twelve degrees of pride and st thomas has scientifically vindicated the sufficiency of st benedict's twelve degrees in his sum of theology the comments written upon them are very numerous we must first make three observations of great importance for understanding the twelve degrees humility in practice has a negative as well as a positive side the negative side is self-renunciation the positive side is the subjection of the soul to god as cassian says after st dorotheus 
there can be no humility without self-renunciation we must give up ourselves and then give ourselves up with great reverence to god empty yourself and see that i am god psalm forty five verse eleven humility must therefore be thought of and acted upon in these two respects for our second observation what has been already said in this lecture is a preparation humility acts not alone but employs other virtues as instruments for its attainment this fact will explain why st benedict in his twelve degrees introduces other virtues as means for gaining this virtue as there is nothing isolated in life there is nothing isolated in virtue but one works with the other hence the remark of st basil that all the virtues contribute to humility though some contribute so much more to its formation and perfection than others that they may be considered as its special instruments such as the fear of god and obedience from the heart the third observation is this that external conduct when sincere emanates from the internal habits of the soul and gives expression to them whilst external reserve and self-conduct react in their turn in producing internal reserve and solidity of soul if these observations are kept in view they will greatly facilitate the understanding of the twelve degrees of which as st thomas observes some belong to the root of humility some to its essence and some to its effects first degree the first degree of humility is the fear of god this fear springs from the sense of god and of oneself it is awakened in the soul by the entrance of divine light giving us to see what we are in the presence of our almighty creator and showing how unfaithful we have been to his divine law and how unclean and far removed from him we are this is the soul penetrated and stirred with the fear of god with the sense of her responsibility and the dread of his judgments this fear humbles the soul awakens the sense of shame in her and fills her with confusion she begins to sigh over her miseries to hate her sins and vanities and to supplicate the mercy of god the more the sense of the goodness of god and of his displeasure grows upon the soul the more is she humbled down in the sense of her own unworthiness and is pierced with the thorns of compunction as though they came from the wounded brow of her divine lover and redeemer to penetrate her heart with the bitterness of self-reproach the cross stands before the humbled spirit and the divine victim of her sins with bleeding arms expanded on its wood seems to look through his tears into her heart awakening the movements of repentance with his grace the tears of contrition the desires of deeper repentance and the hope of pardon this fear generates humility humility opens the soul the open soul receives the grace of repentance repentance increases humility humility obtains pardon and pardon brings the grace of charity and the love of god's commandments then servile fear is changed into the chaste fear of god as of a child for a father who has loved him exceedingly and this chaste loving and most reverential fear is the fruit of a more advanced humility then the soul becomes grateful and desires to be faithful and is watchful of two things to keep in the presence of god and to keep his commandments in his presence she knows that in the divine presence she is safe and that if her heart watches to god he will watch over her she begins to feel light solace and protection in that presence and by degrees begins to suffer when the sense of that presence is lost as though it were the loss of the sense of life god liveth in whose sight i stand four kings chapter five verse sixteen 
and not only knowing but feeling that in him we live and move and have our being and that he beholds our thoughts and acts at all times and in all places and is the god who searcheth our hearts and reigns that soul lives in lowly-hearted reverence before him and is ready to say then shall i be without stain if sins have no dominion over me psalm eighteen verse fourteen second degree the second degree of humility is the renouncing of our own will and desires that we may be conformable to the divine will we thus imitate our divine lord who says i came not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me st john chapter six verse thirty eight after fear has humbled purified and subjected us to god in the observance of the commandments the next step is to perfect our submission to god and as the will is sovereign of the man this is accomplished by the complete subjection of our will to the will of god but this subjection implies the giving up our own wayward will and fantastical desires that the wisdom of god may rule us for self-will is the product of self-love and the cause of all pride sinfulness folly and vanity take away self-will and you take away all evil why then did god give us this will he gave us our free will but not our self-will this self is the addition we have made to it and was first inspired by the devil when he said ye shall be as gods genesis chapter three verse five our free will was given us that we might use it magnificently by uniting it with the truth the will the wisdom and the goodness of god and might partake of the good that is in the divine will in proportion to the humility and love with which we do his will our own will hath pain brings confusion and fails in the end for it is always crossed by the eternal will of god which alone will be accomplished in the end i am god says the almighty my counsel shall stand and all my will shall be done isaiah chapter forty six verses nine and ten wherefore our lord has told us for our example my meat is to do the will of him who sent me st john chapter four verse thirty four and he gave us a form of prayer for our constant use in which to express the conformity of our will with the divine will thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven st matthew chapter six verse ten and every faithful christian by the title of that prayer which he so often repeats ought to submit his will with all humility of heart to the all-perfect will of god and that in all in which the divine will is known to him but the will of god is so great a good that we ought to seek the knowledge of it in every way that we can in his truth in his commandments in his holy counsels in prayer in the inspirations of conscience in the voice of superiors in the advice of the wise and prudent and in the course and order of his providence third degree the third degree of humility is to obey our superiors for the love of god imitating our lord of whom the apostle says he was made obedient even unto death philippians chapter two verse eight the interior subjection of the will to god is thus perfected by exterior subjection to the authorities whom god has appointed to manifest his will that interior subjection may come to expression in exterior obedience for as st thomas observes a man comes to humility through two means first and principally through the gift of grace in which respect the interior precedes the exterior but in another respect humility is obtained by labour and effort which restrains the exterior and masters whatever resists humility 
thus acting from the exterior upon the interior and so extirpating the interior root of pride and it is upon this order of acting from the exterior upon the interior that saint benedict arranges the degrees of progress in humility god has ordained authority and obedience in many forms in the family in the government of society in employment in the church and in religion and this order of things is divinely ordained for many reasons to preserve us from self-love and pride in judging and deciding in our own case to place the will under the guidance of those who are wiser and more experienced to preserve order and subordination to secure unity in life and in religion to repair that disobedience by which we have fallen through listening to the external tempter and above all to secure our interior humility and submission to god through the habit of obeying him in his representatives the beautiful chapter of st benedict's rule which treats on obedience opens with the declaration that the first degree of humility is prompt obedience in the fear of god but in the twelve degrees he places obedience in the third degree how is this to be reconciled very simply the first degree is the fear of god and in the chapter on obedience obedience is placed under the motive of fear which brings it under the first degree but in the twelve degrees it is placed under the motive of the love of god which advances it from the first to the third degree for the perfect subjection of humble obedience proceeds from charity this obedience consummates that interior subjection to god in being prompt to do his will whether internally externally or however manifested humility generates obedience from the heart and charity makes it prompt and loyal looking ever to the divine will as its first and ruling motive but the disobedient one is a proud and ungovernable person wounded by lucifer speaking of religious obedience st basil says rebellion and contradiction argue the presence of many evils a faith that is diseased a hope that is dubious a pride and haughtiness of manners whoever detracts from authority has first despised the author of good counsel but whoever believes the promises of god and puts his hope in them will not be sluggish to obey even though the command be hard and difficult for he knows that the sufferings of this time are not to be compared with the coming glory that shall be revealed and he who is convinced that whoever humbles himself shall be exalted will show greater swiftness to obey than the superior looks for because he knows that the present light and momentary trial will bring an eternal weight of glory. End of Lecture 15, Part 2。Lecture 15, Part 3 of The Groundwork of the Christian Virtues by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 15 On the Schools of Humility, Part 3. Fourth Degree. The fourth degree of humility unites obedience with fortitude and patience. It is the humility that obeys in things hard and difficult to nature, and that silently clings to patience even when the obedient have to suffer insults and injuries so as to endure and persevere without being discouraged such a one will remember what the scripture says that he who perseveres to the end shall be saved st matthew chapter twenty four verse sixteen and that other scripture let thy heart be strengthened and await the lord psalm twenty six verse fourteen and to show how the faithful soul ought to endure all things for the love of god 
the sacred scripture speaks in the person of the sufferer for thy sake we are put to death all the day we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter romans chapter eight verse thirty six such was the patient obedience of the apostles martyrs and all the confessors of god secure of the hope of divine repayment they followed on rejoicing and saying in all these things we overcome for the sake of him who loved us romans chapter eight verse thirty seven and in another place of holy scripture we hear them saying thou hast proved us o lord and hast tried us as silver is tried in the fire psalm sixty five verse ten this patient obedience under every difficulty exalts humility into the grandeur and strength of magnanimity and gives an heroic greatness to the soul growing ever more humble simple and patient under growing trials true patience and tranquillity says abbot preyman in the conferences is neither obtained nor upheld without profound humility of heart if it descends from this fountain it will not require to be protected by your chamber nor by solitude for what proceeds from humility is supported by that inward generator and protector of its force and asks for no protection from any external thing but if we yield to another's provocation it is certain that the foundations of humility are not firmly laid in us and a small storm will expose our structure to ruin patience would never be worth praise or admiration if its tranquillity had never to encounter adversaries but it becomes resplendent and glorious when it abides unmoved amidst a tempest of provocations who knows not that patience is the calm enduring of assaults from passion no one then is entitled to be called patient who cannot endure the inflictions of passion without indignation hence solomon has said that the patient man is better than the valiant and he that ruleth his spirit than he who taketh cities proverbs chapter sixteen verse thirty two and again he that is patient is governed with much wisdom but he that is impatient exalteth his folly proverbs chapter fourteen verse twenty nine when therefore a man is so much vanquished by injury as to kindle with the fire of anger we must not ascribe his sin to the bitterness of that injury but must take it as the manifestation of his own inward weakness this was expressed in our saviour's parable of the two houses of which one was founded on the rock and the other on sand on both of them alike the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat upon those houses but the one founded solidly on the rock suffered no injury from all this violence whilst the one built on the shifting sands fell down and great was the ruin thereof st matthew chapter seven verses twenty four through twenty seven the humility from which this patient and magnanimous obedience is generated is invincible because it rests not on self but on god fifth degree the fifth degree of humility consists in the manifestation of the evil thoughts that come to the heart and the evil acts committed in secret the sacred scripture exhorts us to this make known thy way to the lord and hope in him psalm thirty six verse five and again confess to the lord because he is good because his mercy abideth for ever psalm one hundred five verse one and the psalmist says to god i have acknowledged my sin to thee and my injustice i have not concealed i said i will confess against myself my injustice to the lord and thou hast forgiven the wickedness of my sin psalm thirty one verse five pride closes up the soul with all her wounds evils and temptations ignoring them excusing them or concealing them even from oneself 
and leaving them to fester and ferment together in their death-dealing corruption nay there is a pride so great as to profess to be more shocked at the confession of shameful things that the heart may be relieved of them than at the actual committing of them and the burying of them for ever in the guilty breast but sincere humility opens the soul examines what is within and in her love of justice can keep nothing there closed up that is an offence to god or that contradicts his voice speaking against it in the conscience but is ever ready to do all that can be done to make atonement and to punish that self-love which caused the evil humility cannot endure that there should be a stain of known sin that is not purged away by confession and repentance god knows all but he would have the sinner to know his guiltiness to set his iniquity before his face to humble himself in his delinquency to confess with shame and sorrow the evil he has done with shameless delight and to uncover his wounds to the healing blood of christ that god may remember them no more divine is the remedy of humble confession divine in its wonderful adaptation to the needs of our weak nature and divine in its healing power as in his providence god has provided medicines and surgery for the infirmities and wounds of the mortal body in his grace he has provided spiritual medicines and surgery for the remedy of the immortal soul in both cases the man stands in need of a physician of one who shall examine his case judge where he is himself incapable of judging apply the true remedy and give prudent advice for the future we first open our soul to god in humility and then to the physician who bears the remedies of christ pour out thy heart like water in the sight of the lord thy god says the prophet jeremias lamentations chapter two verse nineteen go show yourselves to the priest says our lord to the lepers and as they went they were made clean st luke chapter seventeen verse fourteen confess your sins one to another says st james and pray for one another that you may be saved st james chapter five verse sixteen if we confess our sins says st john he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity one john chapter one verse nine christ has established his tribunals on the earth to which we freely summon ourselves at the call of conscience and at which we are our own accusers and witnesses our own judges and our own punishers that judging ourselves now we may not be judged hereafter there is another mode of manifesting our thoughts and evil inclinations to which even the children of this world sometimes have recourse and to which st benedict especially refers in this degree and that is when we find it difficult to manage our own internal troubles without some wise prudent and paternal advice the very opening of such difficulties is often their solution for what we bring to open manifestation is much more clearly seen and understood even by ourselves when opened out to the calm judgment of another whose virtues we reverence the very process of humbly opening our mind to a wise prudent and sympathizing heart brings light and clearer judgment to ourselves and we become strengthened and decided by the wise counsel and prudent advice of one who judges without the bias of our own preconceptions and feelings and when he to whom we open our heart is a man of god we fail not to obtain some special light and benefit from his wisdom and experience sixth degree the sixth degree of humility is when a man bears all abjection and contempt with an equable and willing mind 
and when in all the labours and duties of his state or calling he accounts himself to be an unprofitable workman this our lord has commanded when you shall have done all these things that are commanded you say we are unprofitable servants we have done that which we ought to do st luke chapter seventeen verse ten and the psalmist says to god of his own vileness i was brought to nothing and i knew it not i am become as a beast of burden before thee and i am always with thee psalm seventy two verses twenty two and twenty three we have ideal forms in the light of our mind of what is good and perfect and when we compare our performances with those ideal patterns we see how far we come short of them in our spirit life and works this light showing us better things than any that we do is given us not only as the measure of good but also that by seeing how far we fall short of its perfection we may keep ourselves humble by comparing ourselves with what shines to us of the light of justice we see our vileness and by comparing our works with their perfect forms in the mind we see their failings as we owe all things to god we owe our whole duty to god but duty is debt who then is entitled to boast that he has done his duty the servant who does nothing beyond what his lord commands him to do is but an indifferent servant but when we do what god commands us to do we have only given him his own and we find so many faults and shortcomings in our work that we have much reason to be humbled and ashamed then as our lord tells us without me you can do nothing st john chapter fifteen verse five and whatever good we have or do we must say with st paul by the grace of god i am what i am one corinthians chapter twenty verse ten and we are not sufficient to think anything of ourselves as of ourselves but our sufficiency is from god two corinthians chapter three verse five plainly then can we ascribe no good to ourselves but only our defects from grace and even our defects from nature in the evils that we do in the view of all this truth and of our many ingratitudes both truth and justice require that we consider ourselves useless and unworthy servants and account ourselves vile and worthy of contempt but if this be the true judgment that we form of ourselves and not a mere fashion of speaking how can we in justice refuse to accept the treatment that accords with this judgment seventh degree the seventh degree of humility is to account oneself lower and viler than all not merely in words but in the innermost belief and affection of our heart saying in all humility with the psalmist it is good that thou hast humbled me that i may learn thy justifications psalm 118 verse 71 the soul that knows herself has an intuition of the secrets of her nature and of her heart that are only known to god and herself and this knowledge she cannot have of any one but herself the further she enters into this knowledge of herself the more fully she sees that without god she is nothing and describing whatever she sees good in herself to god she judges herself by what she sees is not of god but of herself and all she sees of this kind is but failure and deficiency but she can have no such perception or experience of any other soul than her own she cannot therefore judge another as she can herself she sees another's exterior but her own interior when it comes to the question of human weakness vileness and unworthiness before god we must judge the soul by all her lights received and graces given and providential helps bestowed from first to last 
and from the whole history of their use or abuse yet all this is a secret history known only between that soul and god and knowing so much in our own case and so little in that of any other upon the known evidence we can only pronounce that we are the weakest of the weak the vilest of the vile and the most ungrateful of the ungrateful and when we see another sin openly we may say in perfect justice with st francis had he the graces and advantages that i have received he would have been a saint and had i received no more than he has received i should have been a far greater sinner than he in this profound view of himself st paul called himself the least of apostles not worthy to be called an apostle one corinthians chapter fifteen verse nine in this profound view of himself david called himself the reproach of men and the outcast of the people psalm twenty one verse seven and holy job exclaimed i am brought to nothing job chapter sixteen verse eight yet this deep sense of one's own nothingness brings no discouragement on the contrary whilst producing a great mistrust of oneself it fills the soul with confidence in god for this light of humility makes it clearly seen that though we can do nothing of ourselves that is worthy of god god can and will do everything in us the moment we surrender ourselves to him for what is required is to renounce oneself as a foundation of good and to rest in confidence on god as our foundation for he who has given himself for us will give us all things wherefore whilst we despise ourselves we rejoice in god and ceasing to live to ourselves we live to god and so as st benedict says this descent is a kind of ascent for while we descend into ourselves by humility we ascend to god by charity we exalt not ourselves but leave god to exalt us whose prerogative it is to raise up the poor from the dust as our most humble and exalted lord has said every one who exalteth himself shall be humbled and he who humbleth himself shall be exalted st luke chapter eighteen verse fourteen so far is thorough humility from making us weak or little-souled that it makes us courageous and great-souled to do great things for god's service yet on god's strength and not on our weakness this has been well expressed by st bernard the prerogative of divine grace he says works in the hearts of the elect so that humility does not make them pusillanimous nor magnanimity arrogant but humility and magnanimity work together so that magnanimity causes no elation but works with humility increasing the filial fear of god in the soul and her gratitude to the giver of her gifts humility on the other hand gives no occasion to pusillanimity for the less the soul presumes on herself the more fully she trusts to the divine power and that even in the greatest things to sum up this degree in the words of albert the great the true lover of humility should plant its root in his heart and know his frailty not only feeling how vile he is but how vile he might become unless god withheld him by his power from sin and from many temptations for each one may know this of himself that by nature he is inclined to the abyss and whirlpool of the vices according to that of the prophet micaeus thy humiliation is in the midst of thee eighth degree the eighth degree of humility is to do nothing against the rule or the example of the fathers that is in its full acceptation that we do nothing either against the preaching of the gospel or the doctrine and discipline of the church or against the rule belonging to our state of life 
for in all this we have the manifestation of the will of god as tertullian told the pagan authorities of the roman empire all christians are religious of the cross and st paul exhorts us that we may be of the same mind let us also continue in the same rule philippians chapter three verse sixteen and after exhibiting the rule of faith and piety to the galatians the apostle says whosoever shall follow this rule peace on them and mercy and upon the israel of god galatians chapter six verse sixteen humility also requires for its perfection that we prefer the common rule observance prayer or duty as the manifest will of god to everything of our own private choice or inclination for the whole discipline of humility is directed against self-will and self-love and to the preferring of the sense and will of god to our own and this is plainly manifested in the common rule of duty and charity solomon says that brother helped of brother is as a strong city and our lord has blessed the spirit of common duty in a special way saying where two or three are gathered together in my name there i am in the midst of them st matthew chapter eighteen verse twenty then it should be remembered that god has condemned those sacrifices in which self-will is found the four last degrees proceed from the interior to the exterior whose careful control protects and fosters the interior spirit of humility and ministers to edification ninth degree the ninth degree of humility is to refrain the tongue and moderate its license for the scripture says in the multitude of words there shall not want sin but he that refraineth his lips is most wise proverbs chapter ten verse nineteen and that a man full of tongues shall not be established on the earth psalm one hundred thirty nine verse twelve and the psalmist says again i said i will take heed to my ways that i sin not with my tongue i have set a guard to my mouth psalm thirty eight verses one and two tenth degree the tenth degree of humility is not to be dissolute or prone to laughter or to give the reins to levity mindful of the sentence that a fool lifteth up his voice in laughter but a wise man will scarce laugh low to himself ecclesiastes chapter twenty one verse twenty three eleventh degree the eleventh degree of humility is to speak with gentleness and without laughter humbly and with gravity in a few words seasoned with the salt of prudence not clamorously but in a submissive tone mindful of those divine counsels speak not anything rashly and let not thy heart be hasty to utter a word before god for god is in heaven and thou upon earth therefore let thy words be few ecclesiastes chapter five verse one the words of the mouth of a wise man are grace but the lips of a fool shall throw him down headlong ecclesiastes chapter ten verse twelve and a man wise in words shall make himself beloved ecclesiastes chapter twenty verse thirteen the lips of the unwise will be telling foolish things but the words of the wise shall be weighed in a balance ecclesiastes chapter twenty one verse twenty eight twelfth degree the twelfth degree of humility is to be humble not only in heart but in our whole exterior conduct and in all times and places that we may say with david lord my heart is not exalted nor my eyes lofty neither have i walked in great things above myself psalm one hundred thirty verses one and two and that we may fulfill the admonition of the apostle let your modesty be known to all men philippians chapter four verse five 
to the twelve degrees we must add what st bonaventure calls the humility of the perfect he who has this last degree of humility however great his virtues may be however high his gifts however distinguished his honours is in nothing lifted up and takes nothing of them to himself in flattery he gives all back to god restores all to him from whom every good flows such was the humility of our blessed lord who thought it no robbery to be equal to god but emptied himself always referring all things to his father such was the humility of the blessed virgin who knew she was the chosen mother of god but only called herself his lowly servant he hath looked down upon the lowliness of his handmaid such is the humility of the angels and saints in glory who raised to supreme honour and filled with supreme good have no movement of pride in them but are the more humble the higher they are in god this is the humility of the perfect who the greater they are the more humble they become in all things in their sense their affections their words their acts and their habits when a soul has ascended all these degrees of humility concludes st benedict she will come at once to that charity of god which casts out fear and through that charity all that she formerly observed not without the sense of fear she will now begin to do without labour as it were naturally and with the ease of custom no longer from the fear of punishment but for the love of christ and from good custom and delight in the virtues this will the lord deign to show to his workmen now clean from vice and sin through his holy spirit end of lecture fifteen part three lecture sixteen part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture sixteen on humility as the counterpart of charity part one god is charity and he who abideth in charity abideth in god and god in him one john chapter four verse sixteen it is to be regretted that the necessity of language compels us to apply one and the same term to things so remote from each other and so contradictory of each other as charity and cupidity for we have to explain both by the word love and to say that charity is the love of god and cupidity the love of self and of all that feeds the love of self when we compare these two kinds of love we find nothing in common between them except that unhappily the love of concupiscence solicits the very same will with its affections as the love of charity but charity is the cause of all spiritual life and cupidity the cause of all spiritual corruption and death let us ascend in mind through the grace of god to the divine fountain of all charity god is charity charity is the life and perfection of his being what an infinitude of life and love is expressed in these three little words god is charity as the shell on the sandy shore cannot contain the ocean that rolls round the world as the labouring breast of man cannot contain the pure and boundless ether that fills the heavens as the body of man could not pass into the intense conflagration of the sun without instant destruction neither can the soul of man embrace comprehend or enter into the infinite charity of god yet some drops of the ocean are in that shell some little modified breath of that ether is in the breast of man and some tempered rays of the warmth of that sun are in our earthly frame some created rays from his uncreated charity 
as god also deigned to impart to the soul of the humble christian which are full of divine life and love and in virtue of that sublime gift the moment the words are sounded in his ears he knows and feels to his inmost core that god is charity the ardent apostle of the gentiles was consumed with charity yet with a special reference to this perfecting gift he says we know in part and we prophesy in part but when that which is perfect is come that which is in part shall be done away we see now through a glass in a dark manner but then face to face now i know in part but then shall i know even as i am known and now there remain faith hope and charity these three but the greater of these is charity one corinthians chapter thirteen verses nine through thirteen from the part which he saw and felt the apostle prophesied the whole and he showed the exceeding goodness of god to us sinful mortals when he declared god commendeth his charity towards us romans chapter five verse eight the innocent saint john drew large draughts of charity from the breast of the son of god and was filled to overflowing with divine love yet he only knew and felt in part but prophesied the whole when he said that god is charity god is the essential uncreated charity there is no charity besides except the charity imparted from his own eternal charity for charity can never take its first beginning from the creature all this is embraced in the words of st john god is charity and he who abideth in charity abideth in god and god in him the supreme beauty of god is the splendor of his supreme goodness and his supreme truth is the effulgence of that infinite goodness and beauty and the supreme justice is the order of that goodness and this infinite goodness beauty and justice have infinite sweetness of all the attributes of god charity is the most noble embracing all uniting all in a certain way transcending all because charity is the life of god the mode of his action the perfection of his essence for god is infinite love infinitely loving and infinitely beloved the reason of his essential love is his essential goodness beauty and sweetness whose nature it is to be infinitely communicated and diffused through his infinite action eternally circling in the holy trinity for the father is infinite love and contemplating the character of his substance in his son he infinitely loves the son and the son loves the father equally and the infinite love of the father and son eternally produces the holy spirit of love the divine term of love the divine person of love the consummation of the holy trinity in love the active principle of all charity as the holy spirit is the personal consummation of the charity which god is through the action of the same holy spirit the gift of charity is communicated to us for all charity is of god as all truth is of god truth comes to us from his eternal word and charity from his holy spirit for as there can be no charity whose principle is not in god there can be none in any created spirit or soul which is not given by god hence charity is the most excellent of all things and is communicative of its excellence and by its excellence it unites the created spirit with god there is no other reason for the existence of this world than the charity of god and the communication of his charity the world was made for man man for the soul the soul for charity and charity unites the soul with god from charity god created the world 
and by charity he perfects the end for which the world was made for that end is the happiness of souls possessed of charity hence st john tells us that charity is of god and every one that loveth is born of god and knoweth god one john chapter four verse seven rightly observes st bernard it is said that charity is god and the gift of god wherefore charity gives charity the substantial charity gives the accidental charity not that god communicates to us his own uncreated charity which is his nature and would be unsuited to our condition of probation for our god is a consuming fire deuteronomy chapter four verse twenty four and he would either consume us by its infinite power or would absorb and enrapture us into his ecstatic vision and therefore he said to moses man shall not see me and live exodus chapter thirty three verse twenty but from his eternal charity through the action of his holy spirit god communicates to us the gift of created charity as a ray is given from the sun or to use st augustine's expression as light produces the light that enlightens us or as we are warmed by the heat from a fire though the fire itself would consume us from this we must understand that charity can come from no power of our nature from nothing of our own but it is the divinest grace of god and the noblest habit of virtue in the soul and is infused by the holy spirit as st paul says the love of god is spread abroad in our hearts through the holy spirit dwelling within us romans chapter five verse five and by this dwelling in charity through charity dwelling in us we live and move towards god and are united with god and as st peter says we are made partakers of the divine nature two peter chapter one verse four that is by a created participation on this divine subject st augustine has written these golden words god is love and they that are faithful in love shall rest in him wisdom chapter three verse nine when we are withdrawn from the noise of the creature and collected to the inward joy of silence behold god is love why do we go running up to the high things of heaven and down to the low things of earth in search of him who is with us whenever we choose to be with him let no one say i know not what to love let him love his brother and he will love that very love for he will know the love with which he loves better than the brother whom he loves he will know that love the best because it is in his own interior and therefore more certain embrace the god who is love and embrace him with love that is the love which unites all the good angels and all the servants of god in one bond of sanctity and that unites us with them and them with us and subjects and unites the whole to god the sounder we are from the absence of the tumour of pride the fuller we are of love and of what are we full when full of love but full of god for i look upon charity and as far as i can see i see it with my mind and believe the scripture where it says that god is charity and he that abideth in charity abideth in god we must first then understand that charity is from god because god is charity and that charity can only be received from him that we may be made like to him and may have life from him and be united with him in the bond of his charity there is a kind of life in the soul without charity but it is not the life for which the soul was made not true life but initiatory and mere infantile life which is life in pain and sorrow from want of our true life as st irenaeus says the animal body itself is not the soul 
but it partakes of the soul so long as god wills it and so the soul herself is not life but she partakes of a life given to her by god secondly charity is from god because he first loved us and created us to be the subjects and partakers of his charity so that as st paul says without charity we are nothing for we are without the gift and the good for which we are created and which begins our union with god when therefore that gift was lost to man through pride and sin god in his infinite condescension put forth that charity anew in a wonderful and surpassing way which st john dwells upon in these words by this hath the charity of god appeared towards us because god has sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live by him in this is charity not as though we had loved god but because he hath first loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins one john chapter four verses nine and ten the sublime proof that the incarnation ordained for the destruction of pride and the restoration of charity to man was the work of eternal charity is shown in its being the work of the holy spirit thirdly charity is from god because he has given us the great law of charity as the fulfilment of all his laws and the perfection of justice he gives the law of life and the life by which the law is fulfilled fourthly in the very law of love we have the guarantee that to humble souls for they alone are capable the grace of charity will never be wanting for the god who is charity does not mock his children but when he commands them to love him with their whole heart and soul and strength and mind he gives them the charity by which they may love him for as mortal love is from nature and carnal love from carnal sense and worldly love is from the world the love of god must be from god and this divine gift is always ready to enter the soul whenever humility has expelled the destructive enemy of all charity wherefore to sum up this glorious truth in the words of eternal charity he says to the soul through the prophet jeremias i have loved thee with an everlasting love therefore have i drawn thee having compassion on thee jeremias chapter thirty one verse three but when we speak or think of divine love we must dismiss from our mind and discard from our feelings every notion and sense of that human love which has not been embraced and purified by being brought within the sphere of charity to quote the luminous book on the divine names when that love which beseemeth god is commended and not by us only but by the holy scriptures men who have no insight into that conformity with god which the divine name of charity signifies will fly to that sensual and distracting love with which they are familiar and which is not true love but an image or rather a lapse from true love for the multitude cannot form a right notion of the preeminence of the one divine love but the contemplators of god use the word love in the sense of the divine language and according to the force it has with those who rightly understand divine things according to this sense love is a power that unifies collects and excellently tempers together what pre-exists in the good and beautiful through the good and beautiful and emanates from the good and beautiful for the sake of the good and beautiful and contains equals through mutual connection after this description of the love of the adorable trinity the author describes the communication of charity to the creature as moving in the providence of inferior things and through a certain conversion uniting what is inferior to what is superior after this exposition of the nature of divine charity the author enlarges upon its action moreover he says 
the divine love is ecstatic not suffering him who loves to be his own but his whom he loves this is shown when god descends through his providence from his superiority to inferior existences and by a divine conversion unites them with his superiority thus was st paul taken hold of by the divine love and partaking of its ecstatic virtue he was able to say i live now not i but christ liveth in me he was a true lover he went out of himself to god he lived his own life no longer but the life of him whom he so vehemently loved to this it should be added that the divine author of all things in the good and beautiful love of all and from the supreme excellence of his loving goodness descends through his providence of all and is imbued as it were with love and is delighted with it and whereas he is above all and exempt from all he yet descends in power to all although in exceeding himself he departs not from himself and because of his great and benignant love of all he is called the zealous god for he awakens the zeal of his creatures to desire to love him and puts forth his zeal to make them zealous who desire the good things that he provides for them finally love and what deserves love is the truly good and beautiful it pre-exists in the good and beautiful and is made and exists for the good and the beautiful he who abideth in charity abideth in god and god in him he abideth in god because god is charity and all charity partakes of his charity hence st paul says to the christian endowed with charity know you not that you are the temple of god and the spirit of god dwelleth in you one corinthians chapter three verse sixteen for charity is with god and with us the uncreated charity abides with the created charity that is in the living soul so that in a certain mysterious way there is a communion with god in the loving soul and we are made partakers of the divine nature he therefore who loves abides in god as an object known and loved and is endowed with eternal life from god and god abides in him as the divine object whom he knows and whom he loves with supernatural affection for his own divine sake for charity unites god and the soul in a mutual union transforming the one who loves into the one beloved and the one beloved into the one who loves according to the degree of love through the unifying spirit of the divine gift this brings us to the definition of the virtue of charity which st thomas defines to be a certain noble friendship between god and man a virtue that is not only one special and created but is of all virtues the most excellent we may enlarge upon this definition in the words of albert the great that soul has true and perfect charity to god who moves and advances with all her powers in the love of god because of the greatness goodness sanctity perfection and blessedness that belong to him as the supreme good as god does not infuse his divine gifts into our soul for his own sake but for ours and with the soul desire that we should partake of his beatitude we also ought to love god chiefly for his sake although not ignorant of or indifferent to the good with which he will reward us because that good is himself charity is the affectionate recognition of all the good that god is and of all the good that he is to us it is also the return to him for his immense and eternal love of us our lord has given us the genuine proof by which we may know whether we do love god or not he that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved by my father 
and i will love him and will manifest myself to him st john chapter fourteen verse twenty one go into yourselves brethren says st gregory seek within you whether you truly love god believe nothing of your love but what you can prove by works love asks for the tongue the mind the life the love of god is never idle it works great things if it refuses to work it is not love there are two other signs of the true love of god if we rejoice in all the good that is done for the love of god by whomsoever wheresoever and whensoever done and if we grieve for all that is done displeasing to god by whomsoever wheresoever or whensoever done for it is the property of charity to love all that god loves and to be displeased at all that displeases god end of lecture sixteen part one lecture sixteen part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture sixteen on humility as the counterpart of charity part two true charity to our neighbor is to love him whether friend or foe as we love ourself in god unto god and for god's sake for the charitable love of our neighbor is embraced in the love of god proceeds from the love of god and ends in the love of god the true test of this charity which our lord has given us is the love of those who are inimical to us of which he gives us a great example in his conduct to the traitor judas for knowing that he would betray him he still kept him in his company and gave him his body and blood and at the moment of betrayal he called him friend and allowed the treacherous kiss nothing makes us more like to god than to forgive those who offend and injure us and we may certainly obtain more grace and glory from god through persecution than through kindness if we know how to use it rightly thus the persecutors were more profitable to the eternal glory of the martyrs than their friends but we ought to love our neighbors as ourselves by desiring them all the good and the absence of all the evil that we desire ourselves and by doing for them whatever service we can especially in their needs charity is the rectitude of the soul correcting her aberrations bringing up to straightness what has been bent and deformed in her inclinations and lifting the affections upwards towards the summit of good charity is the beauty and dignity of the soul this beauty comes to her in the gift of love from the infinite beauty of god and she receives a reflection of beauty from all the good that she loves in charity charity is the living form of the virtues animating them with life and vigor and directing them to their final end st paul expresses all the value of charity when he calls it the bond of perfection colossians chapter three verse fourteen for it unites the soul with god and through her union with god unites her also with the angels and saints and by sympathy with all the good that god has anywhere imparted for charity is all embracing of good as it proceeds from that divine charity which either is all good or is productive of all good and is therefore inclined to all good being rooted and founded in charity says st paul you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know also the charity of god which surpasseth all knowledge that you may be filled unto all the fullness of god ephesians chapter three verses seventeen through nineteen charity not only unites the parts of the spiritual structure as st anthony of padua observes 
but gives to the powers and to the virtues which they exercise their proper pliant and suitable conditions and their free and responsive dispositions for example the mind to loving faith the heart to loving obedience the eyes to modesty and the body to purity glass is a fragile thing but when fused in the fire it is ductile to new forms and tenacious of the form received our sensual nature is as fragile as glass but is tractable and reformable under the fire of charity charity is the way to man as well as to god it conciliates all intelligences and though there may be much excitement in what the world calls pleasure there is no solid joy of life or peace of heart except in charity but though charity is one and all who are in charity are united in one and the same charity there are many degrees of its communication and growth in individual souls which is owing to their several conditions when born in the soul it is incipient when nourished in the soul it advances further within when rooted and founded in the depth of the soul it is perfect when god is desired above all things whatsoever it is most perfect as charity and justice are one st augustine measures the advancement of charity by the advancement of justice charity begun he says is justice begun charity advanced is justice advanced great charity is great justice and perfect charity is perfect justice st bonaventure the seraphic doctor of charity has given us the signs by which to know the presence of perfect charity it is perfect he says when it has become a great habit direct in its interior motive solicitous in its exterior works firmly consolidated in its root discreet in its fervor and consoling in its sweetness what then are the relations of humility with charity this is a most important question humility disposes the soul and prepares the way for charity and greater humility prepares and disposes the soul for greater charity for the goodness of the divine charity is not restrained but is always ready to be communicated more generously where the soul is able to receive its abundance and humility makes her able and the charity received increases humility for humility is the counterpart of charity both these points we must now explain we must first repeat that maxim of eternal truth which is the foundation of the whole economy of grace and which is therefore repeated in so many forms in the sacred scriptures that god resists the proud but gives his grace to the humble and we may add as a necessary consequence that he gives his greatest graces to the most humble for pride falsifies the man but humility makes him truthful pride is the radical injustice of the soul but humility strives to be just to god to self and to all creatures pride thinks of self above all things humility looks to god above all things pride presumes upon one's own self-sufficiency humility sees and feels one's utter inefficiency pride feels no want of the divine help humility feels the want of god in everything pride has no desire beyond self-satisfaction humility can never rest contented without the charity of god pride is the revolt of the soul from god and is always aiming at independence humility is subject to god and looks on the isolation of independence with horror as on a desert of solitude pride closes the heart against god humility opens the heart to god wherefore humility is the proper disposition and the due preparation for receiving the charity of god 
who gives his grace to the humble it seems almost irreverent to put the question but how can the divine generosity dwell with ungodly selfishness how can god enter with his holiest gift into a soul whose pride resists him how can he unite with a soul that prefers herself to him how can he spread abroad his love in a heart already filled through all its veins and passages with the love of self how can he infuse the most precious gift of eternal life into a soul that prefers her own life and that will only abuse the gift of gifts in the interests of pride god must recall his gift as soon as given for there is no society between charity and pride between the holy and the profane between christ and belial if god is charity says saint basil the devil must be pride and as he who abideth in charity abideth in god he who abideth in pride must abide in the devil god cannot abide with pride but only with humility for the lord is high and looketh on the low and the high he knoweth afar off psalm one hundred thirty six verse six even when the deadly pride of mortal sin has been vanquished by the grace of humility and penance and charity is restored the remains of pride will lurk in certain faculties of the soul and impede the perfection of charity from the want of perfect humility many of the fathers and saints have dwelt upon the essential and intimate relations that prevail between these consummate virtues the relations between which have been repeatedly expressed by st augustine in terms like these if you dig deep within you the foundations of humility you will come to the summit of charity by which the saint intimates that although humility is founded in divine grace it is the fruit of great labor whilst charity is given to the humble without labor in the celebrated letter to the virgin demetriades already quoted the author says humility and charity are in no wise separate from each other such is their connection that whoever is constructed in the one is possessed of the other for as humility is a part of charity charity is a part of humility saint caesarius of arles says true humility never was never is and never can be without charity fire cannot be without heat and brightness nor charity without humility st valerian says humility is the intimate association of charity st peter of cluny writes to st bernard where charity is absent humility is absent and where humility is absent charity is absent blosius says no one grows or advances in charity who does not grow in humility thomas a Kempis writes the way to charity is through humility for to indulge in self-elation is to go far from charity saint teresa writes i can neither understand nor conceive how humility exists or can exist without love or love without humility we might quote on indefinitely but these passages from such great authorities will suffice to impress this important truth on the mind all sincere love even in the natural order has in it a self-forgettingness a devotedness and a submission of inclination to the person beloved a kind of natural humility that makes it an image of the union of humility with charity to leave lovers out though none have or profess to have more of this kind of humility than those who sue in courtship this union of self-renunciation with affection is realized in friendship in a happy marriage and in a mother's devotedness to her children the true friend has no pride with his friend his heart is open to him he gives up his selfishness for him he is devoted to him he yields many inclinations to him 
and when occasion calls for it he is ready to make sacrifices on his account a happily married pair are not only devoted to each other and live in each other but the very foundation of their happiness is in the surrender that each makes to the other of their selfish inclinations all which becomes easy through their mutual affection consider the blended humility and love of a mother towards her children she is all self-forgetfulness devotedness and service she descends into all their little ways and lives in them more than in herself becoming almost a child with them whilst retaining her maternal authority and this humility of love springs from the united sense of duty and affection these examples may help to explain how there can be no true love of any kind without a proportionate self-renunciation and humility for the one element is the essential counterpart of the other for humility is the sacrificial element in all sincere love for as love is the transfer of our affection from oneself to another it includes a surrender of self-love and this surrender is humility but when we give up our love from ourselves to god this giving up of our love of self to god is humility and the love that we give to god is charity hence st john chrysostom calls humility maximum sacrificium the greatest of all sacrifices because it is the sacrifice of self consider the sacrifice of our lord jesus christ the model of all sacrifice perfect humility was its foundation and perfect charity its end he gave his whole nature to the father and the father gave him all charity and power for the saving of mankind we have drawn more than one illustration of the spiritual from the material world and we may here introduce another electricity is one of the great and secret elements of material nature which has perhaps a nearer analogy with spiritual power than any other although the knowledge of its function in the universe is as yet but little understood this however appears to be the fundamental law of its action that the positive electric force cannot move without the negative there must be a vacuity or a capacity before this mysterious power can act or move so it is with charity god is always ready to impart to souls the fire of divine love but there must be a negative a vacuity of self a capacity to receive its action humility and charity are the negative and positive poles of sanctity and the positive pole of charity will only act where there is the negative pole of humility to explain this in another way we cannot approach one object or place without leaving another this law arises from our limitation here again is the negative and the positive we cannot approach to god without leaving ourselves for it is impossible in the nature of things to concentrate our affections on ourselves and yet open and expand them towards god the leaving ourselves is humility the approaching to god is charity in one and the selfsame act the will or love of the soul abandons the less for the greater self for god this fundamental law of human sanctity is expressed in the words of the psalm already repeatedly quoted empty yourself and see that i am god psalm forty five verse eleven or as in the hebrew text cease and see that i am god that is to say cease from yourself vacate yourself or as st augustine puts it pour out yourself that you may be filled with god there is but one impediment to this but one adversary of the divine grace and that is the unjust and extravagant love of oneself through this cupidity not love 
for love is not given to self but to another we form an idol within our heart of which we make a god and serve as a god and secretly compare it with god and without any act of judgment prefer it to god this false god is a fiction blown together from many base materials which in the whole amount to nothing better than a lying pretension to an excellence we do not possess and to an assertion of merit that in no wise belongs to us cease from all this says the almighty empty yourself of this and you will see and know that i am god as humility is the just thought of what we are and the right action of our will towards god from the knowledge of what he is to us we come to see our poverty in the light of his excellence and then descending from our conceits and renouncing our fictitious independence we honestly endeavor to be the subjects of god and he gives us his charity and friendship and we partake in his life and this infused fire of life passes into our will and from the will into all the powers and we live in god but this new life gives us a new sense the sense of god and by this sense we know that without this life from god we are poor weak blind and senseless and the nearer we bring our hearts to god the more sensible we become that life is from god and not from us thus charity infuses a new grace of deeper humility which as we labor to make fruitful obtains for us yet greater charity not that one charity is added to another for there is but one charity but that charity penetrates more deeply into the soul and is more expanded in proportion as the soul is more vacated of self-love and more subject to the divine gift and more active in cooperation thus the charity that inspires greater humility and the greater humility that opens the way to still greater charity augments the virtuous action of the soul in two directions in greater contempt of self and in greater admiration of god in more complete abandonment of self and in stronger adhesion to god in greater hatred of self and in greater love of god who has truly loved god and has never felt those moments of intense peace that arise from forgetfulness of self in god such moments so filled with life are a foretaste of the eternal peace compare those moments with the hours of trouble in the one case self is almost forgotten in god and time and place seem almost to have receded from us in the other it is our troubled self that is before us and our wounded self-love is the cause of all our distress god holds but the second place in our feelings time hangs heavily on us and place seems to reflect our pain there is no cure for this state of things but the humility that gives us self-renunciation and the charity that gives us wisdom end of lecture sixteen part two lecture sixteen part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture sixteen on humility as the counterpart of charity part three let us now come to rule the whole secret of self-management is in two simple principles the motive of the will and the action of the will for the will is the seat of charity the first thing is to keep the will to the right motive to the simplest the purest the highest the best this can be nothing but the love of god which contains all other good motives as pure light contains all colors keep to this motive foster this motive be humble for this motive cherish it by thinking of it with affection 
impulse is not motive it is the base intrusion of cupidity look to your motive and impulse will drop motive is seen in the light of god when the will deviates to lower motives quietly bring it back if a selfish motive gets mixed with a pure motive you will know it by its causing trouble and disquiet clear it away by concentrating the heart on the true motive and peace will return for the best way to clear off the mixture of inferior motive is to transcend it to rise above it by redoubling the devotion of the will to the will and love of god and nothing holds the will to its divine motive so effectually as the frequent aspiration of that motive within the soul which in time becomes the easiest and sweetest of all exercises the second principle is the exercise of the will upon which all virtue depends it is a great thing to do our best and with our best judgment on all occasions this makes the will habitually vigorous and wise but it requires the keeping up the will above the inferior nature neither attending to its languors nor listening to its excuses and complaints do this and your inferior nature will learn submission and you will get into the habit of freedom a wise man of the world watches over his external conduct the wise man of god watches over the interior conduct of his will right motive will keep the will right and when that motive is charity the will does wonders those who first give themselves with ardour to the service of god have generally what saint benedict calls the fervour of novices god gives them an ardour and an unction to win them to his love and service but as they are far as yet from being purified in their affections this works in them in a mixed way for the providence of grace consults their weakness and draws them partly by the cords of charity and partly by the cords of adam they are still much in themselves and in their own sensibilities and this new wine of charity brings them a new and delightful experience that not only inebriates the spirit but flows into the imagination and takes hold of the natural sensibilities the consequence is that there is much sense of self as well as of god and enjoyment of self as well as of god and whoever is experienced in the ways of souls will see that like the movement of a pendulum there is a constant vibration of the affections of the will between self and god which is betrayed not only in much self-ignorance but in a diversity of failures and indiscretions as a general fact this first fervour is less a love of god in god than a love of god in self but after a certain period this fervour with its ferment of self-love comes to an end and a period is ordained for probation purification and self-knowledge this is a time of labour a time also for gaining true humility that the soul may be prepared for a purer gift of charity to this period we may apply the words of moses to the israelites the lord your god trieth you that it may appear whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul or not deuteronomy chapter thirteen verse three the former sweet attractive grace is changed to a grace of support divested of sensibility and the light of justice is left in the soul without the light of consolation then that soul finds out her weakness and her self-love and the failings that spring from them all of which in her fervour she never dreamed yet that weakness was there and that self-love even during the inebriation of fervour though the soul was little conscious of their presence imagining great things above her strength but now that soul finds out how much she is still inclined to herself though but recently she seemed to soar on wings and how much there is in her to purify and set in order 
the desire of god was enkindled in her fervour and that desire remains when the fervour is gone but now god shows her how much it will cost to gain perfect humility and detachment that she may adhere to god with the whole heart and will this is the critical time in the spiritual life requiring great fortitude and perseverance in humble ways the one point of difficulty is this the fear of leaving oneself the way to which has yet to be learnt for in that first fervour so dear to memory there was as we have said a considerable mixture of natural sensibility and the soul still seeks in herself what can only be found in god the will still clings on one side to self with the sort of dread that to lose one's sense of self is to lose everything and is unable as yet to distinguish a certain pious sense of self so to speak from the sense of god but it is a long way from self to god and those who cling to their own house will never make the journey the venture must be made with faith and made with sacrifice this is the reason why the old experienced fathers of the desert attach so much importance to the giving up one's will with reverence to the wise it trains the soul to quit her self-love and to abandon self for god our lord has told us the solemn truth he that shall save his life shall lose it and he that shall lose his life for me shall save it st luke chapter nine verse twenty four our true life is not in ourselves but in god we must lose to gain we must detach the will from oneself to attach it to god as long as the heart is divided between self and god there will be nothing but an unpeaceful swinging of the will backwards and forwards between god and self so that no great advancement is gained no solid rest found no decided peace obtained but the heart detached from self feels the eternal life rests in it with peace and adheres with constancy to god after all that laborious humility an infused humility inspires contempt and dread of the fascinating love of self and gratitude is given to god and nothing to self the pure love of god indifferent to all changes of mood in oneself is not only charity but humility and when a soul reaches this charity of humility and humility of charity she will understand these words of st francis of sales all that is not god of god in god for god or according to god should appear to us as nothing and even cause in us a sense of horror but there is a more subtle and profound combination of humility with charity in those who are advancing in the perfection of the love of god a combination that demonstrates their wonderful strength as the soul approaches near to god for besides the mortification of the passions there is a more secret and difficult abnegation of self-love and self-will which should be continuous because it is not the beginning but the progress and completion of that humility and charity which perfect the soul this abnegation proceeds from the knowledge and sense of the might majesty charity and will of god it submits the inmost soul to god and makes her love her own abjection and contempt desiring nothing more and caring for nothing so much as to break down her own will and inclinations so as if possible to destroy the roots of evil and the opposition to god within her this has been so well explained from the experience and teaching of the saints and the devoutly learned by father rossignoli that we shall chiefly follow his exposition it is certain that we belong to god and not to ourselves that he has all rights over us and that we have no rights against his will if our will is in our own power 
it is so given us that we may freely subject it to the law of the supreme wisdom and goodness and may surrender it wholly to him that he may dispose of us as he sees best for our final good and to the glory of his grace we may ask then is it better that god should guide our will to him by consolations or by afflictions and the fathers and saints reply it is better that god should draw us to him through things against our will than through things that allure and soothe the will for these are the most holy and such as we should not seek for our own sake but only for the sake of god such are the external trials of poverty contempt ignominy and things of that kind such are the internal and greater trials of desolation severe temptations distress of heart mental darkness anxiety of mind and things of this kind which make life bitter for to be conversant and to be exercised in them for the quieting of our will is far better for us than the contrary good so long as with our will we adhere to god let not the proficient then prepare for ease and pleasure but rather for internal afflictions let him not look for peace in himself but for peace in the will of god and he may look securely for that peace however much tossed upon the floods of perturbation the reason for this assertion is that the chief ground of merit before god is the abnegation of self-esteem and self-love for the exercise of which adversity is more helpful than prosperity whether that adversity be external and from the world or internal and from the soul for the repressing of self-esteem the knowledge of our vileness is needful and although this knowledge comes from god's illuminating the mind and is so given to the blessed yet it is best suited to us who are travelling through this world when it is born of experience as god has not the design of destroying but of perfecting our nature he would have us to know our vileness from experience and to make good use of this experience when for example we find our will repugnant to the will of god and it is consequently unquiet we see clearly what is in us of our own and what from god we see what is of our own in the turbid movements against the will of god but what is of god is that strength by which we refuse to consent to them that mental darkness also and that dryness of heart and that affliction of spirit all are our own whilst from god are the gifts that dispel them as the winds carry away the clouds nor does god leave these things in us unjustly because we have deserved for our crimes to have the whole cup of wrath and bitterness poured upon us but we only receive a sprinkled drop when we are permitted to be afflicted if we fly from that drop of bitterness we unjustly fly the justice of god through an immoderate self-love for we have been rescued from great evils and have been reconciled to god through the blood of his son and have to be dealt with in a different way than might have been the case if we had never been aliens from god or had never had a source of corruption in us we must therefore bear the branding of vexation and calamity and feel that the hand of the lord is upon us and that we are stricken from heaven and crucified though less by far than we deserve from this we rise to greater reverence and awe of the majesty of god and so take his visitations in good part knowing them to come from his mercy and love for in short spiritual prosperity is apt to blind the soul as well as temporal prosperity and much much more for there inflation creeps in without observation and injures more secretly and as the soul is more noble by nature than all bodily things she is more easily inflated by spiritual prosperity to forget her nothingness whilst the old self-love and the sense of having been freed from our old iniquities 
serve the cause of lucifer in fixing us in our own esteem these desolations and miseries break the nerves of self-love and root them from the heart they compel us to cling to god from the very consciousness of having no other strength or relief and all the time they endure they are teaching us what depraved propensities and corruptibilities exist in us this excites one to hatred and contempt of oneself inspires us with disgust and indignation and leads us to reproach persecute and punish that mean and disgraceful disposition that is ever inclined to oppose the generous designs of god and even to take possession of his precious gifts and make them the subject of self-elation for the delight that flows from sweetness of spirit and gives so much satisfaction is apt to foster self-love more even than its own allurements because it may then feed on more precious food and so like mercenary servants we are apt to seek the gifts of god more than god himself so we are left to bitterness and desolation until we gain the habit of loving god for his own sake and not merely for his gifts and until the soul is weaned from her attachments to whatever within her is less than god and the sovereign will of god by this discipline the soul is both purified and fortified and prepared for the grace of perfect charity but this should also be observed that although we ought to prosecute our sins with undying hatred because of their aversion to god and because they are sins yet in so far as they bring us to the knowledge of ourselves make us vile in our own eyes and break down that self-esteem and pride which caused them god draws this good out of their evil as he draws light out of darkness on the other hand when we take a selfish delight in our good acts and flatter our nature on their account though they may not alienate us from god they will not join us to god so long then as the vessel of our heart is not well purified from the lees and dregs of self-love it is not good for us to have much increase of illumination consolation or freedom from temptation lest like some low vain person raised to sudden affluence we should become intolerable to our divine benefactor let the proficient rather strive for a calm indifference to all but god himself and leave it to his divine wisdom to give her the gifts he sees best for her condition whether to change her self-love into humility or to perfect her charity for although the soul acts with greater promptitude in the service of god when possessed of inward light and fervour and for this reason these consoling gifts may be desired and magnified yet it is more perfect to be able to love god and do his will without the promptness inspired by them then the will is stronger and more forcible in its virtue when it acts against inward repugnance and with difficulty just as it is easy to go down with the stream but requires much vigor to pull against the stream and by exerting that vigor the powers are strengthened we must therefore clear away from the mind two errors that stand much in the way of conformity to the will and guidance of god the first is to imagine that merit before god consists in facility of will even though that canker of all merit self-love and self-elation should be hidden in that will and even though the more difficult way is comparatively or altogether free from them and therefore produces the real harvest of merit before god for this reason the most loving god who desires what is best for us does not leave his friends in ease and comfort long but excites draws and leads them on to himself through many difficulties in heaven his sons and servants are united with him so intimately that he beatifies them eternally and they repose on him in a torrent of joy 
but on earth he exacts of them a service and submission perfect indeed and most pleasing to him yet full of trial and perturbation the other error which the proficient must correct and which is often fashioned in the imagination is the desire of seeking a quiet and private life exempt from cares and troubles and from inward discomforts as well desiring this against all the facts of god's providence and against his obvious will for he scarcely leaves his greatest friends without troubles in this life but loves to manifest his power in guiding their vessel through all tempests into the secure port of final rest being great and potent he prepares the souls of his friends for great and arduous works and through their internal conflicts he strengthens the habits of their souls for as st paul found power is perfected in infirmity 2 corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 and as the rewards of god are not due to those habits but to their acts he gives them much work to do that their reward may be great and ample for what god loves in our love is the generosity which forgets the love of self in his service such was the love of st paul who desired to spend and be spent in the service of his divine master careless what he suffered so that the knowledge and love of god might be increased in himself and in the world to these instructions we must add two more which are of great importance the first is never to anticipate but to follow the leading of the providence of god if we anticipate the order of divine providence we put our own will in place of the will of god this was the severe reproach on the false prophets i sent them not neither have i commanded them nor have i spoken to them jeremiah chapter fourteen verse four the reason is yet stronger why we should never run before but only follow the light and grace of god for fidelity to grace is obedience to grace and no sacrifice is pleasing to god which contains our own will our lord did not tell us to go before him but to follow after him and the prophet says it is good to wait with silence for the salvation of god lamentations chapter three verse twenty six nature is excitable impatient hasty and indeliberate the help of god is calm patient and given in due season according as he sees best for us to rush in where god has not invited us or to aim at wonders above ourselves is to yield to the excitable impulsion of nature but to follow the divine leading of grace in humility and obedience is to act within the order of the divine gifts the second instruction of very great importance is this the hour of prayer is the special hour of grace but god gives his grace to the humble the beginning of prayer should therefore be in the profoundest exercise of humility and reverence of which the soul is capable nor should time be spared in obtaining this interior position of humble recollection and sense of our nothingness in the presence of the eternal majesty as well as the entire opening and subjection of our spirit to the divine operations of the spirit of god remember that we live and have our being in god that his light and grace are everywhere present with him and that the only obstacles to their communication are the external obstacle of our corruptible body and the internal obstacle of self-love and pride but we are in god as the bird is in the air and the fish in the water and humility opens our communication with his gifts get your heart as near to god as you can with profound subjection that you may feel his life and not your own nature remember also that gratitude is the final expression and as it were the perfect fruit of humility 
we will now conclude this volume with a summary of what it contains expressed mostly in the language of a very eminent theologian in no other way can our weak and changeable nature be brought to the unchangeable condition of solid good than by virtue and justice it is by the virtues that rest upon the force of divine grace that we are restored to the form of that divine image which touches upon the unchangeable eternity of god and which gives us a spiritual likeness to god and when that likeness is perfected in our life we keep all temporal and changeable things beneath our feet by the christian virtues we become spiritual and immaterial and put off the corruption of matter from our soul to put on the incorruptibility of spirits the virtues give us stability of mind and will this stability is derived by gift from the eternal stability and by the force of this stability we are neither lifted up in prosperity nor cast down in adversity neither swelled with pride in the one state of our affections nor sunk into despondency in the other but either anticipate the alternation of our thoughts and imaginations and the tempest of the passions or disregard them altogether for the divine virtues lift us into a calm region above these things the fall of man brought us upon a false and treacherous foundation pride took us away from god as our foundation and set us upon no better foundation than ourselves all the miseries of the human race have come of no other cause than the striving to rest upon this false and fictitious foundation and the endeavouring to produce the fruits of happiness from this poor and barren soil what the christian religion has done is to restore us to our true foundation and this is effected by the virtue of humility the special gift of christ the virtue of which is to open our eyes to the false foundation on which we have striven in vain to rest our immortal souls and to transfer us by the act of our will to that divine foundation from which all our strength and good is derived but as our false foundation is below and our true foundation is the god above us we can only adhere to his supreme excellence by subjection the lord is my firmament says the psalmist and my refuge psalm seventeen verse three and when we have truly surrendered our trust in ourselves and have justly subjected our nature to god he enters our souls with his charity and we become the loving children of god through the divine force which charity gives the christian virtues we are brought from much division to a state of unity evil is multiform and the vices are many presenting as many faces under as many masks as the number of evil affections that we cherish but the christian virtues by their very nature tend to one and to fix us to that one and that one is the love of god above all things and through that one they unite us with the divine unchangeable and eternal god whosoever has good hold of this one virtue or rather is held by this virtue of charity quits the shadows of things comes to the one true substance and leaves the smoke of the vices to vanish when therefore we begin to cultivate this virtue we begin truly to be and to take the way to unchangeable being for the reason of this virtue is unchangeable its form is everlasting and it partakes of the eternal justice this virtue is a certain adhesion to god and so long as it rests on god it is unchangeable god is the first the infinite the perfect virtue and whosoever receives the light of god and entertains the grace of the virtues hath god for his guest in the home of his soul and his interior is already gifted with the joyful sense of immortal life the pleasures of sense are brief 
transient and corruptible because they are the good of the corruptible body but virtue is eternal and incorruptible because it is the good of the incorruptible soul among many sublime proofs that god is one and immutable one is founded on the fact that the nearer a soul approaches to god the more she finds that she becomes united in herself and the less exposed to change except in her growth to greater and more unchangeable good but this is only known by the sincere lovers of god the end end of lecture sixteen part three end of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne